All right, so what's going on, guys? We're done with the Black Swordsman arc, and now we're going to start with the Golden Age arc. So this chapter, titled The Golden Age, Chapter 1, starts off with a very morbid picture. We see a dead tree with many people being hanged from it. Now, from my count, it looks like 12 people hanging from the tree, although maybe there's 13, you know, unlucky 13, you never know. Now, this picture immediately reminds me of something that Jacques Collot made back in 1633. It was part of a series of 18 etchings known as the Great Miseries of War, or or the Miseries and Misfortunes of War. The one in particular I want to draw your attention to is The Hanging. It's the 11th plate in the series, and it's quite iconic. And it looks exactly like the picture from Berserk here, so it's obvious that Miro was drawing inspiration from Gustave Doré and even Jacques Collot. And you'll see as we get further in the manga, he draws inspiration from many different artists. Now, as the group of mercenaries approaches the tree, they see a fetus underneath one of the women that was hanged. And then in the next image, we got another shot of the tree and Gambino's group, the mercenary group. And um, there is a colored picture of this as well, so very nice stuff once again. Again, Dark Horse decided not to print these because I'm guessing it probably cost more for the ink, so they were probably just thinking about their profits, but it's really quite a shame because Kentaro Mira colored these himself, so... I mean, it kind of does him a disservice, but it's online nonetheless. Now, the man here, whom we find out to be Gambino, is like, whoa, pretty grisly. Now, the lady on the caravan jumps off, and she grabs onto the baby and starts to cradle it. Now, it turns out that this girl, Shisu, had a miscarriage about three days ago. And because of that, she's clinging onto this baby. And one of the soldiers is like, hey, that would have been your kid, right, Gambino? And Gambino's like, how the hell am I supposed to know? Of course, it's pretty much implied that Gambino is the father. Now, Gambino is trying to drag Shisu away from the baby, but then the baby starts to make some noise. It starts to cry, and everyone in the mercenary band is wondering how the heck this baby can still be alive. I mean, after all, it did come from the dead body of its mother. Now, one of the soldiers mentions that it's a bad omen to pick up a kid in a place like this. But Gambino kind of just laughs at the whole notion. And Gambino's like, ah, I'll just let it be her toy for a while. I mean, it will probably die on its own in a few short weeks or so. So it, it makes no difference to me. He then takes a look back at the tree, thinking about the bad omen as the caravan rides away. It is now three years later, and we see that Shisu is in immense pain. And it turns out that she's infected with the plague, and they're telling the boy to get away from her. However, Shisu wants to see her adopted son. She wants to see Guts. And the various women are wondering where the heck Gambino is. And it turns out he's in the middle of a siege, but it's like, hey, you know, your lover is dying right now. You should be with her at this moment. So Shisu, having no one else in this world to grab onto, is reaching out for Guts. And even though she has the plague, Guts grabs onto her hand just before she passes away. Another three years passes away, and we're in the midst of a battle. Now, this sort of terrain, this castle on the hill off in the distance with these men fighting reminds me a lot of a movie I once saw with Rutger Hauer in it. It's a 1985 film called Flesh and Blood and I guarantee you if you watch the first 20 minutes of that film you'll immediately think of Berserk. It's gory, it's action packed, and it's actually got some rape in there as well. It's pretty hard to watch it sometimes. It's a movie that directly inspired Kentaro Mira and you can see a lot of similarities between Rutger Hauer and Gambino in particular. And in fact, Kentaro Miro was a major fan of Rucker Hauer in a lot of his movies. There's even another movie I'm going to talk about in the future as well, but, you know, we'll get there as we get there. Now, we see that Guts is helping out Gambino. You know, he's handing him spears and whatnot, and Gambino's taking care of business. He drives it right through a soldier's abdomen. And unfortunately for Guts, that soldier falls right on him, so Guts has got a corpse right on him, and he's freaking out. I mean, he's absolutely traumatized right now. And Gambino Gambino's like, what, what are you doing right now? Who do you think feeds you? If you're going to be a problem, I'm going to throw you out right now and you can deal with the soldiers in the battlefield. So even though Guts is only a six-year-old child, Gambino is quite harsh to him. I mean, it, it's amazing how he has literally no compassion whatsoever. Now, after the battle, we see Guts and Gambino sparring at camp. And, you know, you would think a sparring match, Gambino's going to take it easy on him, but that's not the case whatsoever. He knees him in the abdomen and he 
even cuts him up a little bit. So Guts realizing that, hey, you know, if Gambino's gonna go pretty much all out here, I might as well go all out as well. And he swoops in with swiftness and slashes Gambino across the chin. Now Gambino is absolutely enraged. He's like, you runt! As he slashes him across the nose. And this was no small flesh wound. This was actually quite serious. And the other soldiers are like, hey, he's just a kid. What are you doing, Gambino? Guts looks to be passed out here as they're like, you know, that was a little bit childish. And Gambino looks, you know, yeah, I definitely uh, was pushing him a little too hard. I definitely made a mistake. Now we see Guts in the tent and he's he's hot and he's like, my face feels like it's on fire right now. And he, he's got nothing to clutch on to. And he hears the other people talking about the fact that he's a bad omen. And he's like, I'm all by myself and I feel like crap. What am I going to do? So he does the only thing he can do. He grabs onto his sword, which is definitely going to be cold from the steel and he clenches onto it so he can cool down his body. I wanted to mention this in the Black Swordsman arc, but I decided to wait for this moment right here. Now, a lot of people may wonder how the whole concept of Guts wielding a big sword came about. It actually came from a manga called Pygmalio. The main character of the story, Kurt, is actually only eight years old when he goes out on a quest to defeat Medusa. And as it turns out, he wields a gigantic sword. And there's actually even moments in the manga where there's swords that are literally the size of like buildings and they shrink it down and even though it's smaller it still has that same weight and he's still able to wield it. So you can definitely see how Mira sort of drew this inspiration from Pygmalio. There's actually other instances in that manga as well that sort of show up in Berserk in the future but we'll talk about that as we get there. We then see Guts swinging his sword you know just doing a little bit of practice and Gambino feeling bad about what happened he decides to throw him a little shell of ointment or salve or something. And after thanking Gambino for giving him the medicine, Guts decides to apply it to his wound. It does sting a little bit, but he does notice that he is feeling a little bit better. It is now three years later, and we see another castle that's being destroyed. And we can only imagine that Gambino and the mercenaries are trying to take it over. And Gambino's leading the charge. He's like, it's time to get to work. And as it turns out, this is going to be Guts' first battle as a mercenary. So Gambino decides to lead the charge, and Guts is right in the action. Now Guts encounters one of the soldiers, the soldier knocks off his helmet, but Guts, as he's falling down, manages to pierce the soldier right in the neck, getting his first kill on the battlefield. So the first kill in the manga itself was Igor back in the Black Swordsman arc, but the first kill in terms of chronology was some unnamed soldier, unfortunately we don't know his name. But unfortunately for Guts, his good fortune doesn't last. A man with a mace knocks him down and puts his foot right on his back. But before he can do anything about it, Gambino slices him from behind right through his throat. And Gambino reminds him, he's like, hey, once you got a kill, you got to continue moving forward. This isn't practice after all. Now, after the battle, everyone's receiving their rewards for their accomplishments. And Guts decides to show Gambino what he got. Now, Gambino takes the majority of the claim and he gives Guts just like one little coin and he's like ah keep up the good work now guts despite this seems rather pleased with his efforts you know he made it through his first battle didn't die didn't seem to take any major injuries so that's definitely a big accomplishment for a nine-year-old i mean hell there's no way at nine years old i'd be in a battle i mean holy shit that's gotta be scary now as the various men are enjoying the company of women there's one man in particular who wants to enjoy the company of something else and he decides to make a deal with gambino now Guts is trying to sleep in his tent, but he's like, oh man, every time it's like this at night, I just can't stop shaking. We then see a shadow outside of his tent, and then it starts to open up, and Donovan walks in. And Guts is like, what's going on here? And Donovan reaches for him, so Guts is going to grab his sword, but unfortunately, Donovan is too fast. He puts Guts on the ground, he's got him pinned down, and it doesn't look too pretty, guys. Alright, so now we're on the Golden Age, Chapter 2. Now this chapter starts off with a picture of Guts and a body of corpses. And, um, yeah, pretty ominous, uh, pretty badass if you ask me. Now, it's the dead of night, Donovan is on top of Guts, and Guts can do nothing about it. I mean, he's only a 9-year-old child, and a full-grown adult is on him. Now Donovan puts a rag in his mouth so he can't scream. And he tells him, hey, I'm not here to eat ya, will you relax already? Now, Guts manages to elbow him in the face, which kind of 
kind of distracts him, and he looks to kick him, but unfortunately for Guts, Donovan kicks him right in the abdomen. He falls back, and then Donovan grabs him by the neck and lifts him up in the air. And then he says, hey, stop wriggling around. I paid Gambino good money for you. And Guts can't believe what he just heard. And it turns out that Gambino sold him out for three silver coins. And then we get a very depressing image of Guts as he's absolutely taken advantage of by the vile Donovan. It's the next morning, Donovan leaves the tent and Guts is just sitting there with the rag still around his neck, you know, wondering what just happened to him. Now Gambino's shaving his face with a knife and he notices Guts with a cloth around his body and a sword in his hand. Now Gambino thinks he's here for sword practice, but Guts is like, wait a minute, does he not know about last night? Was Donovan just lying to me? Now, Guts wants to say something about it, but for the time being, he decides to say nothing. He then takes his sword and cuts a barrel of water in half in one swing. Now, sometime later, the mercenaries are on another job, and we see Donovan in his armor, and he looks over at Guts, and he's smiling. Gambino leads the charge on top of his horse, and it's go time. Now, we see Donovan taking care of business and enjoying himself while doing so. Now, while he's in the woods, he notices that an arrow pierces his back. He looks over to see who shot him and it's none other than Guts on top of a horse with a crossbow in his hand. And god damn if this is not the most menacing horse I've ever seen in my life. I mean Jesus. And Donovan's like Guts you little. And as he's saying this Guts shoots another crossbow and hits him right in the throat. And then Guts is like say it. Say it again. Who sold me out? Say it. I dare you to say it. And then he shoves the sword right into Donovan's throat. Guts then gets on top of his horse and rides away so that no one catches him. Now Gambino is telling everyone else that they just need one more push, but then we see a giant explosion. And unfortunately, Gambino was caught up in it. Guts rushes over, but it looks like the damage has already been done. Sometime later, we see Gambino lying on the bed, he's lost his right leg, he's bandaged on his chest and his arm, and he looks to be in a lot of pain. And because of all the damage and injuries, he'll never see the light of battle ever again. Now, trivia question, now that the leader Gambino is officially incapacitated and can't fight in battles anymore, who does this mercenary band nominate to be the new leader? Pause if you don't want to be spoiled, otherwise the answer is Duncan. Now as Gambino is resting up, Guts is like, you've always acted superior to me, always smiling like you were looking down your nose at other people. But now the roles have reversed. Now Guts is the one who's above him and Gambino's on his back. Now Gambino starts to reach out and he's like, Shisu, I'm on my way back. And Guts is like, Gambino, this isn't you. What are you doing? Now, it's two years later, and Guts is officially 11 years old if you're keeping track at home, and we see the mercenary band going on another mission. Guts is engaged in one of the soldiers, and it's a pretty intense battle. And then, in a flash, he manages to slice the leader right in the neck, and we see blood spurting everywhere. Now, as it turns out, it was the enemy general, and Guts is very pleased with himself. And even though Gambino has been on the sideline for two years now, Guts is like, hey, this should get you plenty of women and wine. So in these two years, it's basically implied that Guts has just been making money for Gambino so that he could just pleasure himself and have a good time. Guts is not even thinking about himself whatsoever. And Gambino doesn't even seem to appreciate him. He's like, meat, where's the meat for the dog? And even whacks him with his crutch. Guts then walks away and Gambino kicks the dog. And one of the soldiers is like, oh, there's big bad Gambino up on the hill again. And Gambino's like, a joke? Then why don't we see how sharp your wit is? I don't care if there's two of you. And even though Gambino's got one leg, he hasn't been in battle for two years, they're still like, uh, yeah, no thanks. Gambino is then seen seething in rage as Guts takes the money that he earned and throws it on the ground. He then takes his sword and vents out a little bit of his frustration. It is now raining at night, Guts is laying in his bed, and he's kind of thinking about what's going on. He's like, I just gotta stop thinking. Tomorrow, I'll kill. Lots of enemies again. Earn lots of money. Because that's all Gambino has taught him in these 11 years. Go out, kill enemies, and make money. He hasn't taught him anything else besides that. And now the thunder cracks and we see a deranged Gambino with a sword in his hand looking down at Guts. 
He then swings the sword and Guts barely dodges. And he's like, Gambino? W what are you? And Gambino's got a crazed look in his face. And he's like, I just figured you'd die before long. And then he's like, what the hell have you got against me? Giving me evil for good. What have you got against me, huh? You're a devil's child, Guts. A cursed kid who's nothing but bad luck. And then he just absolutely devastates him by saying, you should have died on that day 11 years ago beneath your mother's corpse. And Guts can barely process what's going on right now as Gambino takes another slice at him. Guts then picks up a sword and starts defending himself. Gambino then decides to reveal that Donovan bought him for three silver coins. Now Guts doesn't want to believe it, but Gambino reinforces the idea by saying, I was sick of you. That's why. You killed Chisu, and then you followed me around like some lonely puppy. And Guts has got tears in his eyes, understandably so, and Gambino decides to swing at him one more time, but Guts thrusts his sword upwards into Gambino's neck. So now we see a picture of the sword going through Gambino's neck, and Guts is absolutely horrified by this. And Gambino's like, you, you, you killed Shisu! And then Gambino's corpse lands right on top of Guts, and what an absolutely magnificent panel this is, guys. It's so horrifying, gruesome, and impactful, it just really leaves an impression on you. Now we see the lantern fall onto the ground and the fire is starting to spread. Guts looks at Gambino's body and he's like, Gambino? He still can't believe what happened. I mean, it's it's pretty shocking if you think about it. He's 11 years old and he just killed his pseudo father. The other mercenaries come into the tent because they see the fire and they see Gambino on the ground. And one of the mercenary soldiers attacks Guts, but he responds by cutting his arm. The others lunge in, but Guts evades them and runs out of the tent. He then grabs a horse and then starts escaping. And they're like, Gambino was murdered after he was acting like a father to Guts? Which is kind of shocking because most of the mercenaries knew that Gambino was kind of an asshole and he would beat up Guts at any chance he had. Unless the mercenaries just die so frequently that like literally their shelf life is like a couple of months to maybe like a year or two and they don't really know the history behind Gambino and Guts. I mean, you never really know. And then one of the guys is like, he's an evil omen, a cursed kid who's nothing but bad luck. We then see the mercenary band chasing Guts down with their crossbows in hand. And Guts has only got a sword and no armor, so he's at a major disadvantage. One of the crossbows hits Guts right in the back, and unfortunately, he falls off of his horse. Well, Unfortunately in some regards, and fortunately in others. Because of the fact that he fell off the cliff, the mercenary band can't chase him down and finish the job, so they kind of just have to leave things as they are and hope that he died. But luckily for Guts, he survived the ordeal. We then see him lying down in a pool of water and looking up at the sky. And uh, what a gorgeous panel this is, guys. Guts then hobbles up and starts dragging his sword with him. And he's like, I'm cold. I lost too much blood while I was out. Two broken ribs. Wh where am I going? And he talks about the fact that it would have been easier for him to die, but nonetheless, he pushes on. We then see a pack of wolves staring down at Guts. The wolves howl, they start to attack, and Guts takes one of them out with one swing of his sword. Now before dying, the wolf bites into Guts. However, he still manages to defend himself. The other wolves start to attack and they're inflicting some pain on him, but nonetheless, he continues to fight on, slicing them down one by one. And by the end here, we see him leaning on his sword, he's exhausted, he's hurt, and the other wolves, even though they have the numbers advantage, they're like, yeah, this is too risky, we gotta get out of here. Guts then collapses onto the ground, he says Gambino one more time before passing out. We then see a caravan come by and it turns out to be another band of mercenaries. Guts, as he's losing consciousness, thinks of Gambino one last time as he's chasing him down. We then see a flash of light, and it's four years later. And if you're keeping track at home, he is now 15 years old. Now we see a group of soldiers going after a general, and they're storming the castle. They then run into a monstrous enemy with a huge battle axe in his hand, and he's taking down everyone in sight, and his name is the Grey Knight Bazuzo. And he's like, no one's gonna get past me. Anyone who wants their head smashed in, step right up. Now everyone's freaked out by this and they're like, how the hell are we gonna take down a guy like this? But Guts, at only 15 years old, steps up to the plate and is ready to go. Now everyone is like, wow, look at that sword. It's bigger than him and he's able to wield it? How is he able to do that? And they're even laughing at him. Now the leader of the knights tells Guts that if he manages to kill Bazuzo, which is very unlikely, he'll receive five pieces of gold. 
Now Guts wants 10, but the knight's like 7 and no more. Realizing that's the best offer he's gonna get, he's like, okay, time to take down Bazuzo. We then see Guts lunge forward, and he takes Bazuzo by surprise. Now Guts is very aggressive and attacking as fast as he can, and Bazuzo's doing as best as he can just to defend. However, Bazuzo is quite strong, and he starts to fight back. We then have some great images of Guts and Bazuzo on the ground. And with Bazuzo dead, the enemy has no chance. So the knights decide to charge forward. As Guts is looking at the blood on his head, he sees that one of the knights is about to cut him down. But he's quick enough to dodge it and slice him right in the stomach. Now off in the distance, we see a couple of knights and they're like, wow, the enemy's got some great ones too. Who's stronger, you or him? There's no comparison, man. Right, Griffith? So now from the Black Swordsman arc, we finally get to see Griffith in human form. And we still don't know at this point whether or not he's going to be good or bad. At least in the future, we know he's going to be bad. But at this moment, we don't really know who he is. Now because the castle's done for, Griffith and his men decide to escape. Now Guts receives his reward, and the knight's like, hey, would you like to serve for me officially as a knight's apprentice? And if he does so, he'll get three times the pay and even be promoted to squire. Guts callously tells the knight that the contract is up and he's gonna go away now. And he's like, well, wait a minute. What about status, money, and security? Why are you fighting these dangerous battles? And as soon as the knight grabs on the Guts, Guts snaps back at him and he's like, don't touch me. The knight then calls him a dog as Guts walks off. We then see him walking on a path, and the mercenary band that was at the castle notices that he's all by himself. And because he got a reward for killing Bazuzo, they're like, hey, we could steal his money. They even ask Griffith if it's okay, and he's like, eh, do as you will. And we find out the guy that's going to lead the charge here is a young Corcus. Now, before they venture off, Casca, a girl mercenary, says that she doesn't stand a chance against him. And she even mentions you'll die. Now, a young man with a ponytail, Judo, is like, are you sure about this, Griffith? But Griffith is just chilling in the grass right now. Guts then hears a noise and sees a couple of mercenaries chasing him down. Now, trivia question, who is the first man that Guts kills among these mercenaries? And the answer is Dante. We then see a large man attacking Guts, but Guts manages to slice off his arm. And because of this, Corcus starts to hesitate. Now, Casca's off in the distance like, ah, I told you so, I knew you couldn't defeat this man. But Griffith's like, hey, Casca, can you just go take care of this? Now, when I see Casca like this, it immediately reminds me of the blood of heroes, particularly the character that was played by Joan Chen. And if you look at Joan Chen right here, she's a short Asian woman with dark complexion and dark hair. Looks exactly like Casca. And then if you look at the various pieces of armor and helmets that they wear in the movie as well, very similar to the helmets you see in the Golden Age arc. Now, in the movie, it's a futuristic society where mankind and technology has been wiped out. So, Rucker Howard Joan Chen and four other people travel around playing this game that is very brutal and it involves taking a dog skull and putting it on a sharp stick. And essentially, while you're doing this, you could just beat up the other team. You can gouge their eyes out. You can break bones. You can even kill them. It's, it's an absolutely brutal sport and you can see how that sort of inspired Berserk as well. Now, Corcus tells Regal to go after Guts, but before he can even react, Guts goes after him. Before he can kill him, however, he gets shot in the arm with a crossbow, and it turns out to be from Casca. Of course, at this moment, Guts doesn't know that it's a girl. Casca then charges Guts with sword in hand, and Guts blocks her attack. They then go at each other some more, as Guts knocks off the helmet from her head. And because of doing this, he realizes that she's in fact a girl. Casca lunges in once more as they go back and forth. And the other mercenaries are like, wow, Casca's being driven back. And it turns out that besides Griffith, she's the strongest mercenary among this band. Guts then knocks her down and gains the advantage, and she's thinking that she's dead. But before anything happens, a spear comes down in between the battle, and we see Griffith on his white horse. We then have a very nice panel of Guts staring up at Griffith, and very magnificent stuff once again. Casca tries to warn Griffith that Guts is tough, and Griffith tries to convince him to lower his sword, but Guts is not having any of it. Guts then makes the first move, and Griffith 
Griffith blocks with ease. He then performs a quick maneuver and stabs Guts, knocking him down. And with this, Guts is officially incapacitated. So the man who took down Bazuzo and was defeating Casca is taken down by Griffith with almost next to no effort. Now Casca points her sword at Corcus and she's like, if you don't know how deep the water is, don't jump in. Giving him a warning not to go into battles haphazardly like that. Now surprisingly, Guts manages to stand up once more. There's a pool of blood underneath him and he's very tired and exhausted, but he's willing to confront Griffith once more. And the others are like, what's with this guy? Guts then looks up at Griffith with vitriol and a menacing glare. He takes his one arm, he looks to slice him down, but unfortunately, he collapses right onto the ground. We then see Griffith take off his helmet, as that's the last image that Guts sees before he passes out. Alright, so we got a beautiful cover for the Golden Age, chapter number 5, with Guts and Griffiths staring at each other here. The chapter starts off very surrealistically. We see a childlike Guts with his sword in hand, running away from a Donovan-like creature. The creature tries to grab him with his hand, but Guts turns around and tries to use his sword to defend himself. Guts then notices something off in the distance. It's a man sitting on a chair with a dog by his side, and it turns out to be Gambino. And he's like, Gambino, save me! Cutting this thing with a sword doesn't work Gambino and Gambino's like don't be ridiculous and he's like you got my right leg in your hand don't you and Guts starts to panic and he drops it onto the ground and underneath the leg is a bunch of corpses and he's like besides did you forget I'm dead because of you I'm dead and gone now you shoved your sword right up through my throat it hurt a lot even to death and Guts is really confused right now, and we see the dog by Gambino's side has the face of Shizu. And Guts is like, wait, listen to me. But just then, the large shadow-like creature grabs on the Guts, and it turns out to have Donovan's face. We then see Gambino and the dog turn into skeletons, as Guts is like, forgive me, please forgive me, Gambino. And as he's starting to come to, he's like, don't touch me, stop, don't touch me. And he notices that a woman is warming him up. And the one thing that he remembers is dark eyes. He then wakes up completely and remembers that he was defeated by the man with the long hair. He then decides to step out of the tent and sees a bunch of mercenaries. He then notices a girl talking to the man that defeated him earlier, and she gets very angry, turns around, and walks straight towards Guts. Guts notices the dark eyes, and the girl decides to punch him right in the chest. Right where his wound is, so definitely gotta hurt there. And Casca's like, I wish you died after Griffith was through with you. And as Guts is clenching his side on the ground, Judo is like, our Casca gave up being a woman so she could be a mercenary long ago. In truth, she's much better at being a swordsman than many of the men here. And it's because of Griffith's orders that she slept with Guts to warm him up, due to the fact that he lost so much blood. Griffith then approaches Guts from behind with his sword in hand, and he's like, I'm Griffith, what's your name? Guts responds by telling him his name, and Griffith marvels at his massive sword, mentioning that he could never wield it. The two take a walk with each other, as Corcus is wondering why he's keeping him around. Rickert, the small boy, is like, well, he's a really strong mercenary. If he were on our side, that would help out a lot in battles. But Corcus doesn't seem too pleased by this. He's like, well, he cut off Errol's arm and killed Dante. Griffith then tells Guts that they're the Band of the Hawk. And Guts is very shocked by this thinking to himself that they're one of the last mercenary groups that you ever want to run into. He even mentions that the last castle siege should have happened in three days, but took over three months because of the interference of the Band of the Hawk. Now, once they get on top of a hill, Guts is wondering why Griffith didn't kill him. And Griffith responds by saying, because I realized I want you, Guts. And naturally, Guts is like, uh, are you a homo? <laughs> Now it turns out that Griffith was rather impressed with Guts' battle against Bazuzo, but he does mention that if Bazuzo's battle axe didn't crack, it would have been Guts that died on the battlefield that day. And Guts is like, probably. And Griffith's like, the way you fight, it's almost as though you're gambling on your own life. He remarks that Guts doesn't yield an inch. 
even against a monster like Bazuzo or multiple opponents like Quirkus's group. And because of this, Griffith finds him rather interesting, and he's even taken a liking to him. Now, given all the kind words, Guts is actually rather turned off by all this, and he's like, I don't want to be part of your mercenary band. And he reminds Griffith that it was the Band of the Hawk that initially attacked him. And because of this, they're enemies. He then whips out his massive sword, and it looks like it's on. And Griffith's like, well, what if I win? Guts responds by saying, then make me your soldier or fag boy or whatever. Griffith agrees to this request, and he pulls out his own sword. Now, Casca wants to intervene, but Griffith tells her to stay out of it. Guts then takes the initiative by swinging his sword, but Griffith defends rather well. The other members of the Band of the Hawk catch wind of this and start to run over to Griffith's position. Griffith and Guts then go back and forth, with Guts experiencing a flesh wound and falling backwards. Now, because of this, Guts is wondering how he's parrying all his attacks with such a narrow blade. And on top of that, he's doing it all with one hand. Guts is rather impressed with his skill level, but at the same time, he still wants to win. Now, the other members of the Band of the Hawk want to intervene, but Casca stops them from doing so, and she even pulls out her sword against Corcus. Meanwhile, Griffith continues cutting up Guts. Guts then uses a diversion by putting his sword in the ground and putting dirt in Griffith's face. Griffith then decides to jump into the air and onto the blade of Guts' sword. Now, this part is really interesting because Griffith jumps on top of Guts' sword, which by all accounts should be impossible to do. I mean, I couldn't imagine anyone in real life doing something like this. Now, I asked the various supporters of my channel where this move came from. Was there a movie that Mira drew direct reference from, or was it something that he created on his own? I think it's kind of a little bit of both. And I want to thank Rex Tullis, because I believe he gave the most correct answer in this regard. So essentially what Griffith is using here is a enlightened kung fu technique called Ching Gong, otherwise known as lightness of body. And once a monk reaches an extraordinary level of internal energy, they can change the weight of their body at will, and essentially create propulsion so that they can float through the air. You see the sort of mystical ability in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And in a lot of wuxia kung fu films, you see various people floating through the air for periods of time and even jumping on weapons and such. Never an instance of someone jumping on a sword, so I think that is completely unique to Berserk. But as someone else pointed out as well, there was a moment in the Ocarina of Time in which Dark Link jumps on Link's sword. Now it looks like Griffith has the decisive advantage and it looks like it's all over. And Griffith even mentions, I like you more and more, you'll do anything to win, but you can't swing your sword like this. What now? Feel free to give up if you wish. And even though Guts is sweating just a bit, he starts to smile and he's like, You're a talkative bastard. I'll show you how Miles should be used in a fight. And with this, Guts decides to chomp down on Griffith's sword. Now, this moment actually comes from another manga, a manga that was written and illustrated by Go Nagai. And the manga was called Violence Jack. There's a moment in that manga where Violence Jack bites onto a sword. And the character of Violence Jack is very similar to Guts as well. Heck, he's even taller than Guts. I believe he's anywhere from like 10 to 12 feet tall. He's got dark hair, he's hulking, and he's absolutely brutal. Much like Guts in the Black Swordsman. Arc. And just in case you're wondering, Gona Guy is the same guy that wrote Devilman. And Kentaro Miro was a big fan of his work, and you see a lot of references to Devilman, Susano, and Violence Jack in Berserk. And I'll try to point most of those out as we go through the manga as well. It should also be noted that Saitama from One Punch Man also bit onto a sword as well. Now we see Guts biting down onto the sword, and Griffith is quite surprised by this. And we see blood coming from Guts' mouth, he pushes Griffith forward, and all of a sudden, it looks like he has the advantage. And then Griffith is falling down a hill, Guts goes after him, and the Band of the Hawk is like, oh no, he's fallen! Griffith is on his back, Guts puts his hand on his shoulder, and he's ready to punch. And he even lands a punch right in his face and draws some blood. He then starts to kick him, and everyone in the Band of the Hawk is like, oh man, no way, Griffith is on the ground. But Corcus tries to keep their spirits up. He's like, no, 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 you fools. It's a strategy. It's strategic. Guts then spits some blood out of his mouth, and he's like, how's your own blood taste? I bet that's the first time that pretty face has ever been hit. 
Now, Griffith grabs onto a rock and Guts is ready to punch once more, but Griffith has got a very devilish smile on his face. He then catches Guts' arm and puts him into an arm bar. And by putting his weight on Guts' shoulder, Guts is on the ground, incapacitated. Now, the band of the Hawk is very pleased by this. They're like, he did it! And Griffith is like, that was quite effective. But it's all over now. You will concede defeat. Or I will have to dislocate your shoulder. Choose. And even though Guts is in a lot of pain right now, he's like, asshole. And with no other choice, Griffith has to dislocate his shoulder. And everyone from the Band of the Hawk is quite pleased by this, but Casca is a little bit indifferent. Now, some of the members are quite honest. They're like, oh man, we didn't know what was going to happen after you fell off of that cliff. But Quirkus is rubbing it in Guts' face. He's like, that's what you get. Come on, stand up. But Griffith moves Quirkus aside, and he decides to grab onto Guts' face with his hands. And he's like, now you belong to me. And everyone's like, what's that mean? And Griffith's like, from now on, he's one of the Hawks. And upon saying this, Casca, who's still up on the hill, is like, he's never said that before. Griffith's never said a thing like that before. I want you, not to anyone else. So this indicates to us as the readers that there's something special in Guts, some sort of ferocity, indomitable will that Griffith sees that no one else sees. Now it's later on at night, we see campfires going on, and the only thing that Guts can think about right now is the fact that he lost, and the fact that he got crushed by Griffith. And he's even like, it was pathetic, damn it. And he even equates Griffith's grin to like a child. And he tosses over and he's like, god damn it, what the hell is he? Now he hears a noise outside and it's Quirkus and some of the other members and they want to take on Guts because of the fact that he killed Dante. And Quirkus is like, eh, don't worry about his strength, guys. If we catch him asleep, we can kill him. Now, even though Guts is in a weakened state, he gets up and he grabs his sword and he's like, these guys will be no problem at all. But before Quirkus's group can do anything, Casca decides to intervene. And she's like, even if he's wounded, he's still gonna beat you guys. And Quirkus is like, come on, you got a grudge against him, don't you, Casca? You had to act like a a whore for him for two nights or did something happen then and uh that's quite the insult by Corcus. and i don't blame casca for being pissed off in the least and she's like say that again and i'll take your head off and with that Corcus scurries off with his tail between his legs and then guts comes out of the tent guts is like well that makes two times that i owe you so i'll say thanks for now and casca's like hey don't get the wrong idea here i'm only doing what griffith ordered if I didn't, who'd bother with ya? Guts then lays down in his tent and goes to sleep with his sword in hand. We then see a very picturesque landscape and it looks like the Band of the Hawk has got a new mission. Griffith tells them that the enemy has a force of about 2,000 strong and they're going to take a roundabout route along the river and sneak attack the enemy. So essentially, they're going to make a sneak attack through the enemy's camp through the center, which is very risky, but if it works, it's going to pay off handsomely. And even though it's very risky, Guts is like, wow, the Band of the Hawk has full confidence in Griffith's plan. This is quite impressive. And the most important part of the mission, the rear guard, is going to go to Guts. Now, because they're going through the enemy's center, they're going to have to flee really quickly, and the rear guard is pivotal to that moment. Because he's going to have to fend off several hundred horsemen while fleeing. And there's a very high risk for death. And Guts is like, well, it's an order, right? So he doesn't even refuse. He doesn't even show any fear whatsoever. And Casca's like, wow, Griffith trusts this louse? And Corcus looks very pleased by this. He's like, ah, that's the end of him. Now the band of the hawk embarks on their mission, and they go through the river. Now the fact that they're traveling through the river and the wind is going to cover up their sounds it's going to catch the enemy off guard and guts is rather impressed that griffith calculated this all into his equation we then see judo take out one of the enemies with a small dagger and then we see one of the enemy nightmen looking off into the forest we then see a couple of torches come through the forest and he's like oh enemies but it's already too late as the band of the hawk makes their advance they then start taking out the enemies one by one and we even see guts cut off one of the enemy's heads they throw the fire in into the barrels and then they start making their escape and we got some very beautiful panels here of the horses and the band of the hawk making their escape we then see the enemy soldiers release the cavalry and they start chasing down guts and from this point forward, Guts is going to take on the bulk of the fighting. Now to start this chapter, we got some beautiful cover images right here of Guts, Griffith, Casca. And right behind the Berserk logo, this is not so obvious until you see this image right here. It's a picture of Zod as a shadow. Of course, we don't know that at this moment, but uh, very cool foreshadowing on Mira's part. And then we see a picture of Zod right here, this menacing creature. We just get a close-up 
of his face. You know, he looks like a snarling lion or a minotaur or something like that. And then uh, finally, we get a picture of Guts here as he's holding his sword and uh, just kind of holding his hand like this. Uh, very cool stuff, guys. All right, we see Guts getting chased through the forest by the various horsemen, and he's clearly outnumbered right now. He then defends against an enemy attack. He then turns around the situation and slices through the guy's neck. He then notices that several of the soldiers are going after Rickert, and Rickert is having a hard time defending himself. Guts then thrusts his sword through one of the soldiers' neck, and with this, he tells Rickert to get out of here. And Rickert, not hesitating, is like, oh, okay! And Guts looks back at the plethora of soldiers, and he's like, come and get me. We then notice the other members of the Band of the Hawk back at the castle, and it looks like they successfully completed their mission. And the various noblemen are congratulating Griffith. However, he doesn't look too pleased right now. He then asks Corcus what their losses are. And he's like, eh, it doesn't look too bad. By the way, that new guy's doing better than I thought. The rear guard's holding out so well, the enemy doesn't even seem to have much of a chance to snap at our behind. But Griffith is like, well, where is he? And Cork's is like, I don't know, I lost sight of him. And Griffith looks a bit concerned right now, and Casca's like, what the heck is going on? Why is he showing Guts so much favor? Meanwhile, we see Guts slashing through the enemy soldiers like it's nothing. However, the sheer numbers is causing him a lot of problems. And even one of them knocks him in the back, and he sort of falls to the side of his horse. Now, it looks like it's all over, however, Guts has got a few tricks up his sleeve, and he takes down another enemy soldier. He then pushes himself off of a tree and regains his balance. And he's like, now is my chance. He's looking to escape. Unfortunately for him, an arrow goes into the neck of his horse, and he's dislodged. And with him being dismounted, the enemy has got him dead to rights. And he's like, damn, they got me. But just in the nick of time, a couple of arrows go into the enemies, and Guts is very surprised by this. And when he looks behind him, he sees Griffith, Pippin, and Judo. And Griffith puts out his arm, he's like, grab a hold of me. Guts does so, and Pippin takes care of business with his giant mace. And goddamn, does he look badass here. And one of the few times he actually says something, he's like, let's go. Now, even though reinforcements came in for Guts, the enemy is not gonna give up. They still got the numbers advantage here. Now, while on the horse, Guts is like, why'd you come back for me? Griffith's like, don't speak, you'll bite your tongue. Well, Guts is like, well, it doesn't matter, we're double riding right now, they're gonna catch up to us. And Griffith's like, just a little more, a little farther. And the enemy is literally right on their backs, they're drawing their swords, they're getting ready for the kill, but just as Griffith and the Band of the Hawk exits the forest, they begin to scatter, and the enemy realizes that they're face to face with a bunch of cannons. And in a brilliant manga panel, we see the cannons all firing at once, right at the enemy, and taking them down one by one. And Guts is absolutely shocked by this, he didn't see this coming, and with no other resort, the enemy has to retreat. So they run away with their tails in between their legs, and the Band of the Hawk has had a very successful mission. Now, while everyone is very pleased by the outcome of this mission, Quirkus and Casca look less than pleased. They actually look a little disgruntled right now. And it's because of the fact that Griffith is showing Guts so much favor. Later that night, we see the various members of the Band of the Hawk celebrating their victory, and the various nobles are like, oh boy, that was another successful attack by Griffith. Now, even though he doesn't have any backing in the kingdom, his men are extremely devoted devoted to him and his tactics are brilliant, which could pose a problem for the nobles in the future. So even though Griffith has got his enemies in the battlefield, we're already starting to learn that he's got his enemies in the aristocracy. Now some of the soldiers in Griffith's camp are mentioning how Guts is actually a pretty good soldier and he's able to hold his own. Now we notice Guts sitting on one of the castle walls and he's just kind of looking off in the distance. He doesn't want to really talk with anyone or participate in the celebratory party. But three members from the Hawks, Judo Pip and Rickert decide to invite him to the party. Now, after introducing himself, Rickert is like, wow, I've never seen anyone but Griffith fight that amazingly before. And Gus just kind of plays this off like, well, I was just doing my own job. And Judo's like, come on, we can't get going with the party without the main star. And Guts is still declining, but Judo decides to pull out his trump card, which is the hulking Pippin. And in a very humorous manga panel here, we see the hulking Pippin grab Guts and put him over his shoulder, which is very humorous 
because Guts is such an imposing man himself, and he's so defensive, especially to others touching him, that it's quite rare to see someone manhandle him like this. Now Guts attacks Pippin with his elbow and he's like, don't touch me, but this is quite impressive because Pippin doesn't even flinch here. You know, you see blood coming from his lip, and he's like, eh, don't be shy. So you really gotta wonder how strong and durable Pippin is. He's got his place in the manga, he definitely plays a role, but we never really got to see how strong he really was. I'd be curious to see him against a really strong opponent. Someone like a Bascon, could he take him down? Now Pippin drags him to the party, puts him down on the ground, and offers him a drink. Judo henceforth proposes a toast, and Guts reluctantly accepts it. The other members of the Band of the Hawk introduce themselves and uh, applaud him for his efforts. And even though the majority of the members are rather happy, we see that Corcus is still a little pissed off right now. Griffith then gives Guts a nonverbal toast, and we see Casca off in the distance just watching the situation. And then this chapter ends with a picture of the castle, and we see the various stars and the moon in the background. It's then morning time, we got a picture of the castle here and the various soldiers sleeping. Now there is a colored panel of this picture as well, and I'm showing it on the screen, very beautiful. And then I really love this image right here, you know, Guts goes back to the castle wall, presumably he's been sleeping there all night, and uh, just a very beautiful color panel right here by uh, Kentaro Mira, guys. And then we see Guts looking down at the band of the hawk, and he's thinking about last night, and you know, how everyone's been so nice to him, and how it seems like, you know, he's part of a band of mercenaries again, and he's actually part of a family, if you will. Now, Judo comes back to him, and he's like, ah, oh, you must really like high places. And he's like, now the band of the hawk, do you think you'll fit in? Now, Guts is unsure about this, he can't really say at the moment. And even though he's been part of mercenary bands in the past, this one's a bit different. Everyone's a bit younger, and there's a different vibe about it. Now, Judo explains that they got escape prisoners, street urchins, sons of blacksmiths, and even secondhand sons of poor aristocrats. But the element that makes them really different has to be Griffith. And the reason that all of them are here is because of his charisma. And unlike most mercenary bands that are only concerned about making money, the Band of the Hawk is a little bit different. Even though they spend most of their days killing people, they can also cry, laugh, and get angry. They express their emotions very outwardly. Now Guts is like, Griffith, what kind of guy is he? And Judah's like, well, that's kind of hard to explain. He's got this strange wisdom about him, yet he seems like a kid. And then when he gets a spine-chilling look in his face, he'll juxtapose that with a smile like an innocent baby. Is he a child or an adult? A good guy or a villain? I don't really know what he is. And Guts thinks about the fact that he's seen both of these sides of Griffith as well, and he doesn't really know what to make of him himself. And then Judo explains that he's got this conviction in everything. Now in the midst of their conversation, one of the Band of the Hawk members comes up to Guts, and he's like, hey new guy, boss is calling ya. And then just before he leaves, Judo's like, I'm sure you'll find it here, at the place where you belong. We then see Guts go into a courtyard where he sees Griffith bathing himself completely naked and he's a little perturbed by this he's like okay and Griffith even invites him <laughs> <laughs> he then decides to splash Guts with some water, and the two have a water fight with each other. Kind of like a bunch of kids. And this is usually not the stuff you would see in a typical mercenary band, which makes it quite a bit different. The two then have some more fun as Judah watches on, and uh, you know, they're just laughing afterwards. After Guts gets the last splash, Griffith begins to laugh, and he's like, okay, I give up. And then Guts notices the weird thing that Griffith is wearing around his neck. And then we get this nice close-up visual, and we already already know from the Black Swordsman arc that this is a bailet. However, besides something in the God Hand, we don't know much else about it. And Griffith explains that he bought it from an old gypsy fortune teller ages ago. And it's called the Baylet, or the Egg of the King. And he explains that whoever possesses this is destined to obtain the world in exchange for his own flesh and blood. And Guts is like, the world? <laughs> Griffith then hands him the Baylet, and as Guts is looking at it, one of the eyeballs opens up. And Griffith explains that he's like, it almost feels like this thing is alive. And he's like, neat, huh? Guts is like, hey, I still haven't heard your answer. Why'd you come back and save me in that battle? And Griffith explains, well, you're an excellent soldier. I don't want to lose you in a petty battle like that. And then Griffith emphasizes the point that this is no more than a single step. The Band of the Hawk, all the victories on the battlefield, are just the outset, just the beginning. This is where things start to get interesting. You can bet your life on that. I will get my own kingdom. 
And Guts is looking up at Griffith as if he's some sort of mesianic figure, someone larger than life itself. And then Griffith emphasizes the point that you will fight for my cause, Guts, because you belong to me. I will decide the place where you die. Now, later on, Guts is pondering the thoughts of Griffith getting his own kingdom, and he's like, uh, is that guy serious? He's not nobility or royalty. He's not even a knight. And then he's like, he's like the same age as me. Can just one man do it? Does he actually mean it when he says that? He's gotta be crazy. But then Guts begins his own musings. He's like, what have I been doing these past four years? Running around from one battlefield to the next killing enemies, just surviving. And then he has a flash of Gambino in his mind as he's thinking about all this. And then he thinks, where am I going? I still don't have an answer to that question, Gambino. And then just as he's thinking about all of this, Rickard opens the door and knocks Guts into the water. Now, even though Guts is very furious right now, Rickard congratulates him on the fact of being in command of various men in the Band of the Hawk. And he's like, hey, who knows, maybe in a year you'll be in charge of a hundred men. And he offers his hand to Guts, Guts grabs onto it, but just then, Pippin opens the door and knocks the both of them over into the water. And as this is going on, we see Casca on the castle walls just looking over at them. It's now sometime later, we see various knights and horses going to battle with each other. And then we see Casca, Judo, and Griffith as Griffith commands the army to move forward. And with this, Guts puts down his helmet and he rides off on his horse with sword in hand. Now with this chapter, we officially start a new chapter count for Berserk. So all the chapters leading up to this sort of had their own title names and such. But this one, The Wind of Swords, is officially the first chapter of like the canonized Berserk. But up until this point, the chapters really haven't been going by like numerical order. So officially with The Wind of Swords, this is the quote unquote first chapter. Now we start off with this nice panel here. In this world, is the destiny of mankind controlled by some transcendental entity or law? Is it like the hand of God hovering above? At least it is true that man has no control, even over his own will. And of course, as many of you already know, this is the official opening for the 1997 anime. At the beginning of each episode, they play this 30 second snippet, and then they move on to the opening theme, Tell Me Why, by Pen Pals, and then you have the episode itself. Now, interesting little bit of information, in Young Animal, they posted the same photo in a colorized manner as well. So they got it with the text, and then they got it without the text, so very cool. And then this scene, man takes up the sword in order to shield the small wound in his heart sustained in a far off time beyond remembrance. Man wields the sword so that he may die smiling in some far off time beyond perception. And this is another beautiful image. And of course, they also have a colorized version of this one as well. And then when this issue came out in Young Animal issue 11, the official cover looked like this with a picture of Guts. Now, what's really cool is I found an image with Guts without all the text, the colorized version. So these are absolutely beautiful, guys. Nice little bit of insider information here. And then before we actually start the chapter, we got a picture of Zod. Of course, we don't know that at this moment. Now, we see the soldiers going off into battle, and absolutely beautiful picture right here, guys. It says the war has been going on for a hundred years, and we see the various soldiers killing each other, and some very brutal images as well, I'll say that much. And then we see the leader of the enemy army saying, onward, trample them down. And if you notice the helmets on their heads, they kind of look like Ram's helmets. That's very suitable, because the name of the army is called the Black Ram Iron Lance Heavy Cavalry. Now we see the king off in the distance, and he's like, oh, what a disaster. A mere 3,000 horsemen are confounding us. And he's like, is there anyone in Midland who can stop these black devils of Tudor? And as the Black Ram cavalry are charging forward, we see Guts off in the distance. He whips out his sword in a magnificent full-page spread, and then he starts charging forward into the enemy army all by himself. And with one swing, he cuts the enemy right in half. Everyone is watching on in horror as Guts continues slicing and dicing. And they're like, don't break rank, he's only one soldier. But just then, the band of the hawk comes from the forest to surprise them. Or, as the enemy calls them, the Grim Reapers of the battlefield. So it looks like in the time that Guts has been with the Band of the Hawk, they've gained quite the reputation. And we see Griffith and the others taking out the soldiers. And because of this, the enemy is forced to retreat. 
We then see Griffith giving Guts the thumbs up, and Guts is just kind of like, okay, yeah, that went swimmingly. Now, it is interesting, this did not come out at the time, obviously, but when the Berserk trading card game came out, there was a colorized version of Guts in the same pose. Now, the Band of the Hawk returns to the castle, and everyone is complimenting Guts on being the star of the battle, and we find out that Guts is the leader of the Hawks Raiders, and Guts apologizes, like, oh, sorry, guys, I went and charged out there by myself, and none of the Hawks Raiders really seem concerned about this. They're like, oh, what are you talking about? It worked out for the best. But someone is not too pleased with this. And that someone happens to be Casca. She's like, Guts, we need to talk. Now Guts tells them to start celebrating without him as he goes with Casca. Now it turns out that Guts and Casca have been at each other's throats ever since Guts joined the band of the Hawk three years ago. And sure enough, Casca takes this moment to excoriate his behavior. She grabs onto his cloak and says that he got lucky and that his selfish behavior could have exposed the band of the Hawk to a greater danger. But Guts doesn't seem too concerned about this. She's like, practically nothing about you's changed in these past three years, ever since that time you went off on Griffith. You're satisfied as long as you get to cross swords with the enemy. You don't think about your comrades one bit. You're just a mad dog. And this definitely strikes a chord with Guts, because he grabs onto her hand, and she looks a little bit surprised by this. He's like, say that one more time. But before anything happens, Griffith intervenes. He then says he wants to have a talk with Guts, but Casca's like, you're too soft on him, Griffith. Now, as Casca is leaving, Quirkus takes this opportunity to remind Casca that Guts is Griffith's favorite. And by arguing with Guts, it only makes her look that much worse. Now, he changes the conversation by saying, well, hey, if you ever want to off him, I'll be there for but she just decides to trip him and offers a fake apology. Now Guts tells Griffith that he does think about his comrades. He's not who he used to be three years ago. And speaking of three years ago, Griffith reminisces about the battle that they once had. And he's like, that fight was enjoyable. It was how fights should be. And Guts having time to reflect on the situation is like, Griffith, I'm sorry about today's battle. And Griffith is like... Even that part of you is part of my plan. And then he leaves without another word. We are then transported to a ceremony in which a commoner, i.e. Griffith, is attaining the title of knighthood, which is kind of pissing off some of the other nobles of the Midland Army. We then see Griffith being knighted as the various members of the Band of the Hawk watch on with pleasure. Quirkus is especially pleased with this news because he's like, Griffith is a Viscount now, and that means they could say goodbye to being wretched mercenaries and join the regular army. However, Casca reminds him that insubordination from now on could possibly cause them trouble, especially for Griffith. Now, as this is all going on, Casca is wondering where Guts is, and we see that he's out in the courtyard training with his sword. Griffith then kisses a sword and gives a wave to the crowd, and after a strenuous training session, Guts leans against a tree and looks up at his sword. It was crimson like a drop of blood. And this chapter is titled Nosferatu Zod, Chapter 1. And then Griffith says that he bought this from an old gypsy fortune teller ages ago, the Bailet, also called the Egg of the King. You see, it is said whoever possesses this is destined to obtain the world in exchange for his own flesh and blood. The world. I will get my own kingdom. That's what he said three years ago. And now we see Griffith clutching onto the bailet. We see lightning in the background and we're wondering what's going on. We then see Griffith and his men looking at a castle that is burning from the inside. And then one of the soldiers comes in, he's got a report and he's like, we're just about finished up taking out the enemy fortress. Unfortunately, they haven't taken out the leader yet and Guts and the Hawks Raiders are trying to finish up the job. And the reason that it's taking so long is they have a remarkable soldier. And Judo speculates that this must be Zod. And he's like, I caught wind of a strange rumor before this battle that Nosferatu Zod has been added to the enemy forces. And they're all like, Nosferatu Zod? And it turns out that among mercenaries, Nosferatu Zod is a legendary swordsman. And the rumor states that he's killed hundreds, even thousands on the battlefield. And even though there's speculation that he's died in the battlefield, he always shows up again in some other battle. But the truly unbelievable part of the story is that they've been telling this for hundreds of years, implying that he's immortal. That's why they call Zod Nosferatu. Now, interesting bit of information, the word Nosferatu comes from Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Dracula, and it's an authorized cinematic adaptation, Nosferatu, that came out in 1922. 
Now it's believed that Nosferatu in Romanian means vampire. However, Nosferatu in that form does not appear to be a standard word in Romania. And it's suggested that Stoker believed that the term meant not dead in Romanian. Hence the whole concept of the undead. Now one proposed etymology of the word is that it's based on the Greek word nosophoros, meaning disease bearing. Now what's kind of interesting is that Dracula slash Nosferatu or any kind of vampires for that matter usually have common tropes. They drink blood, they're undead, and they are either weakened by the sunlight or they die in the sunlight. Now as far as we know, Zod does not drink blood, he does not die in the sunlight. However, he is immortal, so he's kind of quote-unquote undead. So that seems to be the only connection between Nosferatu and Zod. But it's a badass name nonetheless. Now Corcus is like, hey, hey, don't tell me that you actually believe in this, Rickert. And Judo tells the group that he's like, well, I have a feeling that if you ran into him, he'd go into him full force, just like a madman. And the various members of the group are thinking, this cannot turn out good as we see lightning in the background. Now Guts is trying to fight past Gaston and he's like, let me in, you bastards. But Gaston is trying to calm him down. He's just like, just a little longer, Guts, just a little longer. And Guts grabs Gaston's face and is like, if you call in reinforcements, I'm going to kill you. It's one man. A single enemy's got all 500 of the Band of the Hawks raiders stuck like nails in a wall. And just as Guts is saying it's humiliating, we see Dillos coming out of the castle with half of his body torn off. He falls into Guts' arms and he's like, Zod, Nosferatu. Now everyone else is very worried, but Guts stands up, straight back and all, and he's ready to go in. And he's like, nobody come in, I'm killing him alone. He then walks into the castle and sees bodies laying all over the place. And just not regular corpses, these corpses are mutilated. Arms are missing, faces are cut in half, and eyeballs are sticking out. And Guts is like, man, they're torn apart like rag dolls. what's going on here? And then he comes upon a sight that is true truly horrifying. He sees heads all ripped apart, eyeballs sticking out, blood everywhere, brains all over the place. And then he sees two men impaled upon a single sword and a monstrous hulking man that's staring him down. And with this, Guts goes absolutely berserk. He charges forward, but unfortunately for him, the man throws the bodies in Guts' direction. He's then knocked back into a pillar as Zod breathes smoke out of his mouth. And with this impressive display of strength, Guts can only think, what the hell is this? Now the cover for chapter 3 is really interesting. We see a picture of Zod here. And his hair is standing up. His ears are very pointy. And it looks like he's got the face of a cat. Which is kind of interesting. We don't exactly know what this means yet. But I definitely think it's symbolic. We then see the monstrous Zod bearing down on Guts. And what's really interesting about this is that he is absolutely massive. I mean, we know that Guts is very tall, but it looks like Zod's at least 8, 9, maybe even 10 feet tall here. And even though Guts was pushed back, Zod's like, you parried that strike well, boy. And this is the first time in Guts' life where he's actually stunned in a battle. He's frozen in place by Zod's mere strength. Now Zod goes in full force, and Guts does his best just to block the attack. We then see Guts dodge another attack. However, Zod's sword goes through the entire pillar of the building. Zod continues his impressive display of strength and quickness as he continues attacking Guts. And even though Guts is doing very well, he's eventually knocked back and blood comes out of his mouth. And you can tell that he's mustering all his strength just to save his life at this point. And he even remarks that Zod is like a monster. Now Zod remarks that this is the first time in 50 years that someone's been able to stop his sword for this long. And Guts is like, man, I can't even get a swing in. He's the strongest. He's stronger than anyone I've ever crossed swords with. I was speechless at how good Griffith was, but this guy, his power is beyond human. And realizing he can't stand toe to toe with Zod, he's got to think of another tactic to take him down. He then realizes that their swords are evenly matched and he prepares for his next attack. And then Zod realizes that Guts is going to gamble everything on his next sword strike. And he's like, I'll bet you're counting on your blade length to make up the difference. But will it? Your brains will be on the floor before your sword can touch me. Interesting. I accept. And then Zod goes in full force in a very beautiful panel, guys. The two then clash with each other as Guts' sword starts to go into Zod's sword. We then see Zod's blade cut in half. And even Zod is very surprised by this. But unfortunately for Guts, his blade is stopped by Zod's arm. He then grabs the blade with his bare hands and he's like, what a surprise. 
eyes. After being pushed back that far, I never thought you'd try to break my sword. You were the first. The first human to drive your sword this deep into my body. And then we see a very monstrous transformation occurring. As fur is growing out of his body, we see a pair of horns, and it looks like this is the first time that this has happened to him in 300 years of slaughter. Alright, so we got a beautiful cover of Guts here with a couple of the Hawks Raiders in the background. And then the first page is absolutely gorgeous. It's a full page spread of Nosferatu Zod. You get a close up of his face, his eyes. You can tell that he's snarling. You can see his horn, all his fur. It's just absolutely gorgeous and terrifying at the same time. And then we see Zod grabbing on the Guts' sword, and he's making it look like a toothpick here, guys. And you see the smoke coming off from his body from the transformation, and he just looks absolutely terrifying. And then we see Guts' knees shaking, there's sweat coming off of his face, he's clenching onto his teeth, his eyeballs are transfixed on the absolute terror that he's staring at, and he's like, it was enormous, it was terror itself. Now Zod is actually very happy by this moment, he's like, it's been so long since I had the feeling of blood boiling, to make this feeling my own again on the chance I might come across an enemy like you. Maybe that's why I've remained alive these 300 years. Now fight. Don't disappoint me. And while Zod's holding on to Guts' sword, he goes to swipe him with his left paw. Guts has no time to react to this and he gets slammed into one of the pillars. Zod then roars as Guts is like, this can't be. It can't be real. Like, monsters like this can't exist. But he doesn't have time to philosophize about this any longer. Zod goes in with his horn, and Guts barely dodges. Zod continues attacking, with Guts nearly dodging each attack. He then tries to slash his horn with his sword, but it does nothing. Zod then knocks him back into another pillar, and Guts is bleeding from his head and all over. Zod then grabs onto Guts' body like it's a rag doll, and he's like, is this all the power you've got? And even though he did well for a human, he's not going to show him any mercy. And because he can't fight, he's going to tear him apart. But just in the nick of time, a couple of arrows go into Zod's back. He then looks behind and sees the band of the hawk led by Griffith. Now what's really interesting about this panel right here is that Griffith is sweating. One of the few times we ever see him sweat like this. Now we see that Corcus, Rickerts, and Casca are all sweating as well. They're all terrified. They have no idea what's going on right now. Now Griffith commands his men to fire the next volley, but Zod just merely takes the arrows into his skin. And because of this interference, Zod is absolutely enraged. He's like, no one may defile this battle. I won't have it. He then starts skewering the men with his horns and starts ravaging everything around it. We then have a really nice panel of Zod chomping down on a human and tearing apart another one with his hand. Now this may be a reference to Nosferatu to Zod. You know how I said that Zod doesn't actually drink blood? Well, there are many instances of him chomping down on humans like this, so it could be implied that he's taken in some blood, maybe, but it's never directly referenced that he's actually drinking their blood. He then stomps down on a man as Griffith tells Casca to get everyone out of here. He then goes to help Guts, but Guts is like, what the hell are you doing, Griffith? And then as Griffith pulls up Guts from the ground, Zod comes in and he's like, where are you going? Your heart's still beating. And the two just look absolutely absolutely terrified right here. Alright, so now we're on chapter 5, and we got this beautiful image of Griffith here with his sword. So we got Guts leaning on Griffith here as they're staring on Nosferatu Zod, and Zod is like, fight! Fight me until you're torn to pieces! Now Pip and Judo and Rickert are all just scared out of their mind, and Casca is like, Griffith! And then Zod roars as he knocks down one of the pillars, and Griffith screams at Guts, can't you move? And Guts is like, we're dead if I don't! And then Griffith tells Guts, you from the left, let's go! Now as Zod is going in and the two decide to separate. And with this diversion, Griffith is able to slice off Zod's left arm. And the others are like, oh yeah, awesome, it looks like we got him. Now Griffith is telling Guts to run for it, but unfortunately, Zod is coming right back in. Casca tries to warn him ahead of time, but unfortunately, Zod's tail whips Griffith back. And Griffith goes crashing right into one of the pillars. And it's so jarring that even Casca grabs her mouth with both of her hands. But luckily, by being knocked back, his bale comes out of his armor. Guts is then trying to stand up with the assistance of his sword as Zod is bearing down on him. And then Zod is like, What a day today's been, that I'd meet a human, two humans, who could wound me so. Zod then picks up his severed arm and starts to whack Guts with it. He then uses some sort of ability that allows him to reattach his own arm. And he's like, And that both of them would be lost at once. I'll start with this man. Now, Casca is absolutely losing it right now, but as Zod goes to look down, he's like, What? What's this? 
It's the egg of the king. And he's in disbelief right now. He's like, it can't be the egg of the king. A cub like him with the crimson bailet. The god hand. And you see the veins in his eyes and the absolute fear. And he's just, he's absolutely losing it. Which is amazing because Zod was giving everyone else so much fear. And the fact that he's staring at this bailet and he's got so much fear is really shocking. And then he's like, so it's that kind of ploy. And he starts to laugh in a deranged manner. And then he punches a hole through the ceiling and says, our battle is on hold for now, boy, but I wonder if I'll ever meet up with you again. Here's a word of warning. No, a prophecy. If you could be said to be a true friend of this man, then take heed. When his ambitions collapses, death will pay you a visit. A death you can never escape. And then he smashes through the ceiling as everyone is covering their eyes. And then the men outside the castle are like, what's that? A demon? And then we see Zod flying off in the distance as lightning is coming down from the sky. And Guts is only left to ponder, death. You mean, I'm going to die? And then Casca runs over to Griffith and she grabs onto his body. Gaston and the other Hawks Raiders grab on the Guts and are like, are you okay, Captain? And Guts goes to check in on Griffith, but Casca swipes him away. Don't you touch Griffith. It's your fault. This never would have happened to Griffith if it weren't for you. All right, so for chapter six, we got a couple things to talk about. First, when this came out in Young Animal, it came out on December 25th of 1992. And the Young Animal cover for that issue looked like this with Guts. Guts' face. They also got a picture of Guts without all the text on it, and it's really badass looking, but it's kind of weird at the same time because very rarely do you ever see Guts laughing like this. Like, it's just not a normal facial expression for him. And then to start the issue itself, we got Nosferatu Zod saying, Death will pay you a visit, a death you can never escape. Now, there is a colored version of this as well, and we got the colored version of how it appeared in the original magazine, and then we got a clean version as well. And then we got a re repeat to the last phrase, a death you can never escape. And this time the perspective is on Guts. And again, we got another nice colored page right here of how it showed up in the magazine and how it showed up, you know, just being a clean version. Now this is not part of the issue itself. However, it did come out in late 1992 and it's a young animal telephone card with Guts's picture on it. So this is really badass. Um, unfortunately, this was the best resolution I could get for this photo. I couldn't find any other more detailed versions, but this is really nice, guys. I mean, this is just absolutely amazing. I love when I can find photos of Guts or any Berserk merchandise from way back, especially stuff I haven't seen before. All right, so now we're at Windham Castle, the royal capital of Midland, and we got a couple of aristocrats talking about the Band of the Hawk, and they're talking about the fact that Griffith's men had grave injuries in their recent battle. And the rumors are is that some giant beast appeared in a Tudor stronghold. But they're all like, this is a falsehood. However, it seems that not just one or two people witnessed it. It was multiple people. But because of the fact that they still took the stronghold, it can't be a mere blunder on Griffith's part. He had to have some strategy involved in that. And then they're becoming vexed that Griffith is rising the ranks, and then we see Guts walking by. And then one of the aristocrats is like, clear the way, you churl. And I actually had to look this up because I wasn't even aware of that slur before, but a churl is basically an impolite or mean-spirited person. Or even even a peasant. So basically they're calling Guts a peasant. And then the one aristocrat is making fun of Guts saying, oh, did you get those wounds from that beast? But Guts is not having any of it. He takes his crutch and puts it right on the aristocrat's foot. And the aristocrat doesn't want to just take this lying down, so he's like, face my sword! But Guts just gives him a menacing glare, and that's all it takes for him to back off. <laughs> and not just back off, he falls to his knees, and he's like literally on the verge of tears here. We then see Guts with the Band of the Hawk once again. And although they all seem pretty happy to see him, Casca's got a menacing glare on her face. And he's thinking about the fact that she was blaming him for the fact that Griffith got hurt in that last battle. Judo tries to reassure him though. He's like, everyone knows that it wasn't your fault. Don't sweat it. Now it turns out that they're all here to pay Griffith a visit. However, the various nobles and aristocrats are paying him a visit first. Now, even though most of them find him an annoying upstart, if they stake a claim in him early enough, it may pay off dividends in the future, especially given the fact that he's heading up the most mightiest army in all of Midland. Now Guts wants to make his way to Griffith. However, Kosk is yelling at him. And in a classic guy response, Guts is like, like, I was listening, so what? And speaking as a married man, the so what phrase never works out too well. And of course, Casca's like, what do you mean, so what? I'm saying you need to wait here until the dignitaries have finished their audience. Now, Guts wants to make his way in, but the various soldiers block his path. 
Gutsen easily steals one of the weapons from the guards and knocks him over. And with another swift move, he steals the other's weapon and knocks him over too. And after doing so, he's like, wanna come, Rickert? And just as Guts is going in, he's like, yo, Griff! But unfortunately, he feels something on his shoulder. He turns around and he sees Casca rearing up for a punch and she punches him right in the face. And I always love this face by Guts here, you know, like kind of that cartoonish face when you just get slugged by someone. Kind of reminds me of the old Bugs Bunny cartoons when like they would get hit with a hammer or something. And I absolutely love the face by Corcus here. It looks like he's watching like an AEW or WWE event. He's like, oh! Now Guts calls Casca a crazy bitch, but she's got tears in her eyes and she looks very sad right now. So Guts decides it's probably not best right now to fight with her. And she's like, why does Griffith got to bother with a guy like you? So realizing he's not going to get much further with Casca being there, he's like, ah, I'll just get going for now. Now the others note that it feels like Griffith has been drifting away from them lately. We then see Guts swinging his sword on a staircase. And while he's swinging his sword, he's thinking about all the times that Casca has been yelling at him. The fact that she called him a mad dog and why does it always have to be this way and the fact that it was his fault that he got hurt in that battle with Nosferatu Zod and just as he's thinking about all this he's interrupted by Griffith who's using a crutch to walk and Griffith admires the fact that Guts is able to swing his sword so soon after the battle with Zod. Now Griffith mentions that he's kind of getting annoyed by all the officials who are just going in to see him to gain favor with him but he realizes that he has to play the game if he wants to ascend to the kingdom. They start talking about Nosferatu Zod and they're like hmm this might be proof that something huge, something beyond human understanding, exists within this world. For instance, what are called gods. And Guts is like, uh, don't you mean devils? And in a very cryptic response, Griffith is like, who knows, aren't they the same thing? Now, Guts tells Griffith that the reason that Zod flew off is that he saw the bailet hanging around Griffith's neck. And as Griffith pulls out his bailiff from his shirt, Guts thinks about what Nosferatu Zod said in the last chapter. Now, Guts is wondering why Griffith would put his life on the line for a single soldier, even though it's a very important soldier in Guts. And Griffith's like, there's no reason. At all. Do I need one? Tell me, do I need a reason each time I put myself in harm's way? For your sake? Alright, we got another beautiful cover here for volume 6. And then we see a picture of Guts and Casca inside a tree. And it looks like Casca is completely naked here. So this is making us wonder what the heck is going on. Especially with Casca yelling at Guts in the last couple chapters. Now Griffith looks over at Guts after he asks a question. And Guts is like, well no, I guess you don't really need a reason. However, they're then interrupted by the king. And not just the king, his brother Julius and a couple of castle guards. Now Griffith immediately bows down to the king. But Guts is still standing up with his sword sword in his hand. But Julius is very quick to excoriate him for not bowing in the king's presence. The king then says he's out for a stroll and that they don't have to bow their heads. Now the king officially announces that this is his younger brother Julius and that he's the general of the white dragons and second in succession to the throne of Midland. Now it's really interesting because we find out Julius's name but the king of Midland is never given a name throughout the manga. He's just the king of Midland which is kind of interesting. Now the king marvels at Griffith's beautiful battle plans and he's like ah just seeing you guys fight in the battlefield it even makes my blood seem to boil at this point. Now it turns out that a lot of the statesmen are not favorable of the common man but given such the circumstances, you know, they need as many people as they can get to win these battles. And given all the complimentary words, Griffith is very thankful. Now, peeking out from the corner, we see a girl. And Griffith is like, who might that be? And it turns out that the lady is Charlotte, and it's the king's daughter. Now, as the king and Julius are taking their leave, Charlotte goes to follow them. Unfortunately, she trips on one of the cobblestones and begins to trip. Griffith puts out his arm and is able to catch her, however. Julius then takes the mere touching of the princess as an insult and slaps Griffith across the face. Now, Guts looks like he's ready to do something about it. He's like, hey pal, but Griffith puts his crutch against him and slows him down a bit. He's like, please pardon my rudeness, your lordship general Julius. Now Charlotte's ready to go back to her father, but she gives Griffith a glance that makes it look like she might be falling in love with him. Now we see various women in the kingdom talking about the fact that Lord Griffith could be made a count. And they're even talking about the fact that he's beautiful and elegant and dignified. He's a lot better than a lot of the officers in the castle who are so boorish and rude. Now Julius quickly breaks this up and he's 
sounds like chirping sparrows. Now a short bald man, Minister Foss, then interrupts Julius. And he's here to tell Julius that for the upcoming autumn hunt, that the band of the hawk will be the king's guard. Which frustrates Julius because usually it's supposed to be the white dragon knight. And now he's absolutely seething right now. He's like, oh man, it seems like the glory of the white dragon knights has faded in respect to the band of the hawk's achievements. And Foss reminds him because of the band of the hawk's ever victorious streak that he's surely a godsend on the kingdom and he's gained a special place in the king's heart because of all the victories he's accomplished. And if he continues doing all this, it won't be long before he reaches the rank of general. Now Julius is absolutely enraged by this. He's like, I've never heard of a commoner become a general before. Foss decides to be a little devious right here and he's like, well, you know, on an autumn hunt, things could get a little murky in that forest and you never know if a stray arrow might fly wildly. A straight arrow well covered in poison. And although Julius is a little slow at first, he's like, oh, I see what you're getting at. A stray arrow, eh? Interesting. A fitting way for a commoner to die. And as Julius is leaving, we get this very sinister look on Foss's face. So you gotta wonder at this point, what kind of influence does Foss have in the kingdom? It's then later on at night, Guts is looking up at the moon with his sword in hand, and he's thinking about the conversation that he had with Griffith earlier. And although he doesn't really have an answer to what he wants to do with his life, for now he's going to swing his sword for Griffith's sake. Alright, so for chapter 8, we got a picture of Charlotte here, and uh, you know, she's looking very cute, and it's just a nice little picture. And then we see a picture of the fox being chased by the various dogs, and it looks like it's time for the autumn hunt. Now we actually got this picture of the fox here, from the Berserk trading card game, in a colored version, so I thought that was pretty cool. And then we see the king and his various guards looking at the hunt going on. Now they're like, would your majesty care to join in on the hunt? But he's like, no, at my age, I would tire too soon. Now we see Julius looking over at Griffith and the band of the hawk. And then he takes a quick look at the assassin who's going to shoot the quote-unquote stray arrow at Griffith. Now, I always think it's kind of funny here, because when the fox makes its way to Guts, he just kind of screams at it. He doesn't even try to catch it or anything. And you can tell he's just kind of annoyed by the whole proceedings. Now, Judio's like, well, you know, it's kind of part of the job to do this kind of stuff. Plus, you know, we're not putting ourselves in harm's way, but Guts is like, eh, it feels more natural for me to be swinging my sword around. So unless he's actually risking his life, you know, everything else just kind of seems very mundane and boring to him. And Corcus begins to scold Guts. He's like, look, we're on the autumn hunt with the king's guard. It's a privilege just for us to be chosen here. You know, we have to run around battlefields covered in mud and blood, and we've earned this privilege, and you're complaining about it? It's ridiculous. Now, Casca just merely listens to the conversation, and then she takes a quick look over at Charlotte. Now, Charlotte doesn't like the sight of killing, so she turns her head away when someone shoots at the fox. And Griffith comes over to her, and he's like, do you dislike hunting? And she honestly admits that she doesn't like hunting because she thinks that it's cruel. And she's like, it's the same as the battlefield. Why do men enjoy shedding blood? And to kind of ease attention, Griffith plucks off a leaf from one of the trees and starts to blow on it. Charlotte does likewise, and the two just kind of have a fun time together blowing leaves. Now, Casca sees the whole proceedings and gets a little bit jealous by this and starts to ride away. Now Julius tells the assassin that he shouldn't be too impatient, that the chance will come eventually. And then just as he says this, we see a wild boar run right in the middle of Griffith and Charlotte. And because of this, it spooks Charlotte's horse and he goes running off. Griffith, with no other choice, has to chase Charlotte down. And realizing that this is the opportunity, Julius looks over at the assassin and gives him the go-ahead. After chasing down Charlotte's horse, he's eventually able to slow it down. He then checks in on the shaking Charlotte as we see the assassin covered in the brush, looking to line up his shot. Now, Charlotte admits that she was very scared and that her heart is still pounding, and she's never been on such a wild horse ride in her life. Now, Griffith tries to reassure her by saying that her fears have already subsided, but just as he's saying this, we see the arrow coming in, and it lands directly in his chest. And just as this happens, we see the band of the hawk coming in, and Guts is like, Griffith! Having just been shot by the arrow, Griffith then collapses right into the water. Casca goes by her side, and she's like, Griffith, are you okay? Hang on! Now Guts, having no sense of decorum, goes up to the princess, grabs her shoulder, and is like, what the hell is going on? Where'd that arrow come from? And she's in pain right now, and she's like, I don't know! Don't touch me! Now, Guts is looking off in the forest, trying to see if he can find the person that shot Griffith, but unfortunately, he doesn't see anyone. And the assassin notes that the arrow's been soaked in deadly poison, and it in fact comes from the Kalabal Bean. Now, I tried to look up the Kalabal Bean on Wikipedia, 
internet and Google, and nothing turned up. However, there is a collab bar bean, and in Japanese, sometimes they switch L's and R's, so it's probably just, you know, a Japanese translational air there. But anyway, there's a place called Kalabar, which is a location in Nigeria. And as it turns out, the old people of Old Kalabar used to use this poison for people who were accused of witchcraft. And it was considered only to affect the guilty. If a person was accused of a crime and they ingested it, but they didn't die, they were considered innocent. So kind of an interesting little bit of historical information right there. We then see Griffith fully conscious and everyone's actually really surprised. And Griffith pulls out his own arrow and he looks at it and he's like, hmm, poison I'd say, a rather strong one. And it turns out that the arrow didn't actually hit Griffith, it hit the bailet. A stroke of luck as it would seem. And everyone else in the Band of the Hawk is like, holy cow, it's the devil's luck! And Guts is thinking about the fact that, yeah, this is no ordinary luck. Now, Casca wants Griffith to take off his armor to make sure that he's okay, but he's like, nah, it's really nothing. Now, because the whole incident happened because Charlotte's horse was going erratic, she blames herself for the incident. Guts then tells Griffith that he's gonna go search the area with his men. He's like, come on, Gaston! But just then, Griffith looks in the clearing and he sees Julius staring him down and he's like a high price to pay for this poison and just like that we're back at Windham Castle and we see a very angry Julius who's excoriating the man who should have killed Griffith and not only did they not kill Griffith Griffith protected the princess with his own body so he gets some accolades for the whole incident so his stock only went up because of this and Julius remarks that it's the pinnacle of ineptitude he then excuses the assassin and goes sits down on a chair and he thinks about the fact that those eyes, like he was trying to daunt me, like he was looking down on some worthless thing. That was his expression. And he remarks that it's remarkably similar to a hawk's eyes. But he eventually tries to reassure himself that, no, nah, it was nothing, like, my mind was just playing tricks with me there. We then see Guts go up to a high tower where he meets Griffith in a study. Now it turns out to be a great man, Griffith is reading many great books, including one about Kama Sutra, it would seem. Guts eventually sits down and he's like, well, you want me to do something? And Griffith's like, yeah. Yes, I like you to kill a man for me. We then see Guts in a cloak at Julius's manor, and it turns out that Griffith wants him to kill Julius, second in line for the throne. And it turns out that Griffith was able to identify that the poison was from the Calabal bean. And it turns out that only one person has bought it as of late, and he was the best bowman among the White Dragon Knights, which would mean that he's working for Julius. Now he even paid one of the maids to investigate this man, and it turns out that they were discussing the disturbance of the assassination attempt. And it's for these reasons that he wants Guts to kill King Julius for him, as a means for revenge. We then see Guts lurking around the rooftops as Julius is training with his son Adonis. And Julius is not taking it easy on his son here, he's actually going rather rough. Now Hassan is trying to tell Julius to calm down, but Julius is not having any of it. And he's like, Adonis must someday become the leader of the White Dragon Knights and command the mightiest force in the land. And therefore, he can't go easy on him. We then see the sword fly out of Adonis' hand as he goes flying back. Julius then calls it a day as Hassan goes to check in on Adonis. And as Guts was watching this whole thing, he kind of thinks about the fact that it's very similar to how Gambino treated him as a child. But he's like, ah, oh, can't be careless at a time like this, I gotta stay focused. Now Hassan is trying to implore Julius to be a little easier on his son, and Julius agrees that his frustrations have gotten the best of him as of late. Now as Hassan takes his leave, Julius thinks about Griffith and tosses his chalice into the fire. He then notices that the wind is coming through one of the doors, and then he sees a cloaked man within his residence, and it turns out to be Guts. He then reaches for a sword, but Guts is too quick and slashes him across the chest. And as he makes this motion, the cloak on his head comes off. Julius then desperately clutches on the Guts, and he's like, like, I know you, you're Griffiths, as he bleeds out and falls to the ground. Guts then notices a dark shadowy figure by the door, and knowing that he can't leave any witnesses, he's gonna drive his sword right into this person. And after doing so, he quickly realizes that it was Julius' son, Adonis. And this just completely and utterly shocks him. Now Guts is staring at the reality of the situation, that he killed a small boy, Adonis. And it's very gruesome here, you know, blood is everywhere on the floor. Guts is actually very shaken to his core here. He looks like he has no idea what's going on. Like emotionally, he must just be going through all this turmoil inside right now. And as Adonis is slumping over, he reaches his hand out. He's looking for some form of embrace before he dies. And Guts grabs onto his hand as he's coughing up blood. And Adonis has got tears 
tears in his eyes and it's it's just so heart-wrenching right now just watching this happening watching a child you know die right before Guts's eyes and you can really see that this is affecting Guts as well as he puts his hand over his mouth but unfortunately he doesn't have time to mourn his loss as the castle guards have already caught him so with one swift move Guts goes in and just slaps them both off with his giant sword he then puts on his hood as the castle guards are getting ready to confront the robber Hassan then sees the reality of the situation and is just absolutely heartbroken by it. And he's like, find him, the robber, you will not let him leave this house alive. We then see Guts slashing his way through and eventually there's too many guards to fight head on so he's got to jump off the castle walls. He then goes through some trees and realizes that he can escape through the sewer system. But unfortunately, as he bursts his way into the sewer system, he trips and hits the back of his head on like a wall or something. And because of this, he's put into a dreamscape in which he's thinking about battling Gambino when he was a little child. And he's thinking, the sound of swords clashing, that's Gambino! I was always desperate, always trying to get you to appreciate me. But as their battle is going on, he notices a shadow that's growing ever closer to him, and it turns out to be none other than Nosferatu Zod. And Zod readies his sword, and in one epic swing, takes out Gambino's head. And Guts is crying, he can't believe what's going on, so he's like, I gotta get revenge, I gotta get Zod! But unfortunately, Zod thrusts his sword right through Guts' chest. And Guts goes down onto the ground, blood is coming from his chest and his mouth. And then we see Zod looking at his own hand. And then as we get a close up on his face, we see that it's none other than Guts himself in the monstrous form of Zod. Now, I actually think that this might be rather symbolic. And I made a video about this in the past, talking about my theories on the topic. So take a look at that video if you're interested. But otherwise, let's get back on track. Guts eventually wakes up and he finds out that he's still in the sewer system. He then realizes that he's coughing up blood as he makes his way through the sewer system. We then see the various members of the Band of the Hawk in a tavern of sorts. And it turns out that Griffith is not there because he's at the princess's dinner party. Guts then walks into the tavern and gets Casca's attention. And she's really surprised because Guts is all battered up and bleeding and looks really tired. And she's like, why do you look like that? Did you fall in a moat or something? And Guts doesn't even respond to this. He's like, where's Griffith? And once he finds out that Griffith's at a dinner party, he decides to go in that direction. But before he does so, Casca notices an arrow wound in his arm. We then see Guts walking up a staircase to the dinner party. It's a very lavish estate, and we see both Princess Charlotte and Griffith at the top of the staircase. Alright, so for chapter 12, the title of the chapter is Precious Things, and we got a nice picture of Guts here holding his sword. And we see that a ball is going on, we see various people dancing, they're having fun, there's music, and then we transition back over to Griffith and Charlotte, who are outside having a conversation with one another. Griffith then takes the cloak off of his back and puts it on the ground so Charlotte can sit down on it. And as Guts is looking up at Griffith and wants to go and talk to him, he's stopped by Casca. And she reminds him that he can't embarrass Griffith given the way that he's dressed and the fact that he's bleeding and everything. She then rips off a piece of cloth from her shirt and bandages up Guts, which is quite the improvement for her, you know, blaming him for Griffith getting hurt to now actually helping him out. So this is actually quite the improvement. Now Charlotte admits that the reason that the ball is going on right now is to distract everyone from the, the long and tiresome war. And she's like, oh, it'd just be so much better if we could end the war itself. Now Griffith requotes Charlotte by saying, why is it that men enjoy little more than shedding blood? And he emphasizes the fact that it's merely a tool to secure and protect a precious thing. And I quote, But for a man to obtain a family or a sweetheart, he must obtain one other precious thing, for no other sake, to accomplish it for him, for him himself. A dream. Dream? One who dreams of world domination, one who devotes his life to the thorough tempering of one's sword. If there's a dream which takes his whole life to find, there are also dreams which, like storms, devour tens of thousands of other dreams. With no relation to social status, class, background, whether it suits them or not, people yearn for a dream. Sustained by a dream, hurt by a dream, revived by a dream, killed by a dream. And even after being abandoned by a dream, it continues to smolder from the bottom of one's heart, probably until the verge of death. And a man should envision such a lifetime once, a life spent as a martyr, to the god named Dream. Ultimately, to be born and to then simply live for no better reason, I cannot abide such a lifestyle. Now Charlotte admits that this is the first time that she's talked to a man like this before, and she marvels at the fact that he's such a wondrous person. And she even remarks that he's nobler than any of the nobles in the castle, which is quite the phrase coming from the princess's mouth. And she even likens him to a philosopher of sorts. 
And then she's like, well, I imagine your friends are attracted by that same charm that I see. And even though he admits that they're excellent troops and they faced many deaths together, they are not friends. A friend to Griffith is someone who would never depend upon another person's dream. Someone who wouldn't be compelled by anyone, but would determine and pursue his own reason to live. And therefore, what he thinks of as a friend is one who is his equal in every regard. And then we have this beautiful panel here of Gut down on the bottom of the staircase in the darkness, looking up at the majestic godlike Griffith and his personification as this illusory dream. And upon hearing this, Gut looks a little bit dejected. And Griffith reminds the princess that he's like, you know, there were days I didn't even have a slice of bread to eat, but now look at me, I'm talking to you, the princess of the whole kingdom. And then she questions, what is your dream? But before Griffith can say another word, they're interrupted by one of the maids, and she says that Uncle Julius has died. Now Charlotte is grieved by this news, but once we get a look over at Griffith, we notice that he's smiling in a very devilish manner. And of course, we already know that he had a hand in Julius' death. Now after hearing Griffith's magnificent now, after hearing Griffith's magnificent speech and his aspirations, Guts decides to go down the staircase. Now, for chapter 13, we got a couple of things to point out here. Number one, this came out in Young Animal issue number nine in 1993. And we have this beautiful cover here of Guts with his sword on the cover. And then the first image says, the Midland Royal Family Crest, a castle bearing a crown seated in the midst of the heavens, the legendary Tower of Triumph. And it should be noted that there is a colored panel of this page as well, so that's that's really cool. And this panel of the Band of the Hawk as they're leaving the Midland Castle is also in color, so that's also another fantastic image. And then this next one is in color as well. And the ladies are saying, so many of them. They say this new campaign could mean an end to the war. Now only if that comes true. Don't worry, Midland has its own guardian angel, you know. Speak of the devil. And then we see Griffith walking down the hallway. Now that's kind of an interesting choice of words there. Guardian angels and speak of the devil, and they're referring to Griffith. Now as Griffith is walking down the corridor as he runs into Foss. And he's like, ah, the Band of the Hawk is the campaign's vanguard. And he even refers to the Band of the Hawk as the guardian deity. And Foss talks about the recent tragedy, and he's like, ah, oh, a child of only 13, Master Adonis, how cruel for him to die. And he refers to the event as the work of a demon, and Griffith's like, no, not the work of a demon, the work of a man. And then Foss tells Griffith that the arrow that was supposedly aimed at Princess Charlotte during the autumn hunt was actually for him. And it wasn't a shooter spy that shot that arrow, it was in fact someone in the very court. And he even likens the people of the court to a den of evil spirits. So it's not very far-fetched for someone to have a murderous spirit within them. Which is rather interesting because Foss is sharing some very vital information to Griffith here. And we now know for certain that Foss is playing both sides. He's working for the Midland nobles, you know, he's helping out their causes, he's recommending that they kill Griffith, but at the same time, he's also working the Griffith angle. He's also trying to quote-unquote help Griffith. He's essentially hedging his bets, so no matter which side wins, he'll be in that side's corner so that he's in a good position in the kingdom. Now as Griffith takes his leave, Foss is actually rather interested that he didn't even bat an eye at Master Adonis' death. And he considers the idea that maybe it was all his doing in the beginning. And he also considers the possibility that he saw through King Julius' assassination and this was a form of retaliation. And if that's so, he may also know of Foss' involvement. With all that said, however, he figures that there's going to be a lot of people in the kingdom who are not big fans of Griffith, and he can eventually set them against Griffith in the future. However, as he's taking his leave, he catches a glimpse of Griffith off in the distance, and he's staring him down. And just the mere gaze of Griffith instills fear in Foss's heart. Now, as Casca is looking for Griffith, we see Prince Charlotte getting his attention. She then gives him a necklace that's made of lodestone, which has a natural magnetic property to it. And it is said that the two that possess each half are destined to meet each other. He then states that when he returns from his campaign, he'll give it back to her, which pleases her greatly. He then bids her farewell and takes his leave with Casca. We then see for the first time the Queen of Midland, and she's taken umbrage to the fact that she's giving out gifts to someone of humble birth. And because of the condescending language, Charlotte eventually walks away. We then see Griffith telling his men to move out, as everyone in Midland is cheering them on. And what a beautiful panel this is with Griffith and the Band of the Hawk. Just absolutely gorgeous, guys. 
And then we see Guts with the Hawks Raiders as he's thinking about the words that Griffith just said about what a friend truly means and the fact that you have to be equal with Griffith to be his friend. All right, so we're on chapter 14, Engagement. Now we see a bunch of lightning in the background and a very menacing group of individuals. And it looks like the band of the Hawk is about to face them down. Now we notice that Casca is starting to feel some irritation and pain right now, especially in her abdomen, but she's like, nah, let's do this. And with the lightning cracking, Griffith commands his forces to go forward. And it is a very brutal battle, guys. We see Pippin smashing people. We see Rickert shooting people. Judo's doing his part and so is Guts. Now, unfortunately for Casca, because of her abdominal pain, it's causing her movements to be rather labored and slowed. And then we see Adon, the leader, approach her. So you're her, the only woman who commands a thousand of the Band of the Hawk. And then he decides to berate her a little bit. Women are inferior to men in strength. What use could they be in a battle? And then he assumes that she achieved her rank because of sneaking into Griffith's bedroom. Which doesn't make Casca too happy. Unfortunately for her, Adon knocks her off her horse. The battlefield is a sacred ground of men. I, Adon, head of the Blue Whale Ultra Heavy Armored Fierce Assault Annihilation Night Corps, shall teach you the folly of your frivolity in setting foot upon it. And because she's not on a horse, she's at a severe disadvantage. Now the others want to help her out, but Casca tells them to keep back. She then realizes that she's at the edge of a cliff and at the end of her rope. Adon then looks to finish the job with one swing, but Guts intervenes to save her life. This ain't like you, says Guts. Guts then uses his next swing to knock Adon off balance. And with this, he tries to egg Adon on so that they can go into a battle. And now we're on chapter 15, Casca. And we got a really nice image here of Adon, Guts, and Casca. Now Adon starts to twirl his spear and says that this is the ultimate spear technique, which can crush even marble, pass secretly down through the Korbowitz family. He then goes in, but Guts slices his spear right in half with his sword. Guts then knocks Adon off his horse, and he looks rather pitiful. And in one swing, he slices off a part of his face. Now the band of the hawk is cheering on Guts, but Guts is like, hey, what's wrong with you, Casca? Your fighting's horrible today. And then we see Casca sweating, she looks like she's in a daze, and then she passes out. Guts goes to reach for her, and as he does, Adon shoots a crossbow right at Guts. And as Guts grabs on the Casca, he gets hit by the crossbow and off of his horse, sending the two down the cliffside. And then as they're falling down the cliff, the band of the hawk is shouting out for them, and they fall down into the water. But unfortunately for them, they gotta keep fighting the forces. Guts then pulls Casca out of the water and notices that she's unconscious. And with no other resort, he has to give her mouth to mouth to make sure that she's getting oxygen. He then pulls the arrow out of his side and realizes that they can't scale the cliff, so he's wondering what they should do next. He then notices that Casca's got a high fever and realizes that he has to get her to a dry area so she doesn't die of hypothermia. Griffith is then told that Guts and Casca fell off of a high cliff. Now Griffith wants to go help him, but one of the Midland Army soldiers is telling them that in war, conquering the enemy is the most important of all. And given the fact that the captain of the Hawks Raiders and the female commander are together, would make one believe that they should be safe. However, Griffith still looks worried as lightning cracks behind him. Now Guts realizes that he can't start a fire because if he did, the enemy would see the smoke and that would give away their position. So with no other resort, he's got to take off Casca's clothing. And as he does so, he notices some blood. And it's not blood from a battle wound, it's blood from a period. Which makes Guts realize why she was so tired from the beginning. And to end the chapter, we see Casca cradled in Guts' lap as he's keeping her warm for the night. Alright, so now we're on chapter 16, Casca, chapter Chapter 2. Whether you come along or not is your decision. You know how to fight already, don't you? Says Griffith the Casca. We then notice Griffith and Casca riding together on horses at a much younger age in the bottom left corner. And we quickly realize that this is a dream. Guts then wakes up Casca in the cave. And as Casca starts to get up, she realizes her state of undress. What could I do? You were soaking wet and freezing to death to boot, says Guts. However, this justification doesn't go over too well for Guts, as Casca punches him in the face. She then proceeds to toss any heavy object at Guts in rage, including a knife. Hello? You finished now, you hysterical bitch? If you weren't a woman, I'd knock your jaw right out of joint for that. Casca then thinks about the words that were said to her by Adon in their previous battle. And this actually makes her quite angry. I wasn't... I wasn't born a woman because I wanted to be, cries Casca. Guts tries to apologize for his mistakes, but Casca tries to punch him. You really are some kind of bitch. 
Calm your ass down. Don't make me force you. However, Casca can't fight on much longer because she's still on her period and very exhausted. Casca then puts on some clothing and says, It's pathetic. You're the only one I didn't want to be saved by. And this makes Guts realize that Casca really hates him. He then wonders why she joined the Band of the Hawk, and it's because of Griffith. Turns out her home village was poor and nestled in a mountain ravine. The land was barren and they couldn't grow much crops, besides oats. And because of the war efforts, they were bled dry by taxes. So people starved to death in the winter times. And because their village was near a border, it was often involved in skirmishes. And the only thing that the townspeople could do was go up into the mountains and hide silently. We were all used to being robbed and walked over. I too thought that such a way of life was just natural. And then one day, a nobleman ended up buying Casca from her family. And though he was reluctant, the father accepted the deal, given the fact that they had six children and they were rather poor. Now inside the carriage, Casca was attacked by the aristocrat, and it turned out that he wanted to rape her. He eventually caught her and pinned her down. I can't help it. It's natural. Those two ideas were always in my heart to help me stay connected to reality. But just then, Griffith came in with sword in hand on top of a horse. Does being born of nobility mean that you're chosen by God? So strange. It was as if the image of some saint adorning the wall of the village church had just come to life. He was awe-inspiring, an otherworldly spectacle. I thought God had taken pity on this miserable, powerless girl and sent an angel. Now, trivia question, how old was Casca when Griffith saved her life? Pause the video if you don't want to be spoiled. Otherwise, the answer is 12. If you have something to protect, take up that sword, says Griffith. The nobleman dives for the sword, but Casca grabs it first. And with one swift move, she thrusts the sword through the aristocrat and kills him. However, being her first killed, she's rather troubled by the affair. Griffith then comes down and steadies her shaking hands. The fear didn't vanish completely, but the feelings of guilt and regret faded. His magnificence and the warmth of the blanket he gave me filled my heart. Now Griffith is ready to go with the Band of the Hawk, and Casca is wondering what she should do. Do as you wish, says Griffith. Let me come with you, screams Casca. Now Corcus says they aren't just some thieves. They're collecting war funds so they can eventually set up an army. But Casca can't go back to her village, given the fact that she would be a burden on her family. You might die, you know, says Griffith. But despite Despite the risk, Casca nods her head. Didn't I tell you? Do as you wish. Whether you come along or not is your decision. You know how to fight already, don't you? But, but you were the one who gave me the sword and blanket, says Casca. Now we got a beautiful cover image here of Guts and Casca for volume 7 of Berserk. Really nice stuff. And now we're officially on chapter 17, which is titled Casca, chapter 3. Alright, so just a brief diversion here, guys. For the release of Berserk volume 7, Kentaro Mira released this note to the readers, along with this original illustration of Casca. So it didn't come out when chapter 17 came out, so it came out on March 29th of 1994, which was a later date than chapter 17. But I thought it would be appropriate to put it here since it corresponds to volume 7. Now after Casca joined the Band of the Hawk, everything changed for her. What was once a paltry dining table by the fire became a glorious battlefield adjoined by death and blood. Since that day, the day I met Griffith, I... even now I feel it's been one long dream. Back then, I idolized Griffith. He was like some prophet or saint. And what's really interesting is that everyone in their band was a ragtag commoner. And leading them was a boy of innocence. He wasn't a noble, he wasn't a knight, he wasn't an aristocrat. He was a commoner like everyone else. A miracle. Yes, in my eyes, that's exactly what Griffith was. Now eventually the Band of the Hawk became involved in a certain feudal lord's dispute. And the man that the Band of the Hawk was going to help was a man of sordid taste. And it turns out those tastes included small boys from neighboring villages. A heart-rending sense of fear and disgust. I had almost become like that once says Casca. But just like that time, by putting his hand on my shoulder, just from that, I mysteriously stopped trembling. Now after a few skirmishes, Griffith finds a dead boy on the battlefield. A boy that was only about 10 years old. Now Pippin eventually finds one of his toys, which was a knight scuffed, dirtied, and missing a leg. He must have greatly admired knights, says Griffith. I remember him well. He gazed at me as if I were the hero of some story. I wonder if he was happy, dreaming. Did he die enchanted by his dream? Or was death the end of the dream? Was it despair? Maybe my dream is what killed this boy. 
Now later on, Costco's walking through the castle courtyards and notice Griffith high up in a chamber. Griffith! But then she noticed Lord Gennon come from behind Griffith. And Gennon took Griffith away to the bedroom, which shocked and confused Casca. Hey, you're kidding, right? You mean Mr. Ball of Pride? Now the next morning, Costco's walking along the river and noticed Griffith bathing himself. Why not join me? It feels nice, says Griffith. Am I dirty? Casca then wonders why he was alone with Gennon. Why, why would you with someone like him? Money, replies Griffith. An army consumes so much money just being. Men, horses, equipment, provisions, none of it's free. And the band of the hawk will grow larger and larger. It has to. For that too, we need a vast amount of war funds. Now they could have raised the war funds through their natural efforts, but Griffith wanted to expedite the process. With every battle fought, I lose more troops. Griffith, is it because of that boy? replies Casca. No. I thought about it logically. To go to battle ten times and lose hundreds of soldiers, or to seduce one old man, which is the lesser risk? But if for their sakes, for the sake of the dead, if there's something I can do, that thing is to win. Griffith then scratches his own skin with his nails. I'll keep winning to fulfill my dream, to which they cling. My dream can only be realized by building upon their corpses. It's a blood-smeared dream, after all. But for hundreds of thousands of lives to hang in the balance, and myself alone not to be unclean, what I want won't enter my grasp so easily as that. Casca then runs over and grabs onto Griffith. Stop it! Just stop it! I'm alright. It's nothing. Casca tells Guts that the dream that Griffith is chasing is so genuine and extraordinary that the burden must be immeasurable. It's not that he's strong. Griffith has to make himself strong. I want to be by his side. If he's going to sacrifice everything for his dream, if his dream is to fight and cut away his own path, then I want to be his sword. Sometime later, Casca notices that she's become a veteran of warfare, and she even believes that Griffith's wish is going to come true someday. Until she meets Guts. Do you remember that day what Griffith said to you on top of that hill? I want you, says Griffith. Those words, he never says anything like that. You know I couldn't stand it. You got Griffith to say that so easily. I envied you. She then realizes that Griffith relies upon Guts. What I can't forgive is that selfishness of yours. The fact that you've almost gotten Griffith killed, screams Casca. I don't care if you get yourself killed on some battlefield, but I won't let you take Griffith's dream down with you. She then begins crying in Guts' chest as she wonders why Griffith puts so much faith into Guts. Guts puts his head up, but then he notices a noise, and he realizes that there's some Tudor troops really close to their position. And it turns out that Sir Adon put a bounty on Guts and Casca's heads, dead or alive. Guts then gives Casca some medicine and says there's no time to waste. They gotta get moving as the sun sets. We then see the sun setting and Guts and Casca are on the move. However, Casca falls to her knees, still tired from her ordeals. What the hell? Women are such royal pains. Guts then says, it doesn't matter to the enemy if you're a woman or whatever. They might actually like it, you know. Casca then musters up some strength, stands up, and says, let's go. And this puts a bit of a smile on Guts' face. However, they're stopped by an arrow, and they quickly realize that they're surrounded from all sides. So you're alive! Ha ha ha! Make me happy, boy! He then threatens to torture Guts when he captures him. As for the woman, she'll be a toy for my men here. Maybe you better rethink that one. She's a nightmare. She'll bite it right off, says Guts. Adon's men then attack, and Guts is right in the throes of action. And even Casca is doing her part to fight off the enemy soldiers. And as the two put their backs together, they realize they're in for a long night. Alright, so now we're on chapter 19, Prepared for Death, Chapter 2. Now Adon is telling his troops not to falter, but Guts is just slicing and dicing them rather easily. He then gets attacked by multiple soldiers, but he leaps into the air, thrusts his sword into someone's throat, and just starts cutting everyone in sight. Casca also performs a nice maneuver by cutting someone's wrist, and while he's down, cutting another soldier right in the artery. Now Casca and Guts go back to back once again, but she's looking rather tired at the moment. And then Adon announces the next soldier, a hulking monstrous man known as Samson. And it turns out that he's second in command for the Blue Whale Ultra Heavy Armored Fierce Assault Annihilation Corpse, Samson, the brother of Adon. Little brother at that. And not only is he huge and strong, but his armor is three times thicker than an ordinary plate. 
Now Samson lunges in, and it looks like it's going to be quite the fight. Now Samson uses his massive flail to toss it at Guts, but Guts manages to deflect it and hits another soldier with it. Samson then tries to hit Guts with a barrage of attacks. And the other soldiers are like, this is ridiculous, how is he stopping all of Samson's attacks? Now Casca is wondering why he's deflecting all the strikes instead of evading. She then realizes that Guts is wounded. Looks like the arrow wound you got protecting the woman hasn't quite healed yet, has it? Says Adon. Guts then says, I'll buy you a chance. Hightail it through the forest. Samson then uses his flail once more, but this time, Guts strikes it and cracks it right in half. He then lunges towards to stun Samson, and with that, Samson is dead and out of here, folks. Now, screams Guts, don't stand there and stare, get moving! I can't just run off alone, replies Casca. Now Adon commands his men to shoot at the woman, but Guts decides to use his body as a shield. Now Casca is wondering why he's doing all this, but he's like, sick as you are, you're just in my way, so get lost. It's like you said before, maybe I'm satisfied just as long as I can swing my sword around. Go to your sword master, go to Griffith. Alright, so now we're on chapter 20 of Berserk, Prepared for Death, chapter 3. And we see Guts slashing through many enemy soldiers right here. Don't just stand there, go! Now! Screams Guts. I swear I'll come back with the others. Until then, don't die! Screams Casca. Now the others don't want to let Casca escape, but Guts smashes one of them right in the face. Now as he cuts through the armor of the men, they're wondering that he's cutting through them like they're ground cherries. And they're like, no one told us that there was someone like this that existed. And to top things off, Guts admits that his sword is dull and it's not cutting too well right now. Now Adon tries to reassure his men that even though he's very strong and formidable, he's only one man, they should be able to take him down. And that anyone who takes him down is guaranteed five times the normal bounty. And they'll be put in charge of a hundred men. Now they all look to attack together, but Guts is ready to slash them all down. Now we see Casca running through the woods, unfortunately she trips on a root and falls down. She then notices that she's being chased by several soldiers. Now one of them jumps from a rock, but Casca is able to cut him down. She then realizes she's getting attacked by the rear, but turns around and kicks him right in the chin. We then go back to Guts as he's slashing down multiple soldiers. And goddamn does this look epic guys. We see arms flying, blood splattering, and Guts is just in full on rage mode right now. He then takes his first damage by blocking an arrow with one of his hands. But instead of feeling like he's defeated, he's like, ah, oh, this kind of evens the playing field. Things are getting interesting now. Now Casca takes out another soldier, unfortunately she's surrounded and she gets pinned down to the ground. But before they kill her, they want to have a little bit of fun first. Casca begins to panic and starts to feel that she's so powerless right now. And then she begins to think of Guts, and he says, Here, this worthless place, is this where it ends for you? Go back, go to your sword master. And then she says, You know what, I'm not gonna bite my tongue right now. However, I won't let you have your way with me either. She then takes a sharp stick and jabs it right in the guy's eye. And then as she stands up, she notices a bunch of arrows that go into the enemy soldiers. And as she turns around, she notices the band of the hawk with Judo leading the way. That's about far enough. She's the only woman for us. She won't come cheap. Alright, so chapter 21 now, survival. Now this is just an absolutely gorgeous manga panel right here. We got a bunch of blood on guts, cuts everywhere, he's looking at all the soldiers, and Adon is like, impossible! With one arm, he's killed half of a hundred men! That's just a fluke! And then he's like, don't falter, he can barely stand now, fall upon him all at once! And then as Guts is fighting the multitude of soldiers, he begins to ponder to himself, what the hell am I doing, in this dumb place, risking my life so cheaply? Is it for her? No, probably not. Right now, no time to think. All there is now is how to cut. How to kill, that's all. Even these thoughts will slip my mind in time. And then, only the beat of my heart still remains. Now, Judo tells Casca that it was hard to convince the powers to be that they could go save their lives. However, Casca has no time to rest. She's like, hurry, we gotta save Guts. And with no time to waste, the band of the hawks starts to run through the woods as Casca leads the way. Be in time. Please be in time. And then we see Casca and the others return to the battlefield. Day is breaking and there's a bunch of dead bodies lying down. And amongst all the wreckage, Casca begins to panic, but then she sees Guts leaning up against a tree. And he's got blood coming from multiple parts of his body, he's got his eyes closed, so it's not really certain whether or not he's dead or alive at this point. Casca runs over, begins to shake him, and he's like, don't shake me. You'll just make the wounds worse. 
And with that, the band The Hawk, including Casca, have a smile on their face. We then see Guts on a stretcher as they're taking him back to the band of The Hawk. Now, Guts wants to walk right away, but Casca's like, hey, don't move. And even as the medical doctor is trying to treat him, Guts is fighting back. You know, he's like, hey, be careful there. Which I kind of find really funny because even though he fought 100 men, he's bleeding from multiple parts of his body, he's tired and weary, he's still got the energy to fight back against the doctor here. And even though the doctor wants him to get some rest, Guts wants to fight till the end of the campaign, even if he has to crawl. We then find out from Pippin that Griff is attending a war council at headquarters. In fact, he left this morning, and he won't be back until tomorrow. Now, Judo asks Casca if she needs to be treated, but she's like, No, I'm fine. Mine's is not an injury. We then see it's nighttime, as the band of the Hawk is having a good time around the fire. Casca then thinks about the words that Guts said in the woods. Go back. Go to your swordmaster. Go to Griffith. Now, Judo pulls Casca aside and says that the nobles that surrounded Griffith strongly opposed his decision to send out a search party for Guts and Casca. But Griffith said, Those two are vital to the band of the Hawk. I will not lose them. And just just hearing how pivotal Casca is to the band of the Hawk brings a tear to her eye. Now Judo tossed Casca some medicine and explains that he got it from an elf in a traveling entertainment troupe that he used to work for years ago. And even though it seems preposterous, elf dust does exist. Casca then takes the elf dust and sees Guts sitting up on a hill by a giant tree. And now we're on chapter 22, Campfire of Dreams. Casca then walks up to Guts and she's like, is this okay? You're not resting. I feel too hot to sleep. This was the coolest place, says Guts. And without warning, Casca begins applying the elf dust to Guts. Now Guts explains that the reason that he fought the hundred men is not really for her sake, but something that he did for himself. Running away really isn't his style. He also had a score to settle with Adon as well. He then states that fighting a hundred men doesn't really matter, because he's not really fighting for anything in his life, not like Griffith and Casca. In fact, what Griffith has bet his entire life on is actually kind of amazing. He then explains that his second in command, Gaston, isn't really into fighting, and that he plans on opening a clothing store in the downtown Winham area. He then explains explains that each one of the lights in the campfire is like a little dream, a little hope, a campfire of dreams as it were. And it's as if everyone has brought their individual flames here, and together they create the blazing inferno named Griffith. But you know, my flame ain't here, says Guts. As for me, maybe I'm just warming myself by that campfire for a bit. Maybe I just stopped in by chance. Guts then raises his sword to the sky and says, As long as I have this, I'm confident I can survive any battle. That's how it's been up till now. Even before I joined the Band of the Hawk, no matter how badly the battle was lost, I myself was sure to survive. Like this time. The mercenary who raised him only taught him how to wield the sword. I don't want to die, but just because I don't want to die, just because I didn't know more than how to use this, I kept fighting in battles. And maybe, more than anything, I've always tried to leave the most essential reason for fighting up to other people. Guts then stands up and wonders why he told Casca all that. After hearing the speech, Casca begins to realize something. Don't tell me you're leaving the Hawks. Guts then confirms that he's fighting to the end of the campaign, but doesn't give any assurances for the future. Griffith then returns to camp as everyone goes to greet him. Now Casca immediately apologizes for pushing herself, but Guts slaps her on the butt as she jumps into Griffith's arms. What? what was that for, jerk? Welcome back, says Griffith. Now Guts goes off with his men as Casca begins to wonder if he was actually serious about what he was talking about. We then transition to the Tudor army stronghold of Doldry Castle. Now the White Tiger Knights of Midland are not having a good time at Doldry Castle and they're wondering why this is. And it turns out it's because of Tudor's most powerful knights, the Holy Purple Rhino Knights. Alright, so now we're on chapter 23 of Berserk, the Battle for Doldry, chapter 1. Now it turns out that the Midland army has been battling with Tudor over a hundred years. Much like the Hundred Years War between England and France. It turns out that the Fortress of Doldry originally belonged to the Midland Army. However, in the Hundred Years War, it has since fallen to the Tudor hands. And ironically enough, it's become the most important base in their operations. Now luckily for the Midland Army, Tudor is undergoing an internal conflict for the succession to the throne. Which means that they won't be at full power during their next battle. Despite the golden opportunity, however, Doldry is impenetrable. And to take it down, they're going to have to take down the valiant General Bascon of the Holy Purple Rhino Knights. Now because Midland's mightiest army, the White Tiger Knights, didn't have any success in doing their mission, it seems like it's all in vain at this point. Now one of the generals looks over at Griffith and he's like, how about you Sir Griffith? And he responds,
responds by saying, if I were so ordered. And the other generals are astonished to hear this, and even the king looks a little bit surprised. If his majesty so ordered me, says Griffith. Now the general for the White Tiger Knights is like, this is nonsense! <laughs> you don't know anything! Now some of the generals think that the fact that Griffith never lost a battle has made him a bit delusional, but the king is like, was that sincere? And he simply nods his head. Now the other generals try to convince the king that it can't be done, but Griffith says, there is no need for a large force. I will require only the Band of the Hawk. Now the Band of the Hawk only constitutes 5,000 cavalry and they would be going up against an occupying force of 30,000, which makes the task seem insurmountable. Now, even though the others are dismissive of Griffith, Laban is like, hey, well, why don't we just give it a chance? And even if this clever plan doesn't work, it won't have a significant impact on the morale of the entire army. Now, the other generals want to hear the king's decision, and he's like, I command the Band of the Hawk to capture Doldry. Now, after the meeting, Owen goes up to Laban, and he's like, huh, you really bought into this whole Griffith and the Band of the Hawk? And he's like, well, if he can't do it, I doubt anyone in Midland can. Now Griffith gets their attention, and they're a little bit awestruck right here. And Laban even says, we might be fighting alongside the hero of the century. Meanwhile, we see Guts and the Hawk Raiders playing a game of Cho Bakuchi. It turns out that two dice are rolled, and if the total comes up to odd, it's Han, and if it's even, it's Cho. Now, Casca looks a little bit worried right now, but Guts tries to reassure her and says, We've done this millions of times. I'm sure the odds are in our favor. And she's like, I just hope he stays calm and composed. She then informs Guts that the man that spent the night with Griffith is now the commander of the Tudor Empire's northern battlefront. We then see Adon returning to Doldry Castle and he's immediately excoriated by Bascan of the Holy Purple Rhino Knights. Not only have you suffered the disgrace of leading an entire mercenary troop to their deaths for the sake of settling a grudge, but your younger brother Samson lost his life, and you dare to return alone in dishonor. He then takes a battle axe and literally puts it right in Adon's face, narrowly hitting him and putting the fear of God in him. He then revokes all command authority given to Adon for the remainder of the war. He then returns to Ganon, who states that he's severe as always. They then talk about the fact that the Band of the Hawk is coming to Doldry Castle. And it actually seems like Baskan is rather pleased by this because the Band of the Hawk has never been defeated. And this is going to be a great challenge for him. However, Genin gives him a warning to capture Griffith, the leader of the Band of the Hawk, alive. Am I clear? It's your governor's command. All right, so chapter 24, the Battle of Doldry, chapter two. Now this chapter originally came out on October 22nd of 1993, and it came out in Young Animal issue number 21, and it had this picture of Guts on the cover. And uh, this is a really badass looking cover here on Young Animal. I absolutely love this. Now Judo comes up to Guts and he's like, hey, how are your injuries? And Guts is like, yeah, they're just about closed up. It's actually bewildered the doctor. Now it turns out that the walls for Doldry are two times higher and thicker than most. And to top it off, it's guarded by the Holy Purple Rhino Knights. Now, General Bascon steps forward, and he's like, what the heck is Griffith doing here? The Band of the Hawk is placing their backs to the river. There's nowhere to run. He then begins to wonder why Genin has so much interest in Griffith. But he's like, yeah, that's not really my business right now. My only concern is to defeat the enemy. Genin then begins to remember Griffith, and he's like, oh, that one night. I can't forget it. The burns of that night still do not heal. I swear I will have you once more, lover. And goddamn if that's not creepy, guys. Now, Guts notices a gust storm, but Griffith comes up and says, It's all part of the plan. Guts then indicates that he's ready for battle, as he remembers Casca's words. He then stares up at the Band of the Hawk flag and says, This is the end. It's probably the last time I swing my sword beneath this banner. But I'll keep it together. I go into battle as the captain of the Hawk's raiders. Nothing else. And with this, Griffith yells, Vanguard, charge! And the battle is on, folks. Now, General Biscon notices that Griffith has divided his forces and he doesn't want to waste any time in destroying the enemy. We then see Guts enter the fray by slicing one of the Holy Purple Rhino Knights right across the abdomen. And goddamn is this next panel epic, guys. I mean, holy cow. I mean, just look at the horses. Look at Guts. Look at the swords. I mean, this is just absolutely gorgeous. What I would give to have this mounted on my wall. I mean, this is just so beautiful. We then see Guts confronting Baskan head on. Yet unfortunately, Baskan knocks off Guts' helmet. Guts was also able to cut off some of the spikes from Baskan's armor. And with this, we're on chapter 25, the Battle for Doldry, chapter 3. Now this is the first time in the history of the Purple Rhino Knights that they're actually being pushed back. However, Baskan tells his men not to falter and to charge forward and push him back. Now Ganon notices that the Hawks and the Rhinos are well matched. However, the 
Hawk's troops are still limited in numbers. He does worry that Bascon might kill Griffith in the throes of battle. And because of this fear, he decides that he wants to go to the battlefield himself. And by making this decision, the defense for the fortress is severely limited. Griffith then gives the orders to withdraw and head back to headquarters. We then see all the members of the Band of the Hawk turn around and go away from the castle. Now Gannon enters the battlefield and says, The enemy is in flight. Would you let your chance at victory slip away? Now Bascon starts to have misgivings about pursuing them. However, Gannon takes charge and says, Anyone that captures Griffith alive is going to be given a special double promotion and whatever monetary reward that they wish. He then takes direct command and says that the Holy Purple Rhino Knight will pursue the enemy. God Sen notices that the enemy has taken the bait and that they're playing in the Griffith's hand. Griffith then orders his men into formation and says it's do or die. The river's behind. We have no escape route. Lay down your lives. There's no other chance for survival. But if we do survive, we will stand victorious. And in the next panel here, we got a picture of Guts as he's getting ready for battle. And goddamn, does this look stunning, guys. And this next panel is fantastic as well as you got all the members of the Band of the Hawk as they're all charging forward into battle. And then off in the cliffs away from the battlefield we see a lone soldier and it turns out to be Casca and it turns out that she's heading up a covert operation. We then see that there's hardly any soldiers within the castle walls of Doldry as Casca and her group look ready to invade it. Rush in! commands Casca. First division, block the gates. Absolutely no enemy messengers get outside. All others proceed according to plan. We then see Adon, who is relieved of his command, watching Casca from a window high up in Doldry. And he doesn't look too happy about this. All right, so chapter 26, Battle for Doldry, chapter four. And to start off this chapter, we see Adon, and it says, Shock Adon. Now, if you notice something about Adon's armor here, the knees, shoulders, and helmet look like a shark. You can see the razor sharp teeth, the fin, the eyes, everything about it looks like a shark. And according to Puella from SkullKnight.com, the correct translation for this page is not Shockadon, it's Sharkadon, hence the reason that he's wearing the shark armor. So that seems to make a little more sense, but either way, it really doesn't make much of a difference. Casca then calls him a cockroach, and he's like, ah, I also go by Invincible Baron Adon. He then claims that he saw through their schemes and took it upon himself to defend the fortress. We then see the various troops of Doldry Castle surround the band of the Hawk. And Adon says, Listen, not one of them must be allowed to leave here alive. Get them! And with the rest of the band of the Hawk busy, Adon decides to focus his attention on Casca and get revenge for his younger brother, Samson. We then go back outside the castle and we see the battle between the band of the Hawk and the Purple Rhino Knights. And everyone's doing their part, Pippin, Judo, Corcus, and Griffith. Now Ganon is getting impatient. He's like, why haven't they captured Griffith yet? We then see Gut slashing through numerous soldiers. And the Purple Rhino Knights are like, what strength? Can anyone stop him? And that's when General Bascon steps forward. And he decides to take Guts on full force. Now Guts is able to knock off one of his spikes on his shoulder, so he's showing great resolve right here. And as they go back and forth, the other soldiers are like, this is amazing, we can't even see their weapons at this point. We then go back to Doldry Castle as we see Casca sees the advantage in her battle with Adon. She then admits that in her last battle that she wasn't in top form, but now she's back to normal again. And Adon's actually pretty blunt about it. He's like, what? Are you telling me you were on your period? Casca then commands the troops to cut through the enemy soldiers. We then see Pippin defend Rickert by taking down one of the enemy soldiers. Now Corcus says that it's only a matter of time before they're wiped out, but Rickert is like, we gotta keep fighting, there's no escape for us. We then see Griffith look over at Guts' battle as he's bloody, weary, and tired. And Guts is like, he's strong. I feel more dead than alive. Even worse than fighting those hundred mercs. If I don't put my life on the line, I'm a dead man. However, he does note that it's not as bad as the time that he fought Nosferatu Zod. And because of this, it gives him the confidence to charge forward. We then see Casca take down Adon as he begs for forgiveness. Yet he's only using this pathetic groveling to shoot Casca with a crossbow. He then claims it's a secret advanced archery technique passed down through the Corbowitz family. And it roughly translates into furious attack thunderclap burst. Yeah, Casca's like, I've got no time to listen to you laugh any longer. All right, so now we're on chapter 27, The Battle for Doldry, chapter five. And this is the first chapter of volume eight of Berserk. So we got this really nice cover page here of Guts and Griffith. Really beautiful cover. Now like the volume 7 note, we also have a note for volume 8 as well, along with an original illustration of Guts. Now officially this came out on September 29th of 1994. 
Now to start off this chapter, we see a part of a sword flinging through the air, and it happens to be Guts' sword. It was chipped in half. Now the Band of the Hawk is genuinely shocked by this, especially Griffith, as Guts is like, I'm screwed. And he's like, my sword was messed up from fighting those hundred men. I was careless. Damn it. What now? And then off on the mountainside, we see a man sitting on a horse, and it's none other than Nosferatu Zod. Now inside the castle walls, Adon is twirling his spear on his hand. And he gives Casca an alternative. He's like, hey, if you don't want to fight, you could just lay down to me now and I can use you for my personal toy. He then uses his spear to knock off Casca's helmet. Now as she's dodging the multitude of attacks, she's like, trouble. If I move around, the drug. She eventually gets backed into a corner. Now Adon is starting to feel himself here, but Casca drives her sword into the ground, uses it to elevate herself into the air, and with one swift motion, she's able to cut Adon down. And she's like, all right, the rest are little fish. Rout them. Now realizing that Guts is finished, Biscon decides to charge forward. Now the band of the hawk looks to intercept him. However, he becomes enraged and just forces his way through by cutting them all in half. Now Guts looks very worried right now as we see Zod flexing his arm as he chucks the sword down at him. Guts then notices the massive sword as Griffith is like, Guts, take up that sword! Guts immediately does so and uses it to defend himself. He then goes on the offensive and slices off Biscon's head along with his horse's head as well. Now even though the general is down, Ganon tries to remind his forces that the battle is not over yet. However, one of the soldiers is like, Ah, governor, look! And then we see that the Tudor army has lost control over Doldry, and it now belongs in the hands of the Band of the Hawk. Alright, so now we're on chapter 28, the battle for Doldry, chapter 6. Now, Casca looks very pleased that they were able to accomplish their mission. Now, the Tudor army is confused as to how this could have happened. And Guts is like, your leader's dead. It's plain as day, the fortress has fallen. It means you all lost. And then Griffith raises his sword into the air and he's like, cry out, cry for victory. And he instructs his troops to hunt down the remnants of the Tudor army. However, if they decide to flee, particularly if they put up resistance. And because of the impending doom, the Tudor army decides to flee from the area. Now Ganon is trying to rally the troops, but unfortunately for him, no one seems to be listening. He's then thrown from his horse as Griffith looks down on him. Now Ganon tries to resolve their differences and he's like, I've been searching for you ever since that day. And he's been waiting eagerly for this day to come. For the day in which Griffith returns to him. And he even points out that he told his men not to kill him in the throes of battle. And he's like, you don't resent me, do you? And Griffith's like, no, I don't resent you. I simply have no emotional interest in you at all. Resentment, endearment, nothing. I just took the liberty of using you when the opportunity appeared. You were like a stone lying by the side of the path I walk. That and nothing more. Now Ganon is enraged by this, but Griffith decides to thrust his sword right through his eye. And with this, he returns to the Bat of the Hawk. Now we see that Casca is still recovering from the poison that she was injected with by Adon earlier. Now Guts walks up to her with sword in hand, looking like a total chad, and he's like, yo, tough day. He then helps her up and shows her the sight of the battlefield, the sight of the victorious hawk, the sight of the heroic Griffith. And this is a really sad moment for Casca because although she's happy for Griffith achieving his dreams, it feels like he exists somewhere far away, that he will no longer be the Griffith that they once knew. And even Guts looks over at Griffith here and you can see a lot of deep contemplation on his part. And in a chivalrous moment, Guts lifts up Casca, and he's like, let's go. Go to meet your leader. And we see a very interesting moment here in which Casca's looking up at Guts, and she looks a little bit embarrassed. Almost a little bit smitten, if you will. Now Guts looks over at the sword, and he's like, couldn't be. And with this, we're transported to the mountaintop in which Zod sits. And goddamn, look at the detail on this image, guys. I mean, the arm, the face, the horse, just everything about it is just absolutely gorgeous here. And then Zod's got another prophecy. He's like, the eclipse will soon come. And the demon advent approaches as he rides off into the sunset. All right, so now we're on chapter 29 of Berserk, Triumphant Return. And we got another beautiful colored panel right here of Guts and Casca. Now this issue originally came out on January 28th of 1994. And it came out in Young Animal issue number three. And this was the intro cover for that magazine. So really cool stuff. Now to start off this chapter, we see six cloak figures that are talking about Griffith's rise to power. However, they're not speaking glowingly of Griffith. They're actually rather annoyed by him. And the fact that his popularity has risen among the people and even 
the king is becoming quite troublesome. And according to inside information, Griffith will be granted the position of general. Now we see that Minister Foss is a part of this meeting, and he proposes that they assassinate Griffith via poison. Now trivia question, what kind of poison does Foss want to use to poison Griffith with? Now the answer is anti arius Now according to Wikipedia, what makes it so toxic is due to a cardiac glycoside named anti arian It is used as a toxin for arrows, darts, and blow darts, particularly in island Southeast Asian cultures. Now in China, this plant is known as arrow poison wood, and the poison is said to be so deadly that it has been described as 7 up, 8 down, 9 death, meaning that a victim can take no more than 7 steps uphill, 8 steps downhill, or 9 steps on level ground before dying. And it's said to come from the most poisonous tree in the world, and it is said that no one can reach the trunk of the tree without dying themselves. So pretty ruthless stuff here on Foss's part. It makes you wonder how they collected the toxin in the first place but that's a story for another day. Now some of the others are worried that they might be implicated in the matter, but the Queen of Midland then steps forward. And she's going to make sure that Griffith's assassination goes off without a hitch, and that none of them are implicated. She then states, I am not about to allow the long and glorious history of Midland's rule to be trampled upon by this lowly commoner from who knows where. Now it's kind of interesting here, because based on Foss's internal dialogue, he's aware of the affair between the Queen and General Julius. An affair that's unbeknownst to the King of Midland. And because of this, Foss used this information to plant the idea in the Queen's mind that Griffith was the one behind Julius's death. Which actually turns out to be the case. Now the Queen of Midland talks about the fact that the King had to spend all his time ruling the kingdom and he didn't really have any time for his family. But she postulates that because the former Queen died and she was the only woman that he truly loved, that this was just an excuse. Now to console herself, she would give herself to Julius. Not based on love, but because the kingdom itself was too cold for her. She was a lone woman in an unknown foreign land. But now that Julius is gone, she realizes that it was in fact love, and that she needed him more than she realized. I will never forgive you, Griffith, not as the Queen of Midland, but as a woman, I will take my revenge. It is now time for the celebratory parade, as the Band of the Hawk returns to Winham in victorious fashion. And of course we got one of the greatest moments in the manga here, the moment in which Cork is dabs to the crowd. Now Judo, Rickert, and Pippin all seem to be enjoying themselves, but Casca feels a little bit awkward about the situation. We then see that Guts is just riding stoically through the crowd, and he's marveling at the fact that all of this is happening because of one man's dream. We then see Princess Charlotte attempting to get Griffith's attention, but he doesn't seem to notice. Now behind the scenes, the Queen of Midland and the other aristocrats are talking about a banquet that's going to be held for the Band of the Hawk. A banquet in which they want to enact their plan. Now Foss looks rather pleased with himself here, but one of his attendants brings him a letter. A letter that absolutely shocks him. Now he tries to play it off calmly here, but as he leaves, he's like, why? How? How did this happen? You bastard! You bastard! You bastard! And before we find out the answer to this conundrum, we see Griffith riding through the streets in a very stoic and heroic manner. A celebration is held for the heroes of Midland. Now this is chapter 30, Moments of Glory. Judo is a bit perturbed that this is where all their tax money goes. Rickard marvels at how far they've come, and it was all made possible through Griffith. The girls rush over to Lord Griffith, attempting to curry favor with him. Some of the women even surround the other members, but this just makes Guts uncomfortable and he decides to take off. Laban and Owen state that the band of the Hawk has answered the kingdom's prayers in defeating the Tudor army. With the war over, Griffith will have to navigate the aristocracy in this time of peace. The more radiant the light, the darker the shadow falls, says Laban. Guts rests on a chair as Casca grabs his arm and yanks him up. It turns out that Casca was being pestered by the aristocratic men, as Guts blushes whilst in her presence. Casca catches him staring, so she elbows him in the face. The two then go outside as Casca reveals that she's a little bit self-conscious. After all, she doesn't wear dresses all the time. Guts reassures her, however, saying she looks good. Guts urges her to dance with Griffith, yet she's afraid that she'll step on his foot. It turns out that Guts doesn't enjoy these types of events, but he wanted to see Griffith realize his dream with his own eyes. Casca wonders if Guts is still serious about leaving the hawk, as the king raises his chalice in a toast. Casca starts to head inside as Guts wants to tell her something, but he decides not to. Unbeknownst to the others, something else is going to happen here tonight, through Griffith's planning. 
The king states that an armistice has been reached with the Tudor army. With the long, arduous war behind them, it's time to focus on rebuilding the kingdom. At the military ceremony in two days, Griffith will be promoted to White Phoenix General, with the others receiving the title of White Phoenix Knights. The Band of the Hawk is shocked to hear this news, as Griffith looks over at the window and smiles at Guts. Alright, so now we're on chapter 31, Tombstone of Flame. The crowd chants White Phoenix General Griffith. The nobles are stunned by this revelation, as the queen states that Griffith's life will end soon enough. The nobles prepare for their plan to go into action, as they wonder why Foss looks so nervous right now. We then see a server drop some poison into a cup that Griffith will drink from. Griffith receives the chalice as the king proposes a toast to the kingdom. Griffith begins drinking as he soon drops the cup onto the ground. The cup shatters into a thousand pieces, with Griffith collapsing not too long afterwards. Grief stricken by what happened, Casca screams Griffith. Laban and Owen urge the guards to seal the exits. Casca cradles Griffith in her arms as we see that Guts has already gone missing. The man who poisoned Griffith enjoys the spoils from his deeds. As he makes his escape from the kingdom, Guts waits for the man in the night as he proceeds to chop off his head. The nobles behind this all congratulate themselves and Foss on a job well done. Foss, however, looks pale and is sweating profusely. Foss then takes his leave as the nobles are disgusted at the prospect of a commoner rising the ranks to nobility. The queen thanks them for their efforts as she begins to smell smoke. The nobles soon find out that the exit is blocked as it bursts into flames. The queen wonders what could have caused this as she looks out the window and sees Griffith staring up at her. Alright, so now we're on chapter 32, Tombstone of Flame Part 2. And we got a really nice image of the queen screaming Griffith as the hero of Midland stares up at her. It turns out that Griffith arranged his foe death. And to do this, he utilized a hyoscyamus based mixture to put him into a stasis close to death. Now, in case you're wondering, hyoscyamus is part of the nightshade family. And witches found this plant useful for their trance-inducing capabilities. In ancient times, it was used to treat insomnia and could be used as an anesthetic. One of the nobles asks Griffith to be spared, yet the hero of Midland isn't feeling charitable. This is war. There are no spectator seats on the battlefield. The queen is besides herself that a mere commoner is about to kill her. Those who die on the battlefield are not royalty, nobility, or commoners. They are the defeated who die. The fire weakens the support structures as the building collapses onto itself. And with this, the nobles and the queen are all dead. Griffith walks away victoriously as he approaches the shaking Foss. Griffith wonders if he's trembling because of his influence in the queen's death. Foss wonders how Griffith knew their plan. Turns out he didn't know their plan. However, he predicted that Foss would be his enemy from the beginning. He reminds him of the incidents in which their eyes met before he went off into battle. At that instant, your eyes betrayed your fear. And once someone fears something, they only have two choices. They must become subordinate to the fear or to strike it down. Griffith used Foss to eliminate his rivals. Foss considers Griffith a truly dreadful man. Griffith tears up the blood oath that Foss signed, so that there's no more tension between the two. I hope we can be amicable henceforth. Griffith then returns Foss's daughter, Elise, as promised. Griffith then reimburses the thieves for their efforts in capturing Elise. They happily go their way, but their path is blocked by Guts, who kills them on the spot. Guts looks to take back the money, but Griffith tells him to leave it, since they earned it. Guts then wonders if they should kill Foss too, to tie up any loose ends. Yet, Griffith doesn't think it's necessary at this time. Griffith wonders if it's cruel that he left all the dangerous work to Guts. Ain't this part of your path to your dream? You believe that, don't you? Says Guts. Griffith agrees as they make their way back. Guts then tells Griffith that Casca showed up to the party in a dress. And she was quite the sight to see. Alright, so now we're on chapter 33, One Snowy Night. Griffith returns to the band of the Hawk as Casca immediately jumps into his arms. Casca cries as Griffith consoles her. This dress looks good on you, says Griffith. Several days later, a royal funeral is held for the queen. Rumors swirl about the kingdom that Tudor hardliners had a role in all these assassinations. And it's even possible that a third country intervened to disrupt the armistice between Midland and the Tudor army. The facts of what happened that night vanished into the darkness. It is now one month later. We see Guts packing his belongings as he prepares to leave the band of the Hawk. He stares over at his broken sword and armor, smiling with fond thoughts in mind. Casca then notices that it's snowing outside as she sees Guts walking on the streets. She then rushes out of her room and right past Corcus and Judo to stop Guts. Are you leaving? Is that it? 
says Casca. Though the two started off on bad terms, they're comrades in arms, and the fruits of their labor is about to bear. Guts, however, has made up his mind. I can't remain buried in his dream like this, says Guts. Now, before he can make another step forward, Corcus and Judo intervene, with the latter proposing that they talk things over. Realizing that she's got to act quickly, Casca rushes off towards Griffith to notify him about Guts' intentions. Inside a tavern, Judo wonders why Guts made this decision all of a sudden. It turns out that Guts has enjoyed his three years with the Hawks. In fact, it's felt like a giant festival. It turns out that Corcus is enjoying the perks granted to them for being heroes of the kingdom. And these perks would have been unthinkable for a commoner. So it really pisses him off that Guts wants to throw it all away. All Guts can do is swing his sword, killing to survive. But wandering the battlefields, he realized that wouldn't do him any good. After he met Griffith, he realized that great ambitions could be achieved, even by someone who started off with nothing. Yet for him to take himself to the very limit, he had to cast aside the weak. Guts wants to stand beside Griffith by achieving something of his own. He's the only one I can't stand looking down upon me, says Guts. Alright, so now we're on chapter 34, The Morning Departure, Chapter 1. Corcus berates Guts for his unrealistic ambitions, stating that Griffith is special and different from the rest of them. Nevertheless, Guts wants something that he can win for himself. Corcus doesn't let up on his attack. All you need's a dream, huh? That's something weaklings who can't face the truth say. Guts wonders if Corcus didn't have a dream at one point himself. Corcus gets frustrated with the conversation and storms off. Judo reveals that Corcus used to lead a band of mercenary of about 10 people. They eventually crossed paths with Griffith and were put in their place. Judo is a jack of all trades, but he's never been the best at anything. He thusly attached himself to someone who was the best. Despite this, he's happy with his situation. Judo thought that Guts would have eventually found his own place with the band The Hawk. But that doesn't seem to be the case. The two leave the tavern as Judo asks Guts what's going on between him and Casca. Ever since they fell off of that cliff, they've gotten a lot closer to each other. Guts says that Casca is Griffith's girl, but Judo says that this cannot be. With the war coming to an end, Griffith will need a trump card to advance himself within the kingdom. And Princess Charlotte is that trump card. The two potential heirs to the throne, Julius and Adonis, are both dead, leaving a vacancy. In addition, the queen, along with the conservative ministers, were all burned alive. Judo then ponders the thought that maybe Guts could have had a hand in all this. But he eventually brushes it aside and changes the topic. Guts recalls a conversation with Griffith. One in which Griffith wanted to keep his dirty side concealed from the rest of the band of the Hawk. You're rough enough to share this with. To the end. Now the princess loves Griffith. As for Casca, it goes beyond any feelings. It's like she worships him. Yet she cannot have him, since she cannot offer a path to the kingdom like Princess Charlotte can. So what about Casca? Ever think you'd like to hold her? Says Judo. Guts finds her more interesting than any noble girl, but he views her more as a comrade. Casca still has her eye on Griffith, so Guts feels like he's no good for her. For now though, his hands are all full, just handling himself. The two walk to the top of a hill, finding Casca, Rickard, Pippin, and Corcus. Rickard wonders how Guts could leave them as the swordsman stares at Casca. And just then, Griffith appears behind Casca to confront Guts. Alright, so now we're on chapter 35, The Morning Departure, Chapter 2. Griffith asks Guts if he's leaving, which the swordsman confirms. I'm sorry, says Guts. Rickard can't accept this, but Judo says it's a man's decision. Quirkus then takes this opportunity to excoriate Guts by claiming that he's always hated him ever since the very beginning. That stone cold intense scowling mug gets under my skin like nothing else. You ain't special. You can never become Griffith says Corcus. Despite these harsh words, Guts still thanks him for everything. Guts hears the words of Judo in his head as he stares over at Casca. He thinks about saying something to her as his lips quiver. Unfortunately, he decides to say nothing and walks right past her. Griffith draws his sword in a downward position, indicating that he wants Guts to yield to him. I thought I told you then that you belong to me, says Griffith. Griffith won Guts with a sword, and if he wants to wrestle himself away, he must also do so with the sword. Guts realizes that he's got no choice in the matter as he pulls out his own sword, pointing it upward toward the sun. Casca attempts to stop the battle from taking place, yet Griffith is not playing around. Don't get in our way, says Guts. Pippin then drags Casca away from the battlefield. Casca urges the others to stop the battle, but Judo reminds her that what's taken by the sword must be recovered by the sword. 
Judo then makes an interesting observation that Casca has changed. The old Casca would have treated Griffith's words as gospel, but now she's questioning Griffith's reasoning. Guts then remembers Griffith's speech at Primrose Hall. This is the reason that he must go, so that he can become Griffith's equal. Judo notes that Guts has honed his sword skill to a razor's edge. You could say that it's a sword of carnage, which means that the two's strength is equally matched. Alright, so chapter 36, Morning Departure, Chapter 3. Guts remarks how calm he seems, despite the fact that he's going up against Griffith. When they first fought three years ago, it was like this day. The fact that things are ending with a duel means that Guts is still worth spilling blood over. Casca knows that Guts has gotten stronger over the three years, but she's certain that Griffith will stop him and everything will stay the same. She then makes a sudden realization. Is that what she really wants? Does she really want everything to stay the same and Guts to stay with the band of the Hawk? Something that would have been unthinkable three years ago. Griffith understands how firm Guts is in his resolve. Is this how badly you want to leave my grasp? I won't have it. I won't let you. Griffith is uncertain that he can parry Guts' attack, so he must seize victory with the first strike. Griffith plans to deflect Guts' sword and slice into the top of his shoulder. However, if his speed or timing is off, he might end up killing Guts. Even then, if I can't have him... Snow falls onto the ground, precipitating Griffith's lunge forward. Griffith attains the position that he wanted, but instead of deflecting Guts' sword, his sword snaps in half, with the blade flying up into the air. As the dust settles, Guts' sword is on his shoulder. Griffith drops his sword in defeat. He then holds his injured wrist, still trying to process what just happened. Guts then begins to walk away. Take care, says Guts. Casca runs to Griffith to check in on him, but also looks over at Guts. She's unsure what to do as she screams Guts' name. Guts, however, doesn't so much as flinch, never breaking his stride forward in the process. Corcus remains in disbelief as Casca stares down at the defeated Griffith. It's alright. It's like stumbling on a rock on the roadside. It's petty, a small thing. The place you want to go is more distant, farther off. So, it's alright. You'll stand up and you'll start walking. Soon. Alright, so we're officially on Volume 9 of Berserk, and we got this interesting cover with Salat in the background. And it's very green. Almost so much so that it almost looks like a Christmas cover. You know, you got the red cloak on Guts, and then the green in the background with the green Salat. I still like the color combination, but it is a little bit weird at the same time. I don't know how else to put it. And then before we actually start the chapter itself, we got the very iconic image of the Skull Knight skull with the bailet in the middle. There's thorns going around the forehead of the skull, and um, I think there's a lot of symbolism here, guys. I think it explains a lot of information in regards to the story. Of course, I made various theories about this in past videos, so if you want to check those out, you could do so on my channel. And this is chapter 37, Night of Skeleton. Now we start off this chapter with a mountainous landscape with the moon shining brightly. A lone owl is perched on a tree as we see Guts sitting by a campfire. A wolf then gives him a fright, as he thinks about how it's been years since he's been camping alone like this. And he's forgotten that the night is vast and deep. He then wonders if he's throwing away something irreplaceable that he'll never have again. Perhaps he's letting go of an irreplaceable today for some vague tomorrow. He got this idea after all by hearing Griffith's words. So he really can't say that he's setting out by his own will. You can never become Griffith, says Quirkus in a flashback. That's not today anymore. It's yesterday. A fog then pervades the area, as we see a large shadowy figure resembling Zod over Guts' body. Guts grabs onto his sword and prepares for battle. He wonders if this could be Zod. The shadowy figure stands behind Guts, with eyes that are blood red. Guts is shocked that he was blindsided so easily. The mysterious entity swings his sword, as Guts attempts to counter. Guts comes up empty-handed, as he sees a skeleton in the darkness. And not just any skeleton, a skeleton that's riding a horse that also appears to be on dead. Guts is still shocked that he missed his enemy's presence. So, the gears have indeed begun turning. You, struggler, take heed. One year hence shall be the time of the eclipse. You and your friends, those yet unseen of the fleshless flesh, and that unkingly half of you shall all be gathered then in that place. A torrent of madness, a tempest of death, for which the human body could never atone, shall sweep over you. But take heed, struggler. You were born from a corpse, and you began your life from death in the mud. 
You are closer to death than anyone. Thus, you excel in escaping it. Guts then wonders who this could be. How does he know so much information about his life? Struggle, contend, wriggle. That alone is the sword of one who confronts death. Never forget this. Who the hell are you? How do you know about me? Screams Guts. In the abyss of despair, only he who stands with broken sword in hand, perhaps. As the Skull Knight walks away, Guts wonders if he just saw an illusion. The Knight of Skeleton, says Guts. At the capital, Charlotte looks at the rain outside the window. She then dismisses the maids for the night. Having lost three relatives has been trying on the young princess. Griffith then arrives at Charlotte's window, soaking wet from the rain. He asks to be let in, but she's a bit hesitant at first. He reminds her that it would inflict harm upon her reputation if someone saw him like this. He enters the room as she immediately buries her face into his chest. Charlotte has been terrified for Griffith's safety ever since he left for battle half a year ago. When he collapsed at the celebratory ball, she passed out from anxiety. She wonders why Griffith didn't visit her sooner. Griffith then gets the green light and immediately seizes the opportunity by pressing his lips against the princesses. Alright, so chapter 38, start of the everlasting night. Charlotte quickly falls under Griffith's spell. Griffith starts fondling the princess by touching her breast and throwing her onto the bed. Are you afraid? Says Griffith. Take all the frightening and sad things and cast them into the fire. Whilst the two have sex, we see the band the Hawk at the local tavern. Casca can't find Griffith, so she goes to Guts' old room and picks up his broken sword so that she can hold on to it. She holds it close and reminisces about their time together. Griffith is next seen in the throes of passion, but he can only think about Guts' departure from the band of the Hawk. Charlotte reaches the climax as we transition to Casca staring out a window. One of the maids returns to Charlotte's room, peeks through the keyhole, and catches Griffith in the throes of action. She then proceeds to run off down the hallway in a most hurried fashion. After completing the deed, Griffith sits on the edge of the bed while Charlotte sleeps. Griffith is psychologically disturbed at the moment, as he clenches onto his own body for reassurance. Charlotte wakes up the following morning, discovering that Griffith has already left. She finds the charm that she gave him on the bed, as she holds it closely for comfort. She then notices that there's blood on the bed, which makes her a little bit embarrassed. Griffith vacates the premises, but is quickly met up by the Midland Royal Army. Griffith looks to draw his sword, but realizes that he broke in the battle against Guts. Griffith is henceforth detained with no means for escape. The king bursts into Charlotte's room without a single word of warning. Charlotte condemns his reckless behavior, but the king notices that there's hickeys on her body and rainwater on the ground. He yanks the sheets off her bed, discovering the droplets of blood. Charlotte, says the grieved king. Alright, so chapter 39, The Fallen Hawk. Griffith is seen inside a dark, dank chamber, where he's hanging from a chain that's attached to his wrist. The king wanted Griffith to shoulder a large part of the military, given his military genius and all. He believed the merit of knight should be bestowed based on merit and not on lineage. The king then whips Griffith, claiming that a thief is still a thief. He bemoans the rashness of his daughter, comparing her to a town's girl. Despite her frivolity, Charlotte is everything to him. In fact, she's his whole life. Though tens of thousands have died in war, there is always turmoil in the kingdom, always a new war that is brewing. If there is one thing that gives the king solace in this blood-soaked world, it's warmth. And Griffith has taken away that flower that gives him warmth. Griffith then surmises that the king wants Charlotte for himself. Rather, he wants her to have him. There have been many proposals over the years. Proposals from warring nations that would have been quite advantageous in terms of alliances. And yet, he has turned them all down. He's nothing more than a miserable man. He's done nothing more than not fail in his duties as king. How worthless, remarks Griffith. The king enters a frenzied rage as he repeatedly whips Griffith. He claims Griffith knows nothing about being king, as the guards are shocked by this gruesome display. Despite the intense pain, Griffith refuses to scream or make any noise whatsoever. The king summons a small man who specializes in torturing. He tells the man to do whatever he pleases with Griffith, but not to kill him. The king must protect his daughter's dignity. If anyone hears of what happened here, the entire households of those responsible will be sentenced to death without exception. The king attributes Griffith's blunder to youth, and it's a shame that he would destroy himself over such a trivial matter. The hawk has fallen to earth. It will never take flight again. The king orders for triple the number of palace guards as he checks in on his daughter. He thinks about how Griffith's lips touched hers, and how her body was touched by his tongue. He 
then opens up her blouse, revealing her breast. The pervy king then gets titillated as he grabs on and starts licking her areola. Charlotte screams no as we see Griffith in his cell. Worthless. This is worthless, says Griffith. Alright, so chapter 40, Demise of a Dream. Charlotte pushes her father off as he falls backwards. The king gets more persistent by holding her down and licking her face. She knees him in the nuts, yet he attempts to pry open her legs by force. She begs for Lord Griffith to save her as she proceeds to kick her father in the eye. The wretched king scurries away in defeat while Charlotte cries for Lord Griffith. Damn you, Griffith! yells the king. The band of the hawk is sensing in an open field with their horses. Apparently, Griffith called them here without their equipment for training. Rickard then notes that Griffith didn't return to the barracks last night, but Corcus seems unconcerned. Pippin then hears something off in the distance and tells everyone to take cover. Arrows rain down on them, killing many men in the process. They look around, seeing that they're surrounded on all sides, leaving them no escape. And it's not the Tudor army that's attacking them, rather it's the Midland army that's slaughtering them like a bunch of animals. Casca takes charge of the situation by telling everyone to form ranks so that they can break through and escape. Meanwhile, the torturer marvels at Griffith's resolve in not making a noise despite all the torture. The grotesque man yanks the bailet off of Griffith's neck, only to be freaked out when the eyes open up. He then drops the bailet on the ground as it bounces into the sewer system and floats away. Alright, so now we're on chapter 41, Arms Tournament. We then see an unknown kingdom as they're holding an arms tournament. There's jousting and fighting. And the sponsor of the tournament is taking great pride in watching all the men compete. Now for the main event, we have a featured bout. On one side is the mercenary Valencia, also known as the King of Massacre. He's a wild beast said to have claimed the lives of 130 Midland soldiers in the previous Hundred Years' War. And on the other side is a dark horse, a newcomer using strange weapons and techniques, who continues to cut a swath through the competition. The enigmatic warrior from a strange land, Salat. Valencia begins the competition by attacking Salat. However, despite his offensive barrage, Salat dodges all the attacks. He then uses his blades to cut Valencia's sword in half. And with no sword to defend himself, Valencia finds himself on the wrong side of a couple of pair of knives. Cutting your sword in two by simultaneously slashing from both sides is simple. Cutting your head off would be the same. And with this, Valencia submits. Now it turns out that Salad is rather disappointed by the dull and narrow-minded people of this land. In fact, it reminds him of children playing with sticks. Now as the sponsor of the tournament is getting excited about Salat, we then see Guts walking towards the ring. He looks large and in charge and pretty confident to fight right here. Now it actually turns out that it's not Guts' turn, but he tells the other guy to beat it. Now even though this is an abrupt change, the sponsor of the tournament allows this. And with this, Salat agrees to the duel. But Sideshow or not, you sought this yourself. I assume you're prepared, take your stance. Now Guts looks pretty lax right here. He's got his sword behind him and he's just telling Salat to come forward. Now Salat thinks it's ridiculous that Guts is wielding such a big sword. But Guts is like, hey, it's just a festival and all. Don't sweat the small details. Salat then says that a festival without blood is a rather boring one, as he charges forward and goes for Guts' face. Guts notices that he's quick, but he dodges all of his attacks. Salat then pulls out the dagger in his foot and looks to attack Guts. Guts blocks the first attack. He then blocks the subsequent attack. However, this leaves him open. Nevertheless, he uses his quick reflexes to whack Salat with the flat of his blade, sending him flying across the arena. You might want to stick to street performing, says Guts. Afterwards, the sponsor exalts Guts for his swordplay and even offers him a position within his castle. It turns out that there's some robbers in the area and he would be a robber hunter, but Guts only wants to fight strong opponents. The sponsor then mentions that the leader of the bandits is a woman who defeated 10 large men. Turns out the bandits were the former members of the Band of the Hawk, and they're being led by none other than Casca. Alright, so now we're on chapter 42, The Fugitives. Two men become quite pleased, having found the Band of the Hawk's hideout. Meanwhile, the Band of the Hawk looks weary, dejected, and at their wit's end. Judo brings Casca some food, and tells her everyone is worn out. Now Casca found out that Griffith is in the lowest level of Windham Castle, and he's been tortured there for over a year. Moans and screams have been coming from the castle, yet, as of late, they've gone silent. 
Despite her exhaustion, Judo tells her not to burden herself and to rest up. Before Casca can take a bite of her stew, her eyes well up as she drops the soup onto the ground and collapses onto the table. Judo returns to the others as they commend Casca for her efforts in keeping them alive. Quirkus, however, says that they're doing nothing more than running away and staying alive. Ever the cynic, Corcus shares his disbelief in the hawk returning to their former glory. Rickard then begins to wonder why Corcus has stuck around all this time, given the fact that he's so cynical about everything. He then wonders where Guts could be. Salad enters the area and kills one of the hawks with his razor-sharp chakram. Salad commands his men to attack as the onslaught begins. Casca then darts into action, directing traffic so that they can come out of this alive. Salat then realizes that she's the leader, and he won't be holding anything back even though she's a woman. The two engage with a flurry of attacks. Eventually, Salat's speed allows him to force Casca onto the ground, where she's completely defenseless. He gives her a choice, to throw her sword and surrender, or to die here and now. Before he kills her, he receives a boot to the back of the head, sending him flying. Don't let some street performer do you in. Pull yourself together, unit commander, says Guts. Guts gives her a reassuring smile, as Casca can only stare on with bated breath. Alright, so now we're on chapter 43, The Fighter. Now with Casca saying Guts' name, Slat realizes that he's the man who slayed a hundred men, the captain of the Hawks Raiders. Guts tells Casca to take care of things on her end as he deals with Salat. Salat pulls out his chakram, thinking he's got the advantage. Guts continues to belittle Salat, as the Kushan warrior says that he'll take off the swordsman's head. Judah warns Guts that the chakram changed direction on their own, as they head towards the swordsman. Nevertheless, Guts catches the chakram in mid-flight, leaving Salat speechless. Guts then mockingly throws the chakram like a couple of frisbees. Slat has had enough of the games. He then pulls out his ultimate weapon, the Arumi. The name means thunder, and it's the mightiest weapon in Salat's arsenal. He uses the Arumi to attack Guts from multiple angles, yet the swordsman displays his excellent reflexes in dodging. Each Arumi consists of five blades, so with two in hand, Salat is attacking with ten blades all at once. Guts gets out a few times as he gets an interested look in his eye. The blades are as sharp as a weasel's scratch. Guts proves elusive as one of the soldiers' face gets turned into shreds. Realizing that he can't run forever, Guts enters a low battle stance that bewilders Salat. I accept this challenge of yours. Suffer the dance of ten blades, says Salat, as he creates a veritable tornado. Guts swings his sword upward before the Arumi hit, resulting in air pressure that sends him off course. With the Arumi gone, Guts races forward to deal the fatal blow to Salat. However, the Kushan warrior barely dodges. Salat bounces back. Now because of the attack, the hood on his head was cut off, revealing his true face. Guts, was it? I'll remember your name, says Salat. Guts relaxes a bit. He then looks over at Casca as their eyes meet. Alright, so now we're on chapter 44, Comrades in Arms. Now, just as a brief aside, right around the same time that chapter came out, the volume 8 edition of Berserk came out as well. And inside that book, there was an author's illustration note along with a picture of Guts. And you're seeing that picture in this illustration note right here. Now, I tried to put this note into a translator to see what Kentaro Miro wrote, but for some reason it was too blurry. I couldn't read the image. So if anyone knows the translation for this, please let me know. But anyway, let's get started with the chapter. Yo, says Guts. The band of the hawk immediately surrounds him with looks of joy and relief. Guts gives a thumbs up to Judo and Pippin. Corcus, however, seems rather put off that Guts has returned. Gaston hugs Guts as tears roll down his face. Casca realizes that the enemy might attack again, so she tells the hawk to secure the perimeter. The others wonder why she's ignoring Guts, as the latter says they'll talk later. Guts is then shocked to learn that Griffith was captured one year ago. Turns out he was really depressed after their battle. This in turn led to the downfall of the hawk. The hawk has fallen to one-fifth of its former force, and it can barely be called an army at this point. The only thing that is holding everyone together is Casca, and if it weren't for her efforts one year ago, they all would have been wiped out. Rickert marvels at her resolve in getting them out of that situation without any weapons, facing a force that was ten times their size. She suffered five arrow wounds during the battle, yet despite this, she never lost consciousness in their escape. She now acts as their leader, given the fact that she saved many of the Hawks that day. 
Spies for the Hawk have determined Griffith's location, which means they'll soon enact their plan of rescuing Griffith. The group then stares up at Guts, subtly pressuring him into joining their cause. Everyone who has stayed with the Hawk is here on their own accord, yet they can't get started again without Griffith leading the charge. Riker questioned Guts on why he didn't come back sooner, since rumors about the Hawk's demise should have spread to him. It turns out that Guts was in the mountains, swinging his sword. He's not sure that he found his purpose, but one thing is for certain. Wielding this sword is the only thing that feels true. It's the only thing that gives him purpose. Corcus is still resentful towards Guts. He feels as though Guts left them during their toughest time. Hence, he can't call him a comrade. Guts then asks about Gaston's clothing shop. Turns out he ran out on it after he heard what happened to the Hawk. Judo informs Guts that Casca entered a comatose state one year ago after receiving those five arrow wounds. During this tumultuous period, she had nightmares and called out for Griffith. And to you, says Judo to Guts. Casca is then caught staring at Guts as she quickly turns away. Later on, the two meet alone by a tree as Casca tells them to come with her. Alright, so now we're on chapter 45, Confession. Defend yourself, says Casca. Guts questions her, but the female commander is done with words, as she goes on the offensive. Guts attempts to reason with her, yet Casca is in no mood to talk. Guts dodges her swift strikes. He then puts his foot out and makes her trip onto the ground. She blames Guts for Griffith's situation, and the Hawk's subsequent demise. Guts wonders how this can be. Because you left us! Because you abandoned Griffith! Screams Casca. Guts remains in disbelief, since this is Griffith they're talking about. And there's no way that Griffith would have done something like this. Casca clarifies that Griffith's dream couldn't be sustained without Guts' strength. Griffith's no good without you! Yells Casca, as her sword pierces Guts' flesh. Guts grabs onto the sword, as Casca is stunned that he didn't dodge. Guts only did what Griffith would have done. He did his own thing. Casca pulls the sword out, as she's emotionally at her wit's end. Casca admits that she wanted to be Griffith's sword, but in a way, this was a bluff. She knew that Griffith wasn't a god and that she was a woman. For Griffith to achieve his dream, however, he needed Princess Charlotte, someone with royal blood, to hasten his ascent. So, since she couldn't be his sword or his woman, just being an indispensable ally to his dream would be enough. But after Griffith lost to Guts, she understood there was no longer room next to Griffith. My dream had already ended, says Casca, and with the dream nearly shattered, she can't keep on protecting it, especially since Griffith might already be dead. I'm so tired, you do the rest, says Casca as she faints near a cliff. Guts nearly grabs her arm before she plummets to her death. And there was one more, one more thing I realized that day. Though he destroyed everything, though he took it all from me, even though I hate him, even now, though I feel like I want to kill him, thinks Casca. Guts yanks Casca up as he quickly berates her for her carelessness. Casca starts sobbing, saying that Guts is always getting hurt because of her. Guts then gives her a reassuring kiss. Casca tilts her head backwards as their lips meet and they embrace each other before a waterfall. Casca reminisces about the day Griffith lost to Guts. More so than Griffith's defeat, Casca was focused on Guts' departure. She couldn't tear her eyes away from him. A steady change had taken place, but she couldn't allow this to happen. For this would admit falseness in the way she lived for Griffith. And Griffith was the one who gave her her pride, her freedom, and her hope. Alright, so now we're on chapter 46, Wounds, chapter 1. Now this chapter has a full page spread of Guts laying down Casca by a tree whilst the two are naked. Casca appears to be a bit scared and embarrassed. She's worried that by giving herself to Guts, everything that she's been fighting for up until this point will fade away. Guts notices the multitude of scars on her body, which are a badge of honor for a mercenary. However, at the same time, Casca is still a woman. Guts reassures her, claiming that if she focuses too much on death or broken, she'll find death perched upon her shoulder. He tells her not to think about these things, and to only concentrate on feeling alive. Casca will thusly believe that her feelings for him are not lies. The two engage in a passionate display of lovemaking. In the throes of passion, Casca starts to cry out, which conjures up a repressed memory within Guts, the memory of him getting raped by Donovan. Gambino sold your ass out, says Donovan. You should have died, remarks Gambino. Guts suddenly pulls back. Seeing Casca like this reminds him of his younger self. He then stretches his arm out and clenches onto Casca's neck. Yet for Guts, he only sees himself choking a younger version of himself. 
All right, so now we're on chapter 47, Wounds Chapter 2. Now before moving forward, I made an analysis about this manga panel in a previous video. If you're curious about my thoughts on the matter, you can watch it here. Now the chapter begins with Donovan pinning down a younger Guts, as we see a dead Gambino underneath the tree that Guts was born from. Gambino's words ring through Guts' head over and over again, as he finds himself choking Casca in real time. Casca struggles for breath as Guts releases his grip. He then slams the tree. I didn't want that to happen. I didn't mean... I didn't mean to kill you, Gambino! Gutson shares the repulsive tale about how he was raped by Donovan. He later killed the vile man and made it look like a death from the battlefield. Gut says that Gambino took him in and taught him the way of the sword. Yet he wonders why Gambino sold him to that pig bastard Donovan. Gambino got drunk one night, and Guts had no other choice to defend himself. So now, Gambino is dead. Guts lands on his hands and knees, calling out for Gambino, the only father that he ever knew. Guts apologizes for ruining Casca's first time, so he throws her some clothing to cover herself. He will now go now if she commands it. He then formally admits to killing his father, as he wonders why those memories came back to him at a time like this. Tears stream down his face as Casca embraces him with a hug from behind. Casca is fine with licking each other's wounds. She has bared herself to Guts, and now Guts has done the same for her. And this makes them even. I want a wound that I can say that you gave me, says Casca. The two start kissing each other as they fall down together. Casca thinks her place can be within Guts's heart. Perhaps she can even give him something as well. After the two have sex, Guts thinks about the time that Gambino gave him the ointment from his sword wound. Besides the boy, an oversized sword shine dimly. All right, so now we're officially on volume 10, and this is by far my favorite manga cover of all of Berserk. I know there's been 41 volume covers, and there's a lot of great ones out there, but this one for some reason just always captures my attention. I just love the roughness to it. I love the Skull Knights in the background. You got the picture of Guts here with his sword and his cloak. It's dark and murky. I love the color pattern as well. It's just a very nice look to it. It just looks very iconic, rustic, and memorable. So it's a really nice color panel. All right, so this chapter starts off with Casca and Guts lying naked next to each other as the sun is rising. And just to clarify things, Casca says, that was your first time, right? And given Guts' facial expression, it turns out it was. Now, Guts was a little bit frantic at first, you know, given it was his first time and all. And, you know, it was a little bit difficult for him because, as we know, he doesn't like being touched by anyone. Guts then tells Casca that he doesn't like being touched by anyone, but she's the exception to this. Realizing how sweet this is, she decides to give him a kiss on the cheek. And this is a really cute panel, guys. I really like this one. Now, because Guts returned to the Band of the Hawk, she's like, Hey, Guts, will you stay? After we rescued Griffith here, with the Band of the Hawk. Unfortunately, Guts wants to draw the line. He wants to keep things separate at this time. Guts then looks over at the waterfall and is reminded of his time training during the previous year. We then have a flashback to a little girl who takes a knife and cuts a bunch of logs loose on a waterfall. Now, as the logs are barreling down the waterfall, we see Guts on the bottom with his sword. And it turns out that he was using this as training. He was cutting the logs with his sword. Now, because of this intense training regimen, Guts is lying on the ground and his sword is all broken. We then see Guts at a log cabin with the girl and an old man that's working on his sword. And we find out that the old blacksmith is named Godo. Now, Godo tells Guts that elves used to live here long ago, here in the mountains. Godo, why are you a blacksmith, says Guts. And it turns out that Godo's family has been blacksmiths ever since he can remember, going way back to his great-grandfather. And even Erica is like, before I knew how to walk, this was in my hand. Godo has been striking the iron since he was born, and he's been doing it so long that he's not even sure why he's hammering at this point. He just keeps doing it. Sparks, says Godo. Sparks are nice. I get engulfed in them. It feels like... Like my own life, for an instant, is springing into air before my eyes. Later on, we see Guts sitting on a rock, and he's like, In the end, this is all there is for me. Dreams. Is this what a dream is to me? It's not a clear, concrete destination like what Griffith said. It's not some lofty, glittering thing. Yeah, this is nearer to me, like it's part of my body. With this, I've kept myself alive through more moments than I can count. Because this is there, I once again throw myself into the jaws of death. Almost the entire time I've been alive, this was next to me as a part of my body. 
When I lost to Gambino, when I met Griffith and the Band of the Hawk, and when I parted with them. Zod the Immortal, suffering I should have never been able to bear. In moments I could sense death, I came through it all with this. Unforgettable things, unforgettable people, and all of it by the tip of the sword. I get the feeling I've done it all by grasping a hilt in my hand. No, actually, compared to what my hands touched, my swords touched a thousand times more. It's like, this has been my life, in and of itself. Guts then thinks about Godo's quote. Sparks, maybe I'm drawn in by them too. The little sparks that spring out when the swords clash. All the thoughts of your life and your enemies, striking and scattering the tiny lights of existence itself. You see, life's air. Maybe it's different from the dream Griffith talks about, but for no one else's sake, without being swept up, this time it's all by my own will. Making my own sparks, even for that instant. Guts tells Casca that even though it might not be a worthwhile reason, he found his own thing. For the time being, he wants to rescue Griffith and rebuild the Band of the Hawk. But that's it. He's got to continue his own journey afterwards. He's got to find stronger enemies. And with this, he's made up his mind. He's never going to entrust his sword to another man again. And he's never going to hang on to someone else's dream. From now on, every battle will be my own. And with this, Casca blurts out in laughter. And she even remarks that he's speaking with the kind of conviction that Griffith speaks with. She then tosses some leaves in his face and says that he's just the same as Griffith. It's all about dreams, all about yourself. It's the same whether I'm around or not. You're just gonna leave again, right? You knew that from the start, right? Now, to stop her from yelling at him, Guts decides to grab her breast, which immediately embarrasses her. He then invites her to come with him. And even though he doesn't know what's in front of him, he wants Casca by his side. Because he wants more of her in his life. In fact, he wants her a thousand times more. Casca, now being satisfied with Guts' response and feeling like she's wanted, decides to give him a kiss in the meadow. We're then transported to a random forest three days prior. And it's on the Midland border, and an extraordinary event event is taking place. It turns out that Forrester's caught sight of something. It emerged from a valley deep in the wood, a silhouette against the setting sun of some giant serpent-headed monster. And in case you guys are wondering, yes, this is the Snake Baron from the Black Swordsman arc. So he does make a brief cameo in the Golden Age arc. Pretty cool. And there's also someone else from the Black Swordsman arc that's going to show up as well fairly soon, so keep your eyes out for that. Now, something beyond human knowledge has begun to stir, as we see the Bailet washing up on the shore. Now, when Berserk Chapter 49 came out, it came out on December 24th of 1994. And when that issue came out, it had this telephone card of guts with drawings on his face and a Bailet in his hand. It also has what looks to be a mirror with a picture of Griffith on it, so a really humorous photo. I really like this one. Also, around the same time period, we got this colorized picture of Griffith. Now, obviously, this took place during the battle between Griffith and Guts, prior to Guts leaving the Band of the Hawk, so really nice image here. Alright, so now we're on chapter 49, Infiltration of Windham, part 1. And to start this chapter, we see that image of Guts and Salat that we saw earlier. And in the beginning parts of this chapter, Griffith reminisces about his days as a mere child. And he thinks about the time in which he stole toys from other kids, and the only thing that really captured his eye was that sparkling kingdom in the distance. It was the brightest thing he had ever seen. And it was at that time that he made up his mind that he wouldn't collect junk anymore. He wanted that thing, that kingdom. He then notices that he's in darkness. Darkness without a trace of light. All his senses are numb, he can't feel a thing. And he's wondering if he's retained his sanity, or did he go insane long ago? In all this emptiness, only one thing is vivid. Only guts. He's like lightning in a dark night. He rises up within Griffith, blazing. That alone is the bond which keeps his consciousness from vanishing amidst the darkness, amidst the numbness. Griffith realizes that he's special. He realizes that goodwill forms into trust, and that animosity forms into awe or possibly dread. And thereby, knowing all this, he has grabbed the hearts of so many in his bare hands. Yet there's only one man in which he loses his composure. And yet, that man, Guts, is the reason that he's in the darkness. And he remains to be his only sustenance that's keeping him alive. He then wonders how long ago someone that was supposed to be in his hand has now gained such a strong hold on him. And it almost seems like the glowing kingdom in the distance is merging with Guts. He views Guts in that same way. He's just as important, just as vital to sustaining Griffith. 
to sustaining the dream. Griffith then screams guts as he awakens in his cell. We then notice that one of the bricks in the cell is pushing forward as a bunch of weird, strange, dark monsters are coming out. Griffith wonders if they're hallucinations and the monsters even call him Prince. Prince of Us, the Unforgiven. And it turns out that they're seeking an audience with him. In time, at that place, we shall meet. We are kinsmen, O blessed king of longing. Now, this is a very fascinating image right here. Obviously, on the bottom, we see Void. Right, we see Slan. On the top is Ubik. And then on the left is Conrad. And we know from the Black Swordsman arc that these are the God Hand members. Now, what's really interesting about this image is its inspiration. Now, if you remember from my Black Swordsman arc video, this image here of the five God Hand members is very similar to the relativity image by MC Escher. Now this image right here in chapter 49 is another image by M.C. Escher. This one's called Another World, also known as Otherworld, and it's a woodcut print by the Dutch artist himself. Now in the original image, there's five visible sides, and on each side, there's an open archway. Now that's pretty significant because in Berserk, there's five members of the God Hand. Now, standing in each archway along the vertical axis is a metal sculpture of a bird with a humanoid face. Now, who in Berserk, after becoming a God Hand member, looks like a bird with a helmet on his head, but also has a human face? That would be Femto, also known as Griffith. So Mira definitely took a lot of inspiration from MC Escher, from more than one source as we can tell. We then go back to the Band of the Hawk. Now it turns out that Rickert's a little let down cause he wanted to go save Griffith with the others but because of his broken arm, he can't do so. Casca then says that they're gonna separate into two groups and the group that's gonna rescue Griffith is gonna depart immediately. She then mounts her horse as Guts is like, let's go boss, which kind of embarrasses her. She then gives the orders as they get ready to depart to Windham. After three days of travel, we see that their party has finally reached the capital. They then make their way through a graveyard looking for a secret passage. After finding the right spot, Pippin knocks over the grave and they see the hole in the ground. Now Guts is like, well, isn't it a bad idea for all of us to go in there? Especially you, Casca, given that you're the leader and all? But Casca isn't going to take any of his sass. She gets up right in his face and she's like, you're worried, aren't you? She then tells him to leave his personal feelings out of it and obey her superior's orders. I can at least watch your back. Don't forget it, says Casca. And upon hearing this, Pippin and Judo start to laugh. They then enter the secret passage and the rescue is on. All right, so now we're on chapter 50, Infiltrating Windham, part two. Now, as the group is running through the sewers, Guts thinks about Griffith and how he was flying above everyone else as the hawk. He thinks about the fact that he's composed, ruthless, shrewd, always winning and always taking. But at the same time, Guts is also thinking about what Casca said, the part about how Griffith's no good without him. They then reach the passage as Judo says that they got someone on the inside. As they go through, they realize they're in a mausoleum inside the castle. They're then approached by two mysterious figures, and it turns out that it's the two that helped them out up until this point. And surprisingly, it's none other than Princess Charlotte that helped them out. Casca immediately forces Guts to bow, as she thanks Charlotte for all her efforts here tonight. Now they don't have time for fancy introductions, they gotta get moving so that they can rescue Griffith. It is then that they make their way through the castles. Now as they wander through the dark and empty Windham Castle, Casca notes that Charlotte is not some high-handed bearing royalty or nobility. She seems cheerful and kind. She then begins to wonder if Griffith sees her as necessary at this point. And even though her feelings of admiration for Griffith haven't changed, she realizes that she's a little bit jealous of the princess. Charlotte then takes this moment to apologize for all the rudeness that her father has done. Judo then wants clarification on what happened one year ago. What happened the day before they were entrapped? The night before Griffith was imprisoned? Charlotte gives a brief glance over to Anna and she's like, That night, Lord Griffith was in my chambers. And we're immediately drawn to Casca's face. Her eyes widen and there's sweat trickling down her face. Now before they can think about this any further, we see two castle guards. Guts and Judo want to take care of them, but the princess decides to confront them herself. She tells them that she's out for a walk, and she begs the guards not to tell her father about this. Anna decides to bribe the guards so that they keep this secret, and the guards leave. Due to the nervousness from the situation, Charlotte collapses. She then considers that she must have done this for Griffith's sake. Guts then decides to put his arm around Casca and mocks her a little bit. Should I hold your hand? She pushes him away at first, but grabs onto his cape as they begin to walk. They then reach an old looking tower, the Tower of Rebirth. 
Now among the many towers in Windham, it's the most ancient. It's been here since the time Midland was established, possibly even before that. Now in times of war, prisoners were sent here, and during the Inquisition, heretics were imprisoned underground beneath the tower. Charlotte then says that she believes Griffith is being kept in the lowest level of the tower. Judo then decides to pull Casca aside and is like, hey, you know, if we take the princess hostage right here, it would make a good bargaining chip. Now, Casca is against this idea, especially given the fact that she was the one that let them into the castle in the first place. But despite this, Charlotte steps forward and she's like, I don't mind. In fact, she's asking to be a hostage. All right, so now we're on chapter 51, Festival's Eve, chapter one. Would you be willing to take me along with you, says Charlotte. Now Anna is the first one to speak up. She doesn't want her to do this. But because of what happened earlier with her dad, she doesn't acknowledge him as her father anymore, which utterly shocks Anna. She then begs Casca again. Although she doesn't possess any talent with a sword or a horse, she just wants to be with Lord Griffith. And for that, she'll endure being a hostage, or anything for that matter. Casca is against this. It turns out that having her as a hostage is a double-edged sword. Because if they had her as a hostage, there would be an enormous manhunt to recapture her. And it would be an issue of national scale. And the king would use any means necessary to get her back. And even if somehow they were able to go over the border, the proclamation will reach other nations, and the pursuit will never slacken. Furthermore, if they take a female hostage, it would bear a disgrace on Griffith's name that could never be erased. And if that were to happen, his path for success would close off. He may never be able to go out into the real world again. Now, Guts is like, why are we talking about this so much? Griffith is so close, too. Lady Charlotte then decides to employ her secret strategy, yelling at the top of her lungs, NEVER! If I say I'm gonna go, I say it. Then I'm going with Lord Griffith. They all cover her mouth and realize that she's gonna scream again if she can't go. I understand. Let's go together, says Casca. Now if Lord Griffith says it's futile, then she has to give up. To which she agrees. After the commotion, Casca seems a little bit downcast. Guts is wondering what's wrong, and Casca says that she feels a little bit jealous about Charlotte in the way that she's talking about Griffith. Guts reminds her not to mix personal feelings into this matter. To which she apologizes. Guts then pulls back from Casca and says that they gotta hurry. Guts then thinks that if anyone needs to become independent of Griffith, it's him. The group then reaches the entrance of the Tower of Rebirth, as Judo throws a couple of knives at the castle guards. They steal the keys and enter the tower, as we're transported back to the Band of the Hawk. Now it looks like everyone in the camp is pretty weary, defeated, and injured. One of the members tells Rickard to get some more water, which he does. But upon going to the lake, he notices something off in the distance. Something that looks like a fairy. It then flies overhead and he's like, an elf? The elf flies through the forest at rapid speeds, far faster than any living animal. He then runs back to the campsite thinking it's an enemy raid. But unfortunately for Rickards, when he gets back to the camp, he finds absolutely nothing. The campsite is enveloped in darkness and the only points of light that are being emitted are from the remaining campfires. All right, so now we're on chapter 52, Festival's Eve, chapter two. And we got a really nice image of the Skull Knight to start things off. Rickard wanders through the camp, wondering what happened to everyone. Did they all realize there was a raid and ran away? Even so, I don't see any enemies. Something, something's weird, says Rickard. He then notices one of the members of the Band of the Hawk hanging upside down. Kim? Kim appears to be in pain, as we see an apostle come from behind the darkness. And I'm sure you guys can recognize this apostle already. This is the Count from the Black Swordsman arc. Rickert begins to freak out, as we see a close-up of the Count eating Kim from the torso. And then we get this really nice full-page spread here of the Count eating Kim. And this is just absolutely gorgeous and brutal all at the same time. It's just magnificent, dark, and murky, and it's so scary. And the Count is laughing as he swallows Kim whole, and it's just absolutely brutal, guys. And Rickard's like, these things can't exist. And then he steps on some blood, and, he, and off in the distance, he sees yet more monsters. Each one a different variety, shape, and size. And these two right here, the stag beetle and the grasshopper, are gonna show up at a later point, so keep your eyes out for those two. And then directly behind Rickard, we see Rosine. Of course, we don't know that at this point in time, but if you've read ahead, you know that this is Rosine of the Misty Valley. She then instructs the monsters to go after Rickard. And given the situation, Rickert is absolutely paralyzed. He can't move his body whatsoever. Tears are streaming down his face, and then all of a sudden, the Skull Knight comes from behind him with his horse. In one of the most magnificent panels in all of Berserk. 
And upon seeing the Skull Knight, the Count, Rosine, and the others are just absolutely flabbergasted. They don't know what to say. Skull Knight then pulls out his sword, and he's like, withdraw. He brandishes his sword in the Count's direction, and he says, You shouldn't have time to amuse yourself with slaughter at a place like this. Haste is needed, is it not? The Apostles say nothing to this, and just go on their way. Now I often wondered why the Skull Knight didn't take down the Apostles right here. I mean, certainly we know he has enough strength to do so, but maybe he's trying to use them so that he can find the way to the Eclipse. Now after all the monsters leave, Skull Knight stares down at Rickert and doesn't say anything. Rickert then begins to break down, tears coming from his face, not from his nose, and he's like, What the? What the hell? What's going on? And before he knows it, the Skull Knight is gone as well. And all that's left is a body of corpses. He then says, No way. They were in such good cheer. Till just now. They were so happy. Griffith was coming back. How did this... This... This can't be happening. And then off in the distance, we see the Skull Knight jumping from a branch off in the moonlight. And we're left to wonder... What the fuck is going on? Alright, so now we're on chapter 53, Thousand Year Fiefdom. And I gotta say, out of all the chapters of Berserk, this is probably the most pivotal. Just because of one aspect that's mentioned in this chapter. Now we see that the prison beneath the Tower of Rebirth is built into an enormous and possibly deep cylindrical hole. And it goes a lot deeper than it does above ground. Now Princess Charlotte puts her face by one of the windows and a monster goes by it and starts to scream. Now despite the dangers, she still wants to see Lord Griffith. Realizing that she's not going to make it far on her own, Guts decides to give her a lift. Now upon seeing this, Casca gets a little bit jealous, but she doesn't try to make it too obvious. Now Guts is wondering how far the hole goes. Now Charlotte says that she heard that the underground prison was built after the time of the Inquisition. And it goes down no further than about the depth of the tower. But the hole itself existed long before the prison was built. Its depth is greater than any mountain in all of Midland. She then tells Guts about the origin of the kingdom's name, Midland. In those days, this continent saw constant warring between small city-states and many different tribes. Apparently, it was an age of rival warlords. Continuous warfare ruined the land, and due to the food shortages, plague and the like. It said that fully a third of the population died. But finally someone appeared who put an end to the Warring Age, Supreme King Geyseric. He was an emperor who was able to subjugate dozens of nations and establish an age-old empire encompassing this entire continent for the first and only time in history. No one knows what country he came from or when or how he raised an army. No records whatsoever remain regarding his account prior to his arrival on this stage in history. And Guts notes that he sounds kind of like Griffith. From the merciless and ruthless way of fighting the Emperor would use against those enemies, it seems he was given such names as Demon King and King of Galloping Death. But there was one other reason for this. Whenever Emperor Geyseric went into battle, he would don a dreadful helmet shaped after a skull. Now of course as many of you are aware, I made a theory video about this very thing. And of course if you want to see that, I'll leave a link in the description. Now upon hearing this, Guts immediately thinks of the Skull Knight. But he's like, couldn't be. Now Judo's like, oh, that's the Skull King, right? Now according to legend, I think he gathered workers from all over the empire and forced them through hard labor to build a large city capital. Then the king lived in the utmost extravagance while levying heavier and heavier taxes on the people. The city ended up becoming a melting pot of feasting and pleasure, at least I think. But God finally decided he couldn't condone the Skull King's deeds and sent five angels. By lightning and great earthquakes, the city was erased from the face of the earth without a trace in the span of a night. Now Casca clarifies something. She's like, wait a minute, weren't there only four of them? Now Guts is like, well, what does this have to do with the hole? Apparently the name of the city meant land in the middle of nations. So it received the name Midland. And that city that fell into the ground by way of natural calamity is said to be sleeping still, just as it was then, in a place untouched by either sunlight or wind at the bottom of this hole. But it seems that after the Emperor's death and the collapse of the Imperial capital, the continent gradually became the territory covered by assorted countries that we know today. The Emperor had no children, so it isn't a direct line. But it is said that even without those countries, the Midland royal family is the only one that carries Geyseric's blood. And it turns out that the Tower of Rebirth was built in order to seal that unclean past. 
Now, Judo mentioned something about Casca, which causes Charlotte to freak out. Because of this, she clenches onto Guts' neck. Casca looks over at him and runs into a wall. She then drops her torch, which goes all the way to the bottom of the hole. We then follow the torch and see a very cryptic statue. And amongst the statues is many dead bodies and crumbled structures. And on the dead bodies, we see a mark. We see the brand of sacrifice on their foreheads. And we're left to wonder, what the heck does this all mean? Guts then notices something lurking in the shadows, but he's like, must have been my imagination. We then see that the torturer is following the group. We then see that the torturer is following the group in secret. Now, as they reach the bottom of the staircase, Casca is like, Griffith has been at the bottom of the darkness for a whole year. Guts lets Charlotte down as she begins banging on the door. Casca uses the key to open it up as they begin to look inside. Now, they can't find anything at first, but then they see something on the ground, a naked man that seems to be desecrated. And they're like, Griffith? All right, so now we're on chapter 54, Reunion in the Abyss. And this is in fact Griffith's body. We notice a helmet on his head that's locked up. We see the muscles on his back. We see the bones on his spine. And everything is just cut up and mutilated at this point. And Guts has just a look of shock on his face. He doesn't know what to make of this. Guts runs over and cradles Griffith in his arms. We then notice that several patches of skin on his chest are also missing as well, so we can see his rib cage, which is just absolutely brutal. And Guts quickly notices that his tongue is missing as well. Now Guts calls for the key because he wants to take off the helmet, but upon peeling off that helmet, he's absolutely horrified. Now Casca wants to see as well, but Guts is like, Stay back! Get the hell away! This can't be... It can't be Griffith, says Guts, as we notice that his hands are shaking. Now upon saying this, Griffith's eyes begin to open up and he sees Guts in his field of vision. He's trying to say something, but of course he's got no tongue, and then he reaches out for Guts. And the first thing that he does is he puts his hand around Guts' neck, and it looks like he wants to choke him. Now Guts doesn't notice this, but Judo does. And he's actually rather stunned by it. Now Guts is just so overcome with emotion at this point that he immediately hugs Griffith. As we see that Griffith places his crippled hand on the Guts' hand. Tears stream down Guts' face as they fall onto Griffith's helmet. Now Charlotte is wondering what happened to Lord Griffith, but Pippin puts his hand on her, trying to give her some reassurance. We then see that Casca is having an internal crisis, as her heart is pounding and she's sweating and shaking all over. Unfortunately for them, the door slams shut right behind them, and we notice that the torturer has locked the door. He then reveals that he called the soldiers too, so they're going to be coming rather quickly. The demented torturer is rather happy by all this, because now he's going to have new toys to play with for the future. Guts then stands up and says, You the one? The one who did all this to Griffith? And he actually admits to it with glee. He says he's never had a prisoner as beautiful as Griffith. And he put a lot of effort into torturing him. It turns out that he cut the tendons on his arms and legs. He took off his skin and nails. He used hot irons and boiling water. In fact, the two were inseparable for the last year. You could almost say that they were husband and wife. And it turns out that the sadistic torturer takes pleasure in looking at all his muscles. Especially the muscles in the face. And the best part in his collection is his lucky charm, Griffith's tongue, which he wears around his neck. Having heard enough of this, Guts drives his sword straight through the door and right into the torturer's body. Everyone watches on as Guts dangles the torture precariously over the edge of the staircase and above the seemingly endless abyss. Guts takes out his dagger, which he uses to cut off the jailer's tongue. Forget it, your breath reeks too much. You're going to hell. He then lowers his sword as the torturer falls down. I can't hear you. Speak clearly. And with that, the torturer falls down the hole to his death. An arrow then lands at Guts' feet, drawing his and everyone else's attention. We then see that the staircase is blockaded by the Midland soldiers, who are all holding crossbows in their hands. They tell the Guts' party that that's far enough, but Guts gets a look in his face that he's going to go absolutely berserk right now. Now, just after Chapter 55 was released, the Volume 9 version of Berserk was released as well. And in that volume, we got this picture of Charlotte, along with an inscription written by Kentaro Mira. And again, if anyone can translate this, I would love to know what he said right here. Now Guts tells the group to stay close behind him, as he goes on a furious, hell-bent mission to clear a path to the top of the prison. On the narrow staircase, Guts sprints his way up, cutting any man that gets in his way. The men's bodies start falling downwards, as the leader is like, How, how dare you? You resist! 
The archer starts shooting guts, but he uses one of the dead bodies as a shield. He then uses the body that's attached to his sword to whack the other men. And goddamn, is this just brutal and awesome all at the same time. And let's be honest guys, not only is Guts going berserk here, he's absolutely losing himself. He's becoming like a wild animal. This panel especially is just absolutely epic. I mean, you see body parts going everywhere, swords, heads, and Guts just looks ferocious. Now we see Charlotte giving Griffith a hug, and this makes Casca a little bit uneasy. Casca then tells Pippin to see to Griffith. Now, Casca's a little bit conflicted right now, but she's like, for now, all I can think about is getting Griffith out of this place. Now, the leader of the contingency is in disbelief that someone could have killed a hundred men. He thinks it's a bit of an exaggeration. But just as he's saying this, dozens of men come down the staircase. Guts explodes through the bodies in blood as he's exasperated and breathing heavily. The captain instructs his men to surround and encircle him. And seeing that Guts is winded, he feels like he's got the advantage. But that turns out to be false bravado as Guts slices off his head with his brain flying out like a projectile. Guts then proceeds to continue his savage onslaught. And when I say it's a savage onslaught, I mean goddamn, it is a savage onslaught. And Casca's even like, incredible, like a whirlwind. And we see Griffith staring at the affair and he looks quite shocked by this as well. Now we see many soldiers with crossbows in hand. However, the King of Midland steps in and tells them to stop. And I gotta say, the one thing that I noticed right away is that in the one year's time that we've seen the King of Midland, he has aged terribly. He looks like a shell of his former self. I mean, he's shaking, he just, he looks all withered and wrinkly, and it, it looks like his hair is going white. I mean, he just looks like a mess right now. And the reason that the King of Midland doesn't want them to shoot their arrows is because he doesn't want anything to happen to his daughter. The king then says, You should have rotted away beneath that tower long ago. You've crawled out from the depths of darkness to take my Charlotte again, so you would steal my light and run. I won't. I won't let you. Summon the Bakuraka. And then we get this really nice image of the Bakuraka here. We get this large, muscular man, a tall, skinny one, a smallish one on the muscular man's body, a very slender, medium-sized one, and a smallish kind of muscular one as well, with a pitchfork that kind of looks like something that Satan would hold. All right, so now we're on chapter 56, Bakuraka, chapter 1. And I really love this image of Guts here to start the chapter. Now, not much is known about the Bakuraka. Apparently, they're a fighting group from people of the East, highly skilled in assassination. They're also called a murderer's guild and an assassination order. Unfortunately, the full story is completely shrouded in mystery. And in many ways, they're more frightening than an army of 10,000 soldiers. Now, it should be noted that these men kind of look similar to Salat. You know, they got the turbans on their head, they got similar skin tones, so it's relatively reasonable to guess that Slat is possibly part of the Bakuraka, or at least from the same area as the Bakuraka. Now, the king orders the Bakuraka to go after Griffith and his men, and he wants them to kill Griffith by any means necessary. However, he will not tolerate any harm to the princess, and if any one of them happen to kill his daughter, he will send the Midland army against the Bakuraka and wipe them off the face of the earth. Now, one of the Bakuraka members pulls out some claws, kind of similar to Wolverine almost. And then the king is like, Now, go! Present Charlotte before me, along with Griffith's head! Now, we see the carnage of Guts' fury as they make their way through the castle. Now, Judo notes that it seems like the soldiers' attacks seem to stop partway through the castle. But maybe he's just imagining that. We then see Guts is completely exhausted from his gruesome adventure, and Griffith is merely staring him down. Casca then walks over to Guts and starts to wipe the blood off of his face. Griffith then notes how tender Casca is treating Guts right now by wiping the blood off of his face. Something that never happened in the past before. Now the group decides to hurry, as we see the Bakuraka lurking in the shadows. They make their way into the sewer system. And even though Griffith can't speak right now, Charlotte feels like everything's going to be alright. I'm sure even his wounds will heal. We'll be together, forever and ever. Now as they're running through the sewers, Guts tells everyone to stop. He then notices the tall skinny Bakuraka member perched above the wall just above them. He jumps down as Guts tries to defend himself. Casca then looks down between her feet and notices a face beneath the water. The short stocky Bakuraka member rises up to strike with his trident. 
but Casca manages to parry the attack. She then drives her sword downwards, but he swims away just in the nick of time. Judo then notices that this is the Bakuraka, a mercenary band that specializes in assassinations. And he's heard that each one of them's a superhuman monster. But even these guys surpass even the rumors. We then notice the small one peek through one of the brick openings. He pulls out a blow dart gun and shoots it over at the group. Now the dart is going for Griffith, and Charlotte steps in the way to block it with her arm. Griffith's eyes widen as Charlotte collapses into the sewers. Alright, so now we're on chapter 57, Bakuraka, chapter 2. Now everyone is worried about Charlotte's safety. The small Bakuraka member tries to escape, but before he does, Guts manages to slice him in half. Anna tends to Charlotte as a tall skinny Bakuraka member comes back in play. Now he offers a deal for them. We want you to hand over the princess. In exchange, we guarantee her life. It turns out that the blow dart that struck the princess was poisoned. And if she's untreated, she will surely die. They have the poison, and if she dies, it's bad for them as well, because of the king's warning. With no options available to them, Casca authorizes the trade. Even though Guts is a bit leery of this. Before being handed over to the Bakiraka member, Charlotte reaches out for Griffith. Together. Together as always. Now, just before she goes, Griffith mouths something that only she can hear. And it's kind of hard to tell what he's saying here, but it almost seems like I love you. Tell me what you guys think in the comments. She then smiles as tears are coming from her eyes. We then see that Casca is a little bit perturbed by this. Now, with the exchange being made, the Bakuraka have time to go all out. The small one with the trident attacks Pippin, but he's able to block the blow on Griffith. The group then forms a protective barrier to protect Griffith from harm's way. The enormous Bakuraka then throws a javelin at the group, which Guts decides to defend with his sword. Another javelin is thrown, so Guts deflects it once more. Now as the javelin deflects off the various walls, Judo notices that it's sending sparks of light through the cave. Therefore, he wants to pull out the light because he has an idea. Pippin, when I give you the signal, hit the wall as hard as you can with your warhammer. Time for my street show. Guess you can pay admission later, says Judo. They cut out the light, as the muscular Bakiraka can't see anymore. Judo throws a couple of knives at the walls, which cause the sparks that he was intending. And with these sparks, he's able to see the muscular Bakiraka in the darkness. This gives him a brief opportunity to throw his knife for the kill. And he doesn't waste this moment, as the two knives go into the man's neck, killing him on the spot. Now Pippin, hit it as hard as you can! We'll see the enemy by the sparks! Pippin does as he's commanded, as Guts and Casca get ready for their respective kills. And with that, Guts cuts the Bakuraka member's head in half, and Casca finishes off hers as well. Alright, so now we're on chapter 58, Flower of the Stone Castle. Alright, so when this issue came out on May 12th of 1995, it came out in Young Animal issue number 10. And in that issue, it provided a gift telephone card of Guts. So you've seen that image right here, it's a piece of original artwork, and it really looks nice guys, I really like it. I love the coloring and the shading, and it appears to be the 3 year anniversary of Young Animal according to this image. So pretty cool stuff. Way to go, Judo! You used the sparks to see the enemy's position, says Guts. Judo is actually rather surprised that his plan worked out so well. Now they want to light the lantern once more, but they smell something pungent in the sewer system, and Pippin urges them not to light it. We then see the final member of the Baki Raka, the female member that has bags full of dust. She then ignites a spark with the rings on her wrist, causing a huge flame to envelop the entire area. A flame that's going straight towards the band of the hawk. The dust caught fire! If it catches up to us, even our lungs will be burnt black, screams Pippin. The group makes their escape, as Griffith notices a small column of light coming from the ceiling. Pippin takes his cue and smashes his way through, allowing them to divert the fire upwards and away from them. Pippin then explains that the same kind of accident happened to him at a mine that he used to work at. Fire will gush upwards to a wider space. Later on, having failed her mission, the female Bakiraka member is executed by the King of Midland. He then points his sword over at Anna and blames her for her schemes. But Princess Charlotte intervenes and says that Anna wasn't involved. She was forced to do what she did because of the princess. She then asks her father to let Lord Griffith go. You, you and he still... He suffered enough in the darkness a whole year. Surely your majesty is satisfied by now. Don't take anything else away from him. Please. Very well. I will not interfere with that man again. You may be at ease. 
and upon hearing this, Charlotte looks immediately relieved. Unbeknownst to Charlotte, the king has no intentions of letting Griffith live. Send out the black dogs, says the king. Order the black dog knights to pursue Griffith's party and annihilate them. Now the military tries to convince him otherwise, but he's not having any of it. Tell the leader the Black Dog Knights Wild he can name his position and reward if he brings me Griffith's head. Now the one knight is like, do not refer to them as knights. They're a disgrace to the Midland Army. And besides that, the man called Wild is like some kind of strange beast. The guards then pay Wild a visit, and he looks like a beastly man that's having sex with many women right now. Now because Wild is busy at the moment, he doesn't want to do any business today. However, it's a direct order from the king and it involves taking down the band of the hawk. Now that's funny. That business I mentioned, it's him. It's with that hawk boss, says the terrifying Wild. All right, so for chapter 59, it came out in Young Animal issue number 12 on June 9th of 1995. And it came out with this image of Guts and Zod in the background. And this is really just a nice image, guys. I love the color contrast. If you'll notice as well, we got Slug Baron in the bottom left corner and Rosine in the bottom right corner. And Guts even has a crossbow in his hands as well. So it's just a really nice image. It's really awesome looking. And this is, of course, chapter 59, Devil Dogs, chapter one. And we start off this chapter with the King of Midland as he's sitting alone in the throne room. And he thinks about the fact that Charlotte hasn't spoken a single word to him in the past year. In fact, she shut herself into her room and he hasn't even seen her. And of course, the reason that she doesn't want to see him is because he locked up her lover, Griffith. I won't forgive you. Griffith, your words which stole Charlotte away. You alone, I swear it, says the king. That man, I'm sure that Wyald will bring your head before me. We then see a flashback of five years ago. Now to help out with the war efforts, the king would assemble all the criminals in the area. And among all these men, one volunteered. A very bizarre man. Something about him was inhuman. You wish me to make you the leader? Yeah. The way we do things, the strongest take charge says Wyald. Barbo, the armor hacker, then steps forward. And I gotta say, this is a really interesting design for this guy. He kind of almost looks like a shark in a human body. And Wyald even refers to him as an octopus. Now to settle who will be the leader, the two decide to have a match with each other. Now they take off the restraints on Barbro, and they're about to do the same for Wyald as well, but he refuses. He doesn't even want a weapon for the duel. You need some kind of performance to capture the hearts of the troops. To get ruffians like these to obey, sometimes ordinary incentives won't cut it. Overwhelming power, a sense of charisma is essential, says Wyald. He then indicates that he's going to present a new statue to the king, and he points up at the tower. Barbaro then steps forward with his weapon, looking to take Wyald down. The result of the duel, however, was that Barbaro was impaled atop a tall tower, having been thrown there by the victorious Wyald. It was an unbelievable spectacle. In an instant, a strange statue had appeared on the peak of the tower. Although it had happened before our eyes, it still seemed as if it had been unreal, like some tasteless joke or something. Not one man there was able to emit even a sound. As he had declared, he completely seized the hearts of the convicts. Through a charisma of fear. The Black Dog Knights he led were on equal footing with the Band of the Hawk in terms of valor. But even with that in mind, their inhuman cruelty was intolerable. Whether they were in enemy territory or in their own domain, as long as it was a battlefield, they would plunder, violate women, and butcher even the old and children. But instead of finding fault in them, during the war I would send them to remote battlefields to keep them away from the center of my army, from my presence. Yes, I was afraid of him too, that strange man. Now with the black hounds of hell on Griffith's tail, they stand no chance of surviving. On a farm outside of Windham, we see that the Band of the Hawk is taking a rest. And even one of the ladies presents Griffith with a bouquet of flowers, stating that she doesn't believe that he committed treason. Casca then takes a seat in the wagon just to make sure that Griffith doesn't fall out. I can't find the words when there's so much I want you to hear, thinks Casca. Judo then says, this isn't the time to be saying idle things, but this might really be our last glimpse of that city. A lot's happened when you think about it, replies Guts. As Griffith and Casca take a look, the bouquet of flowers start flying away, and we see a childlike version of Griffith running away from the kingdom. Hi there, says Wyald. Might I inquire something of you, girly? Did a suspicious group with a wounded man pass by here? The girl trembles in fear, as Wyald says. Before the hawk hunt, guess I'll get the juices flowing a bit. 
We then see the man of the farm with a sword through his mouth, the various children are burnt alive, and the woman is raped by Wyald. It's my motto, make it fun, make it stimulating. Alright, so now we're on chapter 60, Devil Dogs, chapter 2. Now as the band of the hawk comes to the top of the hill, Casca noticed figures in the distance running after them. And she's the first one to realize that the pursuers have impaled the farmer's main bodies with their spears and have brandished their body parts high above the ground. And for obvious reasons, I'm not going to show that in this video. No! How could they? says Casca. Judo immediately recognizes that this is the Black Dog Knights, an army unit drafted from criminals. They're the most roughshod in all of Midland. With the Black Dog Knights on their heels, they're not going to be able to make it to the bridge and use their trap. So they're going to have to use guts to buy some time. Casca gets a little bit worried though, thinking about the day that he fought those hundred men. With Pippin by his side, the two easily kill many Black Dog Knights. Yet no matter how many they kill, they don't seem to back down, they just keep charging forward. Something that surprises Guts. It ain't normal. Their eyes. It's fear. They're being driven on frickin' fear! Wyald drives his spear forward, which bears the armless and legless body of the girl who helped them out earlier. Guts just barely manages to deflect it, but he's a little bit horrified by seeing the girl's face. Wyald then steps forward to confront Guts. Ain't we a lively one? Let me play some too. Sure, responds Guts. I'll play with you. Guts then swings his massive sword, but his hand is caught by the monstrous Wyald. What? Says Guts. Ho ho, now that's one big toy. So, what will you do now? We then see Guts and Judo make it to the bridge as Casca gets out to set up their trap. Guts then struggles with Wyald's strength. Pippin comes in to provide a distraction, as Guts thinks about the fact that no one's ever been able to stop his sword barehanded like that before, and with only one hand too. He also notes that his bloodthirstiness is not normal. I know this. I remember. This... this feeling. It's the same. It's the same feeling that he felt with Guts and the Skull Knight. A feeling of helplessness. A feeling of powerlessness. Guts then receives the cue from Casca as he makes his move. Pippin and Guts make their way across the bridge as Casca lights the fuse. Gunpowder? Fun! Says Wyald. The Black Dog Knights are caught on the bridge as the massive explosion goes off. Alright, so now we're on Chapter 61, Devil Dogs, Chapter 3. Guts, Pippin, and Judo lead their horses to safety away from the massive explosion, which sends several men of the Black Dog Knights flying over the bridge. Guts urges the group to keep moving forward as he wants to put distance between them and the Black Dog Knights. We then see that Wyald and several other members of the Black Dog Knights have safely made it across the bridge. Safe, says Wyald. Now Wyald tells his troops to move forward, but one of the men stands up and says, This is crazy, boss. He says that it's likely that they've laid more traps for them in the forest. So the mission is a little bit too dangerous at this point. Yet Wyald doesn't seem undeterred. That's the problem with you grown-ups, says Wyald as he squeezes the man's face. If you start talking about living and dying, you end up wasting your life away. The Creed of the Black Dog Knights. To, to enjoy and excite, responds the group. Damn right. Don't you forget it. Now the group notices that the Black Dog Knights are chasing them down, and Guts is like, I'm sure of it. He's the same. The same as Zod and the same as Skull Knight. He then wonders why things like this keep appearing to him and Griffith. He then thinks about Skull Knight's words. One year hence shall be the time of the eclipse. When his ambition collapses, death will pay you a visit. A death you can never escape. It can't be, says Guts. We then see a monstrous hand hovering above Guts, as Casca snaps him out of his trance. As the Black Dog Knights make it through the forest, they notice a boulder slide right in front of them. The boulders start crushing many of the men, but this is all music to Wyald's ears. Big pinch! Yahoo! Wyald then steps forward and punches one of the large boulders with his bare fist, shattering the entire thing. The Black Dog Knights run full force into yet more traps, among which is an explosion that causes a massive fire. Yet, Wyald walks out of the fire like he's coming from the pits of hell. Is he a monster? screams Judo. Guts then figures that they're probably going to have to fight him once again. We then see a barrage of arrows coming down as we see Quirkus and the various members of the Band of the Hawk ready to protect them. Now, in a very humorous moment, Quirkus gets ready to give the orders, but the men just charge right ahead before he can actually say anything. Now this finally feels like a battle, says Wyald. The much-rumored Band of the Hawk. Time to get me the full taste of them. I'll be your opponent, says Guts. I don't know what the hell you guys are, but I'm taking care of you personally, monster. Alright, so now we're on chapter 62, 
Demon Dog, Chapter 4. Ho, oh, buddy, you act like something. Ha <laughs> ha. That stupid cow Zod said there was a lively one in the band of the hawk. And that must be you, says Wyald. No mistake, I knew it, replies Guts. Looks like this will be an unexpected festival's eve. Now, let's play. Guts thinks about Zod's words as he's like, that's what he must have been talking about. Guts then races forward and says, Who the hell do you think you are? And as he engages Wyald in battle, we see the various members of the Band of the Hawk and the Black Dog Knights going at each other. And it's a very brutal affair, and we even see Gaston talking to Corcus. He's like, come on, don't fall behind, Captain! Casca then leaves Griffith with the medical group so that they can take care of him. This gives her the opportunity, along with Judo and Pippin, to go into battle. For now, anyway, we've got to get through this fight, replies Casca. We then see Guts continue to struggle on against Wyald. And they are literally burning a hole through the battlefield. I mean, they are going so fast right now. And Casca's like, that sword handling is beyond imagination. But yet, despite this, Wyald is keeping up with every strike. Guts then says, this guy's incredible. He's stopping my sword with a goddamn log. And his movements ain't even technique. They're sloppy. He's doing it all by pure reflex. But... I ain't about to let him parry like that forever. Guts then goes for his face. But, surprisingly, Wyald catches it with his teeth. So close. And this kind of reminds me of the time that Guts put Griffith's sword in his mouth. We then see Wyald use this opportunity to punch Guts' horse. Guts then jumps off the horse and kicks Wyald down. And with that, the two are staring each other down. The rest of the members of the Band of the Hawk are watching on as they're like, This is unbelievable. Delectable. You are just too tasty, says Wyald. I never thought you'd make this so enjoyable. What the hell do you even eat with those teeth, replies Guts. The two engage each other in a flurry of attacks. Attacks that are so fast, it's hard to see what's going on. We then see Griffith in a small hollow as he's being protected by two of his men. Now, Griffith looks over at his sword and he wants to help out. He wants to be a contributing member of the Band of the Hawk. So he reaches over to grab it. Unfortunately, because his tendons are cut, he can't pick it up. And I gotta say guys, this image right here is one of the most depressing of all the Berserk manga. Just seeing Griffith so feeble and weak and so incapable of doing anything right now is just heart-wrenching in a lot of ways. I mean, this guy just got tortured for a year and all he wants to do is help out his fellow comrades. He wants to go back to being the leader of the Band of the Hawk and reviving the dream. And that's just not possible at this point in time. Wyald then smacks Guts several feet back as the swordsman stares him down. Alright, so now we're on chapter 63, Rora the Wild Beast. Now it looks like the Band of the Hawk has gained the advantage over the Black Dog Knights. The enemy's in a rout, screams Casca. Finish them off in one go! Then one of the Black Dog Knights calls out to Wyald and he's like, Everyone's running off on their own. It's just getting too bad out there. These guys are just too tough for us. But Wyald's like, what are you doing? The festival's just getting started. Wyald then grabs onto the trunk of a tree, and with one punch, he knocks it down and kills most of his men. Don't I always tell you, the fun starts now. You've got to think about life positively. He then throws a log through one of his recruits. Huh, that sure spoiled the mood. Nothing for it. So now, I will start this party myself. A cloud of smoke then pervades the area as we see Wyald undergoing a transformation. He grows to be taller than three times Guts' height. His lower body appears to be that of a headless gorilla, with Wyald's top acting as the head. There are three eyes, and there's a gigantic smile where the chest should be. And goddamn, if that is not horrifying, guys, I don't know what the hell is. I mean, holy crap! I mean, could you imagine coming face to face with something like this? It would just be terrifying. And we can see it in Guts' body language right here. His legs are shaking, he's sweating. He's like, I was right. He's just what I imagined. Now the Band of the Hawk thinks that this might be Zod, but they realize that it's actually something different. We then see Griffith lying on the ground, as he appears to be just as frightened as everyone else. Wyall then rips a tree out of the ground. Alrighty then, let's give it a go! He then gives Guts a hard whack as he goes flying into the air. We then see him come crashing down and land on the ground very hardly. Casca goes in with her horse, but unfortunately for her, she's knocked down. Just when I thought this party was a sausage fest, a cute girly shows up, says Wyald. May I have this dance, miss? Now the band of the hawk brings out their crossbows as Judo leads the second volley. Jeez, talk about being uncouth. Being bothered while I'm slaying or laying pisses me off the most. 
He then brandishes a gigantic tree in front of the mercenary band. Alright, so now we're on chapter 64. Forest of Tragedy. Wyald then utilizes the tree to plow through Judo's archers. And goddamn, just look at them fly. I mean, holy cow. He then takes one of the men while he's still riding his horse and decides to eat them both. Yet another instance of a horse being abused in Berserk. The men become frantic at this point as they all start running away. They want to get Griffith onto the wagon as Griffith looks over at Casca as she's trying to wake up Guts. Now Casca slaps Guts in the face and says, Weren't you going to take me with you? Weren't you? Weren't you going to take me with you? And this really captures Griffith's attention. I mean, up until this point, he kind of figured out that there was something going on between them, but this pretty much verifies everything that he was suspecting. Wyald then pulls apart two trees and says, Sorry for the wait, honey. He then grabs her and pulls her into the air and starts squeezing her. At this size, it's like playing with a doll. Now, let's get you undressy. Now, everyone is panicking as Griffith tries to walk on his own. He wants to do something about this. He wants to help her. But he knows at the end of the day, he can't do anything. Armor don't look good on a woman. But personally, I'm not one for dresses either. He then rips off her clothing, revealing her breast. He then pulls out his massive tongue dick and, uh... <laughs> I don't know what he's gonna do with this thing. This thing is freaking massive. I mean, just look! And just look at this thing. It's just absolutely disgusting. It looks like it has warts on it. I'll soon make you forget about all your past men, says Wyald. Tears stream down Casca's face as she screams no. We then see Guts' sword rise up into the air. He jumps up and slices off Wyald's tongue dick. Don't go swinging that filthy thing over my head. And goddamn, is this gotta hurt, guys. Not my dick! <laughs> You know, it kind of makes you wonder why these scenes weren't shown in the Golden Age anime or the movies. Then again... Now, because of this action, Casca falls down onto the ground. And he thanks her for giving him the invigoration to fight on. Now, even though Casca's clothes were removed, she still wants to fight on. And Guts is like, look, Casca, I appreciate the effort and all, but you're gonna distract me like that. She's like, what the hell are you talking about? Forget it, let's get out of... Just get moving, screams Guts. And no matter the circumstance, and no matter how hard the battle looks, Guts wants to settle the score with him. By his own sword. Alright, so now we're on chapter 65. Mortal Kombat, chapter 1. Now Guts is visibly shaken. He's like, will it work? Will my sword really work on this monster? And despite his fears, he's like, come on, body. We gotta move forward. He then lunges forward, and he's like, MOVE YOUR ASS FORWARD! And with his quick movements, he's able to pierce a sword right into Wyald's mouth. He dodges yet more punches and kicks, and when the opportunity arises, he slashes at its legs, forcing him down onto the ground. Now everyone is cheering on Guts, as Casca does so well completely naked, you know, just in case you guys were wondering. And Griffith is absolutely stunned by Guts' impressive display. Guts then jumps onto Wyald's body and drives his sword into the gorilla body's abdomen. Got him, says Guts. Wyald then clasps his hands around Guts, squeezing him ever so tightly. He then rears up like he's throwing a football and tosses Guts' ass through a bunch of trees. Wyald then leaps into the air and comes crashing down right next to Guts, calling it the Wyald Stomp. Is this impossible? says Guts. Wait a sec. Did he just die from that? says Wyald. Everyone is utterly horrified by what they're seeing. Because if Guts can't beat him, who the hell is going to do it? Griffith again wants to get into the battle. He even starts biting his lip and we see blood going down his face. Is this unwinnable? says Guts. You're going to die. He then thinks about his time at Godo's house when he was doing the log training. And Erica told him at the time that if he continues his training, he's going to die like this. And she's like, why do you have to go so far with this sword practice? And it's because of his encounter with Zod. She then asks if he wants to fight that monster again. And he's not really sure. He's then brought back to reality as we see him hanging on a tree branch. He then manages to cut one of Wyald's eyeballs. Wyald then looks to smash him with his fist, but Guts dodges and slashes one of his fingers. Why you little? That does it. You're dead meat. We then see Guts, who is physically exhausted, injured from head to toe, stand up with the help of his sword, and he's like, Well, let's see about that. Alright, so now we're on Chapter 66, Mortal Kombat, Chapter 2. I'm in deep. I can hardly stand. Some cracked ribs, too. Looks like I can't move much anymore. What now? What do I have to do to win? Now, Casca wants to help out Guts, but Judo stops her, saying that if she goes over now, she's only going to hinder him. She then begins to cry as she's like, why does he always have to fight? It's alright to just run away sometimes. 
And this is yet another moment in which Griffith is staring over at Casca. And he seems to be taking a special interest in every time Casca shows affection towards Guts. We then see a crazed Wyald going in for the kill, as he knocks Guts down onto the ground. We then see that Guts' sword is cracking on all the edges, as a bunch of members of the Band of the Hawk fall down as well. He then looks over at a nearby body of a deceased member of the Black Dog Knights and formulates a plan. Now, Wyald is playing a little bit of hide and seek with Guts, you know, just to kind of torture him a little bit. I got one chance, says Guts. Neither my sword nor my body will take more than that. Why, aren't you just precious, says Wyald. He then goes over to the tree where he thinks Guts is, but it turns out to be a ruse. He then chops the tree with the Black Dog Knight member and realizes that Guts is coming from the air. That was a pretty good plan though. And thrust! Wyald then annihilates the log with his strike, but fails to notice that Guts was directly behind it. And because of this, Guts leaps into the air and thrusts his sword right into Wyald's neck, appearing to get the final blow. In a last effort to get Guts, Wyald tries to slap him off. Guts, however, gets behind him and puts him into a chokehold. He then pulls out a small dagger and starts stabbing him some more. He even gets him in the eye at one point. Nevertheless, Wyald tries to bang the back of his head against a tree. This knocks Guts down, but at the same time, Wyald collapses to the ground. Casca and the members of the Band of the Hawk rush forward to see if Guts is still alive. With tears streaming down Casca's face, Guts gives the thumbs up, indicating that he survived the battle. She embraces him as the victorious Band of the Hawk comes rushing forward. Alright, so now we're on chapter 67, Armor to the Heart. We then transport it back to Midland Castle as we see Princess Charlotte waking up. She then asks Anna if Lord Griffith is safe, and she tells her that no report of Lord Griffith and the others being captured has reached the castle, which relieves Charlotte. Anna then leaves the room and says, I can't tell her that the Band of the Hawk is still being pursued. With a grieved look on her face, Princess Charlotte then looks out the window and sees a false image of Griffith standing on the branches of the tree. She then thinks back to the words that Griffith said to her in the escape tunnel, that he would come back, says Charlotte. I promise I'll return, as a tear streams down her face. Charlotte then looks up into the sky and sees Zod overhead. However, she thinks it's a bird. And I really love this image of Zod here. Now I gotta say guys, this image kind of reminds me of something. There was an epic poem written by John Milton called Paradise Lost. It's a story about Satan and other fallen angels being banished to hell. And in Pandemonium, the capital city of hell, now Pandemonium is going to be relatively important in terms of Berserk later on, Satan volunteers to corrupt the newly created earth and God's new and most favored creation, mankind. Now, the reason it reminded me of it, because if you look at the cover of the book, this image here of Satan falling out of the sky kind of reminds me of Zod a little bit. You know, with the wings and everything. I mean, it just kind of looks very similar in a lot of ways. And I'm sure this is foreshadowing on Mira's part in the future. Because like I said, if you've read ahead, you know what pandemonium means in Berserk. I won't reveal that information to new readers, but it seems like there's some parallels there. But anyway, let's move forward. We then see that the Band of the Hawk is resting up from their gruesome battle. Now, Casca is sewing up Guts and admonishing him for his reckless behavior. She then says that even though his skills have improved, he doesn't know when to quit. Swinging his sword is the only thing that he does. All he knows how to do is swing his sword. She says that there's no shame in retreating. And if you wind up dead, that's it. It's all over. I wouldn't be a mercenary if I weren't ready to die, says Guts. Fine then, die on your own, says Casca as she begins crying. She finishes up with Guts' wrappings as Judo does the same for Griffith. As Casca leaves the caravan, she says, welcome home. She then asks Judo about Griffith's condition. The tendons in his arms and legs are ruined, so things like holding a sword are impossible. This information shakes Casca to her very core, so she quickly turns around and gives orders to the Band of the Hawk. Judo then wonders, so we cross the border. After that, then what do we do? We then see various members of the Band of the Hawk crowding around Wyald's body. They marvel at how huge he is as they notice that something is moving. We're then transported back to the caravan with Guts and Griffith. We must look like a couple of tattered rags right now. Well, at least we get to sleep while they carry us around. I've been swinging my sword nonstop since yesterday. It's just like that time. That time with Nosferatu Zod. Both of us busted up, but we both survived. And while listening to this, Griffith smiles. This is a really nice moment, I gotta say. 
Good Sense says that it must be really hot with that mask on, and he's like, hey, we could just take it off. No one else is in here. Griffith then swings his head backwards and looks over at his armor. Guts immediately understands what he's talking about and decides to get it for him. He then puts it on the Griffith as instructed. This is a battleground after all. Gotta wear armor on the field of battle, or you're as good as dead. We then see a couple of members of the Band of the Hawk dead on the ground, as the battered Wyald is dragging himself through the forest. Alright, so now we're on chapter 68, The Flying One. We now see that Wyald has made his way to the Band of the Hawk camp. As he says, I don't want to die! Guts fastens on Griffith's armor, and he's like, there we go. The White Hawk flies again. Now Griffith tries to grab his sword out of its holster, but he's still too weak. And Guts tries to console him. He's like, look, I know you're eager and all, but it's been a year since you've worn your armor and all. Soon you'll be able to swing all you want. Soon. But we see this look on Griffith's face like he's not so sure about that. Guts then hears about an enemy raid as Wyald Hand comes in and slaps him. We then see that the carriage is broken down as Wyald stares them down. No, no, I don't want to die. There you are, says Wyald as he grabs on the Griffith. He then brandishes Griffith high in the air and tells the others not to move. Otherwise, he'll hurt Griffith. Wyald then seems a little bit befuddled. He's like, what the hells? He's just like some insect, but I... If I wind up dead here, I'll, I'll be inside that vortex forever. He then commands Griffith to summon them, the Great Ones. And Griffith is beyond quizzical. He's like, Great Ones? If you're really going to become, you should have it. The Crimson Bailet. The Egg of the King. Use it. Call them our guardian angels. The four members of the God Hand. And I gotta say, this is an absolutely gorgeous image here of Void, Slan, Ubik, and Conrad. And that is juxtaposed with Griffith's vision in the cell when he saw them within the bricks of the cell. On Casca's command, the Band of the Hawk brings out their archers. However, Wyall just begins to laugh. Every last one of them's got a twinkle in his eye. I can't stand it. They ain't the eyes of those who fight for a living. They're like the eyes of a kid who has his toy taken away. I get it. He's what does it. He's the precious kid's toy. You guys must be so happy. You don't know a damn thing. Your precious toy was broken a long time ago. He then begins to peel back the armor on Griffith's body as Casca screams for him to stop it. Yet soon enough, Griffith's mangled body is presented before the Band of the Hawk. Look! Look at this mangled body! He gave a year's worth of playtime to that perverted jailer in the Tower of Rebirth. And it ain't just some skin he's missing. He's missing muscles. His arm muscles. Leg muscles and tongue. They've all been cut up or cut out. I bet you planned on carrying him up and making something out of yourselves again. Too bad. It'll never happen. The Band of the Hawk members are demoralized by what they see. Griffith's emaciated body is utterly beyond words at this point. None of you got any hope. Not even a sliver, says Wyald. He then begins to take off the helmet on Griffith's head, as we see that Guts is gritting his teeth with fury. Wyald then makes a stunning revelation. He notices that the Baylet is not on Griffith's body. That can't be! You're supposed to have it! It can't! You're, you're kidding! If that's not here, I... I... But as he makes this stunning revelation, an even bigger apostle lands right behind him. Nosferatu Zod. Alright, so now we're on chapter 69, The Immortal, once again. Now before we start this chapter, it should be noted that this chapter originally came out on November 24th of 1995. And it came out in Young Animal Issue at number 23. And when that issue came out, it had a intro cover with Nosferatu Zod in all green. A little bit of red in there, a little bit of shading, but wow, what a magnificent image. I've never seen Zod drawn like this before with this kind of color pattern, but it's absolutely epic. And when the Berserk Cafe opened up in 2022, they actually had this as one of the images that you could buy. I believe there was also an image of this at the Berserk exhibition as well. It was going for like 12, 13, 1400 dollars. And to be honest with you guys, I was very tempted to buy this for myself, but that's just a lot of coin to drop on a single image. Alright, to start off this chapter, we see Zod in the sky as he comes landing down right behind Wyald. 
and we got this magnificent full page spread of Zod as he's spreading out his wings and arms and scaring everyone in the area. And I really love this shot for one reason, the size perspective. We know that Wyald is about three times Guts' size, and Zod is almost twice as tall as Wyald. Which is interesting for a couple of reasons. I mean, we know that Zod is one of the baddest apostles out there, if not the strongest, but when we first saw him in the castle and he transformed, he was not nearly this big. He was probably only about twice Guts' size. But now he's like, what, six times Guts' size? I mean, it's it's just kind of crazy. And throughout the manga, you'll notice that Zod's apostle form can change size depending on the situation. There's times where he's about twice a human size, and then there's times where he's literally as tall as buildings. So he's literally as tall as he needs to be for the situation. Now Guts immediately recognizes that this is Zod. And Wyala is shaken to his core, he's like, why are you here? Zod then takes the horns on his head and impales Wyald right in the body. Everyone is in a panic state as we see that Guts is rather angry. And then Zod is able to take Wyald and hoist his massive body up into the air. Zod and Griffith's eyes then meet in a very curious manner. Wyald then wonders what Zod is doing. He's like, I is this on their orders? No, that can't be. Do what thou wilt. That's the only commandment for us apostles. Even if I ring him to death right here, no one should have any reason to complain. Even if he's the fifth one. And by saying this, Guts is like, fifth one? What's he talking about? Zod then responds by saying, that's right. And if I rip you open here and now, that too is my free will. Now Wyal pleads for him to stop, saying that they're on the same side. And he's like, no, it can't be. He's not the God Hand member. He's the wrong one. But in any case, Zod's like, you got no chance of surviving as he rips Wyald's body open. Wyald then loses his grip on Griffith as Guts catches him. Zod then takes a moment to stare down at Casca, Griffith, and Guts. It will return to your hand, because that's how it is. He then begins flapping his massive wings as he jettisons into the air. Now, Guts wants to know more about this eclipse, but Zod's just like, you will understand soon. Just then, a band of the Hawk member draws Casca's attention to Wyald's body. Now, as everyone is watching, a horde of deathly souls exit the body. They somewhat resemble human beings, but they're all contorted and just grotesque looking. Wyald's body then starts imploding, collapsing onto itself and going into a massive vortex. A massive vortex that we saw in the Black Swordsman arc. And as we watch the Horde of Souls return to the massive vortex, we're reminded of the Black Swordsman arc when the Horde of Souls took the Count back to the vortex as well. After this takes place, all that's left of Wyald's body is just an old man with a sword going through his neck. But unfortunately for the Guts' party, this only leaves more questions than answers. Alright, so now we're on Chapter 70, Requiem of the Wind. And this is the start of Volume 12 of Berserk. And besides the volume cover with Guts and Skull Knight, this is my favorite, so that would make this one my second favorite. I just absolutely love this one with Femto coming out of the Baylet. Just so iconic, so memorable, just gives you so many emotions, it's so visceral, just... It really can't be explained. It's just one of those images that just wows you. And I really love this image too of the sword going into the rocks with the helmet on top. This is going to be very significant moving forward, but we'll talk about that later. So we're now at the Midland border region, and the Band of the Hawk is in an empty field. Casca stands before what remains of the Band of the Hawk, and she's about to deliver the bad news. We then see Guts sitting on a rock as he looks over at the wagon with Griffith inside. Now, Corcus is in disbelief. He's like, uh, you know, it's just bogus what that monkey monster said, right? Now, Corcus wants to talk to Griffith himself, but Judo's like, he can't do that right now. He's not able to answer you. Corcus then hits his mental breaking point. Weren't we gonna start again here? Huh? After Griffith came back, weren't we gonna start over? Running around in the woods for a year like bugs. More than half of us have been killed. But still, still, as long as Griffith came back to us, after believing that, now this? <laughs> in a fit of rage, Corcus takes his sword out and breaks it against a rock. While Corcus deals with things his own way, we see that Judo, Pippin, and Casca are all lamenting the circumstances as well. This is... Everyone knew how that ended, but not a man could bring himself to say it. 
Only the wind announced the end of the fight. The various members of the Band of the Hawk wonder what their next move is. They look towards Casca for guidance, but Judo says that she doesn't have their answers. She's given all she can to rescue Griffith. It's unfair to ask anything more of her. Casca needs to think about the situation a little more as she ends the conversation with the group. Guts catches up to her and wonders what she's going to do next. He reminds her to finish the battle she started, but she then replies with, But you can't say such things to Griffith the way he is now. Everyone's weak, and so they rely on dreams and other people. I wonder what you can do for someone who's lost what they rely on. Kind words? Stern rebukes? She then plants her face in the guts and says, I wanted someone to be near me. And then as Guts embraces her, we see that Griffith is looking on from inside his carriage. She then goes over to Griffith to change his bandages as Guts thinks about the words that she just uttered. Alright, so now we're on chapter 71, Warriors of Twilight. Now as Casca is bandaging up Griffith, she's like, wow, I didn't realize how small his hands were. And he tried to grasp everything with these hands. But just by placing them on my shoulder, he could somehow ease my trembling. Her hands begin to tremble as she wraps up the bandages. Lost in thought, she knocks over a bowl of water with her knee. She looks to give him another blanket, but then Griffith collapses right on her. Casca tells Griffith to stop, but halfway through, she realizes how light his body actually is. And she decides against it. And she allows Griffith to lay on top of her, even patting him on the back in the process. Judo tells Guts that good dreams, bad dreams, it's always unfortunate to wake up in the middle of one. He then wonders what Guts is going to do next. Judo thinks he'll start a thief group. That way he can use the money to look after Griffith. Now Guts wants to join up with him, but Judo's like, nah, you already separated yourself. There's no obligation for you to stay here. Now even though Judo is still a hawk, Guts is different. He started his own battle. And he's got to see it through to the end. You should take Casca with you this time, says Judo. If you don't, she... Gaston and the Hawks Raiders then approach Guts, wondering if he's planning on leaving again. If you do, please let us go with you, Captain. As long as they got their captain by their side, they can accomplish anything. And even though Gaston wants to run his clothing shop, due to the proclamation, he can't go back to Windham. Plus, the Hawks Raiders feels like family to him at this point, and he doesn't want to leave them. Guts then realizes that this might have been the place that he was looking for all along, but he was too stupid and stubborn to notice it the first time. Why do I always see these things after they're done and gone, says Guts. Casca sits outside Griffith's wagon, visibly shaken by the situation. She attempts to calm herself, but Guts intervenes. She then begins to cry as Guts is wondering what's going on. She then reveals to Guts that she can't go. She can't go with him. Griffith, he's so small now. He's so fragile. I can't leave him. There's no way. I can't leave Griffith like that. I'm sorry. Now Guts wants to stay too, but then Casca pushes off. And she reminds him that he can't hang on another man's dream. She reminds him of the night at Primrose Hall. The night in which Griffith talked about dreams and friendship. You have to go, says Casca. If you're Griffith's friend and equal, you have to. Even if it's alone, you have to go. Guts then thinks to himself, Why do I always see these things after they're done and gone? Alright, so now we're on chapter 72, Back Alley Boy. Griffith is not really asleep at the moment, as he overhears the conversation between Casca and Guts. A vision then overtakes his senses. A vision in which he sees a version of himself before he was tortured. What do you fear in this place? Griffith struggles to pull his body up. The idealized Griffith then pulls out his sword and puts it into the ground. He then proceeds to point at the castle off in the distance. The current, frail Griffith then uses a sword as a crutch, so that he can lift himself off of the ground. A childlike version of Griffith then runs past him. Let's go! We're not done playing yet! The sun still hasn't gone down! As the childlike version of himself runs into the bright light, the current Griffith moans loudly, trying to get the attention of his younger self. Just then, Guts and Casca notice that the cart is going off. He shouldn't be able to move at this point, as Casca says that he must have heard them. Guts is going to give chase as he tells Casca to tell Judo and the others. Damn it, damn it, god damn it, screams Guts. Griffith holds the riding crop between his teeth as he chases after the vision of his younger self. Yes, I rested a bit too long. I've got to go now. This playtime still hasn't ended. That back alley cobblestone path still goes on. 
The carriage then hits a rock in the ground as Griffith is thrown into the air. Griffith then has a vision of himself sitting in a dark house with a blanket over his lap. And Casca, who appears to be his wife, says that it's supper time. Griffith then begins to wonder where he is. He thinks that it must be a dream. Casca then stares at the sword and shield on the wall and says, I wonder if he's still swinging his sword around somewhere. You know, when I think about it now, everything that happened seems like a dream. It'd make a good fairy tale for the boy. She then screams at the boy not to bully the dog, and it turns out that the boy's name is Guts. Casca marvels at how great life is with the three of them as she goes to give Griffith a kiss on the cheek. That's true, says Griffith. This peace and quiet isn't so bad. Just then, he notices a baylet coming out of the spoon of soup, as he suddenly wakes up, flying through the air. He comes crashing down into a body of water as he notices that his arm is all mangled. <laughs> Griffith begins to laugh in a maniacal manner, completely losing all hope in himself. He then makes his way over to a sharp branch and positions himself so that's just below his neck. He begins to lean into the branch as blood goes down his neck. He cannot, however, kill himself as he just nearly misses the branch by going to the side. Griffith is absolutely exasperated at this point. He doesn't know what to do next, as we have a very picturesque landscape of him in the water with the sun setting. And I gotta say, guys, that this image reminds me of one that was done by Salvatore Dali. It's a surrealistic oil-on-canvas painting called The Metamorphosis of Narcissus. And if you look at this painting right here, you can see a lot of similarities to Berserk. And the man who is sitting in the water is very similar to Griffith in a lot of ways. And it just so happens that I made a video explaining this very thing, so if you want to watch that, you can watch it here. But for the purposes of this video, let's move on with the story. Griffith then looks into the water and recognizes something familiar on the riverbed. He then lifts his hand out of the water as he notices that the bailet has caught on to it. Alright, so now we're on chapter 73, Eclipse. Now this came out on February 9th of 1996 in Young Animal issue number 4. And that issue featured a cover of Femto coming out of the Baylet. And this is the cover as it appeared in the original Japanese magazine, so pretty cool stuff. Alright, to start this issue, we see Griffith kneeling in the water, staring at the Baylet in his hand, and he thinks about the words of Zod. It will return to your hand, because that's how it is. Use it! Call them! Our guardian angels! Says Wyald in a flashback. We then see Guts on the carriage as he's thinking about Griffith. Was it me? The one who drove you? Was I the one who brought this all upon you? What should I do? What do you want of me? What can I do? Once I catch up to you, what then? What then? Guts then notices something off in the distance. We then see the band of the hawk led by Casca on their horses. And she's thinking about how careless it was for Griffith to overhear her. The band of the hawk then catches a glimpse of Guts and Griffith, but then they also notice something off in the distance. And it's the moon blocking out the light from the sun, a solar eclipse. And then as Griffith is staring up at the solar eclipse, we see blood running down his body into the baylet. And the eyes are starting to peek open a little bit. Guts then yells, Griffith. But Griffith immediately backs off. He's trying to get away from Guts. He's like, ah, stay away, stay away. We then have a really nice full page spread of Guts, Griffith, the Eclipse, and the various monsters in the background. And these monsters are coming in all different shapes and sizes. They look human, but they also look very rancorous and mean at the same time. Now Casca immediately thinks that this is the Midland Army, but Guts thinks differently. He's like, I don't know what they are, but they're definitely dangerous. We then see Guts exit the carriage as Griffith keeps saying, stay away. If you touch me now, if you put your hand on my shoulder now, I'll never, I'll never. Guts then runs through the shallow water as he looks to put his hand on Griffith. Never again with you, says Griffith. Guts unfortunately does exactly what Griffith doesn't want him to do. He puts his hands on him. And while Griffith is staring up at Guts, we see the face on the baylet reconfiguring itself. The eyes start to open and blood is pouring out. And it begins to scream. <laughs> And by doing this scream, it activates, transporting Guts, Griffith, and the rest of the band of the Hawk to another dimension. A dimension that has horrifying faces on the ceiling. And on the ground are even bigger faces. And all we can see from the outside world is a solar eclipse. And we're left to wonder, what does this all mean? 
Now, before we proceed any further, I should note that in 1996, there were some special drawings done by Kentaro Mira. And at the time Chapter 74 was released, it was February 9th of 1996. Now, I don't know if these images were released in the early parts of 1996 or the later parts of 1996, but I thought this would be a good point before we start the eclipse to talk about these images and just kind of enjoy them a little bit. Now, the first one we got here is one of Puck in Guts' satchel, and between his legs, we can see the bailet. And it's got a greenish slash bluish hue to it. I know there's always a lot of confusion in the community. A lot of people think that all the balets are red, but that's only the egg of the king. That's only the balet that Griffith had. The rest of the balets, as far as we know, kind of this bluish green slash grayish color. We then got an image of Guts holding his Dragon Slayer with Puck on his shoulder. We then got an image of Guts after the eclipse, as noted by his mechanical arm. Very nice. This is a nice one of Casca here. I really like the perspective of her with her back to the reader, with her just looking over her shoulder. This is really nice. We got another one of Puck holding a leaf. Here's one of Guts with his Dragon Slayer as he's being chased down by a mysterious apostle. And I believe this might have been the artwork that they used for the Berserk um, Dreamcast game. I'll have to look that up and confirm that with you guys. But when we get to that point, we'll talk about that. We then see one of Guts killing various monsters and apostles. I really like the orange in this picture. It just kind of gives it that ominous, kind of death-like feel. And then we see this one of Guts with his repeating crossbow, Dragon Slayer, and Puck by his back. We got a nice one of Griffith taking off his helmet. I really like this one. Here we see Griffith and Guts on their horses as they're walking through a village. Looks like one of the girls is handing Griffith an apple. Uh, this one, <laughs> this one, Casca's taking a bath in a local pond, and uh, we just see various members of the Hawk. Looks like Rickert, Corcus, and Pippin are just kind of trying to get a peeksy. Uh, so kind of humorous there. We then see various members of the band of the Hawk, led by Judo, making their way through a river. We then see Guts carrying a dead body across the battlefield. We then see Guts and Pippin pushing a cannon that's also being pulled by some horses. So you don't always think about this stuff when you're reading the manga. You know, Mira just kind of shows the exciting stuff, but there's a lot of stuff that goes into those battles, all the preparation and such, and that takes a long time. This one's really nice with the band of the hawk by the campfire. They're just kind of resting up for the night. You see Guts sleeping in the tree, Judo's playing an instrument, and uh, yeah, everyone's just being really chill right now. You then see various kids in Windham playing with sticks, pretending that they're knights. And the final one here is one of Puck playing with a ladybug. And I really like the green hue to Guts here. It's kind of a unique perspective. It's kind of similar to the one with Zod where he had that green hue. So it's always nice seeing them in a different light like that. I really enjoy that. All right, so now we're on chapter 74, The Promise Time. Now, before we actually go to the eclipse, we see Rickard getting a ride from some people. And one of the men hands him a bag of medicine. And he's like, it's our troop's secret remedy. It works on wounds, fevers, stomach aches, and anything. Rickert then takes his leave as they're like, wow, that boy looked like he was death. Why was he so pale? We then see that someone's inside the caravan. Someone that we're quite familiar with. And he starts talking to a lady with a cloak on. And he's like, man, the second that boy saw me, he freaked out like he saw a ghost or something. And of course, we know why he freaked out, because the last time that he saw an elf was that incident with Rosine, and, you know, her and the other apostles just killed everyone. The fortune teller then decides to look into her crystal ball at the boy's future. Inside the crystal ball, she sees something rather horrific. She's like, what's this? An evil omen. It's an incredible calamity. An incredible calamity is about to occur. The stars have gathered on that boy's path. A huge number of evil stars with a giant white star at their core, as if they swirl about it. It's Kaito. No, it's Rago. The giant white star is now being concealed by the moon's conjunction. Now, there's a little bit of interesting mythology behind these two names. Rahu, pronounced Rago in Japanese, is one of the major celestial bodies in Hindu text and the King of Meteors. It represents the ascension of the moon in its processional orbit around the Earth, also referred to as the North Lunar Node. And along with Ketu, is a shadow planet that causes eclipses. Now, even though it doesn't have any physical existence, Rahu has been allocated to the status of planet by ancient seers. The seer then says, a sign of calamity that could enfold an entire country, no, the whole world. And we even got an author's notes about Kaito and Rago. The star that suddenly appears in the night sky and scares people is called Kaito. The star that steals light from the sun or moon and causes an eclipse is called Rago. Along with other imaginary stars, they are ancient legends. She then says that to interfere with one's fate is against principles. No, it's impossible to do such things in the first place. She then states that what determines a good omen or a bad omen is human reason. 
None are able to measure the ways of God. Puck then decides he's heard enough and decides to take off. We then see Rickard staring at the eclipse. It's ominous. I got a bad feeling. Has something happened to everyone? Puck then looks at the eclipse and says, I'll bet some big god or devil or something is peeking through that hole. We're then transported to the different dimension. We see the eclipse in the sky, and we see this dark, oozing substance that's surrounding it. The various members of the Band of the Hawk are just absolutely losing it as we see they're shaken to their very core. Even Casca's a bit perturbed by the situation as she tells everyone to shut up. She tells everyone to get into a tight formation and not to stray. Guts then thinks to himself that she's pretty remarkable, keeping her cool and all in a situation like this. Guts then lifts up Griffith and notices the bailet on his hand. That's really odd. Why is this here now? I'm sure he didn't have this when we rescued him. And what are those? Tears of blood? The shape's different too. Did this do it? He then wonders if the Baylit is the reason that they're here in this different world, as he notices the blood coming from Griffith's eyes. They then notice the various terrifying creatures on the faces, and they begin to panic. And the creatures are like, the time has come, the time of the great nocturnal festival, the feast that happens once every 216 years, the eclipse. It is now time for the advent, the advent of the four guardian angels. And with that, we see one of the faces in the ground start to lift up, and it looks like a girl's face. And of course, we know that this is Slan from the Black Swordsman arc. All right, so now we're on chapter 75, Advent. And we got this really interesting image of Slan coming out of the ground with the eclipse in the background. And we see Guts holding Griffith and the rest of the band of the Hawk staring at this unbelievable sight. An unbelievable sight that includes a gigantic naked woman. We then see massive black leathered wings come out of her back. She begins to moan as they spread out in a splendid fashion. She then has a very devilish smile on her face. And after the transformation is complete, we see the black wings, we see a corset around her body that, surprisingly enough, doesn't cover anything on it, but, you know, that's part of the allure. And she's got hair that almost looks like tentacles. They then see a single face among the formless visages in the sky. The face descends downwards as it peers down at them. He then shrinks down to a tiny shape among the terrified mercenaries. They then hear a deafening bellow that draws their attention to one of the small faces on the ground behind them. They watch on as the face lifts itself out of the ground and uses the surrounding faces to form its portly body. From one to the next, this is a dream. It's gotta be, says Corcus. One of the mercenaries then notices something off in the distance. We then see a whirlwind of blackness that forms into a monstrous silhouette before taking full form. And as it takes its final form, we notice the exposed brain on its head, the skin that's peeled back on its mouth, and the cloak that's covering its entire body. And this is none other than the Archangel himself, Void, the preeminent leader of the God Hand. And with that, we have the four God Hand members, Void, Ubik, Slan, and Conrad. Gods? No, are they demons? Thinks Guts. The naked monsters then exalt their presence, as the band of the Hawk has no idea what to make of this. At this great time of blessing, I bid thee welcome to this distant setting, this abstract time. Ye lambs of the ungodly god born of man, enjoy this sacred nocturnal festival to the fullest. He then points down at Griffith. The honorable child, consternated by the laws of causality, the hawk. Everyone is wondering what honorable child and laws of causality mean. Thou art the chosen one, at this time, in this place. The one chosen by the hand of the great God. We art kinsmen, O blessed king of longing. Griffith then thinks about his time in the cell, the time that he saw the four members of the God Hand. Guts then pulls out his knife and says, Enough of your stupid crap! He then remarks that he's seen Griffith naked before, and he ain't even got a tail growing, so there's no way that he's one of those freaks. But they just mock him to his face. Slan even says, Such beautiful friendship. I am sure you will make for an excellent sacrifice, as she licks her lips. And they're like, sacrifice? Yes, a precious sacrifice, so that he may become a demon. Alright, so now we're on chapter 76, All the Inhuman Monsters. Ubik then says, From the moment that you took possession of that crimson baylet, you had the qualities to become a demon. Griffith then stares down at the baylet. No, perhaps I should say that because you had those qualities, it fell into your hands. 
that you used the bailet to summon us is evidence that you are qualified to be our kinsmen. After all, all the apostles gathered here use bailets to obtain their proper form. Guts then thinks about Zod and Wyald and the fact that they're also demons and that they must have made sacrifices in the past to attain their demon forms. Furthermore, the bailet you hold is no ordinary bailet. Only one who can be reborn as one of us, the guardian angels of the god hand, receives it. The crimson bailet the egg of the king, and the rest of you are invaluable sacrifices for the angelic advent. The apostles all begin to laugh in unison as they begin their transformations into their monstrous forms. The forms are all varied, grotesque, and very scary. And there was but one word to describe it. Despair. And just look at this image, guys. Holy cow. I mean, look at all the different monsters. Look at the detail here. It, it, it's just incredible stuff. And some of these monsters, you're never going to see again. I mean, you're only going to see it this one time, and that's it. I mean, you see like a squid-like monster over here, a tarantula. I mean, just all sorts of stuff. It's really great. It kind of reminds me of the Garden of Earthly Delights by Bosch, particularly the third panel that involves hell. Guts then thinks about the fact that Griffith is going to turn into one of these monsters by sacrificing all of them. They then say, well, not quite. What will do that is his will. He will offer all of you as a sacrifice. And Guts is like, no way, that's not possible. Yet Void declares, all lies within the currents of causality. Everything has been determined. All of your lives have been spun into the sacred point in time, the eclipse. The time is now at hand for us to perform the invocation of doom. Conrad then calls for the sacred child to be brought to the altar. And with this, a hill forms out of the ground and starts to push upward into the air. Guts holds on to Griffith, but he loses his grip and starts to fall down. Griffith extends his hand and Guts grabs on. However, because of Griffith's injured arm, his grip loosens. Guts falls down further as Griffith only goes higher. Guts then uses his knife to stop himself from falling any further, as we see the ground has taken the shape of an enormous hand. Now, just after chapter 76 was released, Berserk Volume 11 was released as well. And in that volume, we got this picture of Guts. Now, we already saw this picture of Guts before, but in it, we also have an author's note illustration, just like the previous volumes. All right, so now we're on chapter 77, the castle. And we got a really nice image of the god hand right here as we see the various monsters in the bottom right corner with the eclipse high in the sky. And all the monsters are chanting, invocation of doom, invocation of doom. Guts then begins climbing his way upward as he worries about Griffith. Griffith then stares down at the god hand as Void says, are you afraid, one such as yourself? of extraordinary beings such as us, or perhaps of the future you will follow. However, before they go into the future, they want to take a look into the past. Then Griffith will finally know who he really is. Griffith then sees a childlike version of himself running through the streets. He then begins to wonder where everyone is. The only person that he finds is an old woman on a wool spinner. She gives him directions to the castle as he makes his way there. It then becomes pitch black as he can't see anything. As he makes his way to the castle, he notices that everything is covered in dead bodies. Griffith immediately freaks out as he trips onto the ground. Noticing that blood is all over his body, he begins to panic and scream. However, the old lady approaches him and says that it's the only road to the castle. And to reach the castle, you must trample over all these dead bodies. Otherwise, you end up being one of them yourselves. The old lady then directs Griffith to a boy roughly the same age as Griffith. Griffith recognizes the boy as a young member of the band The Hawk, who died in battle. The boy marvels at the fact that he's going to become king one day. He then hands him a toy knight. Hey, take me along with you, and I'll give you this. I really want to serve as a knight under you. Come on, I'll try really hard. Is that okay? But Griffith reminds him that he's already dead, as we see an arrow sticking out of his chest. The dead soldiers then start to talk to Griffith. Let us fight and serve your standard. No, I won't do it. I can't take you with me because you're dead. You're not alive anymore, so you'll never reach that castle. The old lady then says that none of this would have happened if he didn't aim for the castle in the first place. 
No, I never forced anyone to come along. Now the only reason that Griffith was able to come this far was because of all the corpses. And yet, he's still so far from the castle. He needs to pile more and more corpses if he wants to reach it. And if he doesn't proceed forward, he'll become one of the corpses himself. He then stares at his own mangled hands. You foolish child. If you're going to regret it, you shouldn't have even come here. This is not so nice a place. Why couldn't you have been satisfied just gazing at the castle from the black alleys? Why not just gaze at the castle? I, I, I don't, I don't know why, says Griffith. Griffith then realizes that he knew exactly what he did. He walked on all these corpses to get where he is. Without those sacrifices, he would have never made it this far. Griffith then sees a vision of guts. Ain't this part of the path to your dream? You believe that, don't you? Now, pile them up. It's still not too late. Before you become one of them, pile up the corpses. There's nothing else you can do. We then notice that the old lady is an amalgamation between Conrad and Ubik. They're fooling Griffith, as it were. Griffith then grabs the boy's corpse. I can't so much as apologize. This is the path I have traveled. To get what I wanted. I can't apologize. No, I won't apologize. If I apologize, if I repent, everything will come to an end. I'll never get to reach that place. Yes, that is you, says Ubik. Alright, so now we're on chapter 78, Parting. And we see Griffith in the center of the hand, and he's saying, Was that an illusion? And Ubik reminds him that it's no illusion, it's the reality within his own conscious realm. Eyeing the castle in the sky, taking it by piling up corpses endlessly. That is you. Over thousands of your comrades' corpses... Over the tens of thousands of corpses they in turn amassed. Over those corpses with no identities, no names. You have trampled as you came with you, but one desire in mind. And now your back alley path has been interrupted. But behold, even as they shake with fear, they gaze up at you with clear eyes. The ones left to you, and at the end of the bloody soaked journey. Bury everything in exchange for the past. In the ruins of your dream. Ruins of my dream, remarks Griffith. Void then says, that is the cruel grace of the god born of man. Void then points to the castle in the sky. If even now that castle is in your eyes more dazzling than anything, then pile it up. Take all you have left. Chant the words I sacrifice in your heart. And you shall be granted raven black wings, upon which you shall soar in the heavens higher than any summit. At this pivotal moment, Guts manages to reach the top of the palm. Yes, among thousands of comrades and tens of thousands of enemies, you're the only one who made me forget my dream. Griffith then utters his answer to the god hand. I sacrifice. And with this, the hand closes around Griffith as he has a very malicious smile on his face. Guts tries to open up the fingers of the hand, but then Void evokes the invocation of Doom. The threads bundled by the laws of causality have now been bound. The promised time has come. The symbol of the brand of sacrifice then flies through the air, leaving fiery streaks in their wake. They then engrave the symbol upon the various members of the band of the hawk. For Casca, it's on her heart. Cork is his head, Pippin his forearm, Judo his hand. And finally, for Guts, it goes on the back of his neck. The transformed apostles go into a frenzy, ready to feast on the members of the band of the hawk and with their deaths it shall birth the new child of darkness the fifth member of the god hand all right so chapter 79 feast we see a wide array of grotesque disgusting apostles and i really love this image right here i mean all the different apostles it just looks absolutely great you can even see the slug baron aka the count right here in the bottom right hand corner the apostles begin ripping the various band of the hawk members limb from limb violently devouring them one by one a massacre a unilateral slaughter no it was a feast gluttonously devouring everything the inhumans twisted feast Casca can only watch on in horror as she says to herself, What is this? Is this real? Why are we in this place? Guts looks down at the carnage as Void says, What has now been engraved upon your bodies is the brand of sacrifice. The lives engraved with those with the brand are our demonic offerings. To the last drop of blood, to the moment of agonizing death. They become food for the new child of darkness. We then see Griffith's body going through a transformation as Guts uses his knife to try to cut through. I'll get you out of there soon, says Guts. Yet the members of the God Hand say that it's useless. Ubik even reminds him that this is exactly what Griffith wanted. But Guts just tells him to shut up. He doesn't care what they have to say. He'd never, he'd never say something like that. Guts then recalls the words that Griffith said to him one time. The words about the truly elite. The ones that obtain power of the gods. 
Guts then stares on helplessly, wondering, is this what you wanted? He then looks over at the apostles in the distance as they tear through the band of the hawk piece by piece. Guts' confusion turns to wrath as he sees the various apostles going after him. As we see him going after the apostles with a broken dagger, we then get a close-up of Griffith's transformation. As Void says, it has been determined. Outside the eclipse, we see Rickard making his way to the top of a hill. Once he makes it to the top of the hill, he sees a truly horrifying and enigmatic sight. A tornado within a tornado and lightning coming down. He makes his way to the whirlwind and sees two people fighting. And it's none other than Nosferatu Zod and the Skull Knight. Alright, so chapter 80, Storm of Death, part 1. Rickard wonders why Zod is in a place like this. Hmm. So you did come. You who have been our foe for a millennium. I figured you wouldn't let this chance slip past. Zod is not here to indulge in the grotesque spree. He's only here to seek out the strong. Void would say that this too lies within causality's current. Very well. I wager myself upon my sword. The two go at each other as we're transported back inside the eclipse. An apostle bears down on Casca with Pippin coming to her aid. Pippin commands her to run as Judo grabs her whilst on his horse. Judo helps out Pippin by throwing some knives at the monster. Casca wants to go back and help out, but Judo screams that it's no use. Casca is the leader now. She must go on living to preserve the band of the hawk. You think I'm gonna let it all end like this? Casca begins crying as she watches the carnage behind her. Corcus watches his comrades get eaten right in front of his face. He makes a mad dash for it, but gets clawed on his back. He henceforth tumbles down a hill as he enters a state of terrified delirium. Overcome with despair, Corcus thinks he's experiencing a dream. Hey, wake up, me! Enough's enough! Corcus thinks everything is a dream, since it's so far-fetched to think that they were heroes at one point. I'll wake up, and I'll be nobody again! Corcus then finds a voluptuous, naked woman. And this is enough confirmation for Corcus to believe that he's truly in a dream. He buries his face into her chest, right before she transforms into a horrifying creature, preparing to kill him. Now if you remember from the beginning of the Black Swordsman arc, this was the very first apostle that Guts killed. This apostle also bears some resemblance to the work of H.R. Geiger. Now, Geiger was best known for blending human characteristics with machines. It's an art style known as biomechanical. He would later go on to win an Academy Award for the special effects design on Ridley Scott's 1979 sci-fi horror, Alien. Now, aside from the female apostle, there are many apostles within Berserk that are based on the designs of H.R. Geiger. In fact, Conrad bears a distinct resemblance to this image right here. Alright, so now we're on chapter 81, Storm of Death, part 2. Now, I've always liked this cover page with Judo. I, just something about it is really cool. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, this is in fact the last chapter that we're going to see Judo, so it's kind of a nice little send-off on Mira's part. Now, Judo and Casca run away from the Apostles at top speed. Casca wonders if this is hell, and if it's really true that they sinned so much that they deserve to be here. Casca asks Griffith a rhetorical question, if this is the nightmare that he truly wanted. Judo takes out an apostle with his knife, but has his arm chomped on by another one. Casca draws her blade and stabs the apostle's jaw, making it release its grip on Judo. There's no exit in sight, so Casca wants to go back and fight with everyone else. Judo urges her to struggle on, and to keep on struggling and struggling until the ends of ends. That's what I'd say if I were him, right? says Judo. The two are thrown from their horse, as an apostle with two whip-like appendages approaches them. The apostle attacks, with Judo using his body to shield Casca. Judo throws himself on top of Casca, as the apostle whips him to near death. Judo tosses his last knife at the apostle, as Casca finishes it off with her sword. Judo urges her to go, but Casca will drag his body if she has to. Reluctantly, Judo agrees to come along, even if he has to crawl. He then stares up at her face, as his vision begins to fade. He laments missing his chance to say something important to her. Judo then says his last words. You sure do cry a lot, you know. He then thinks to himself. Although personally, I always thought it was a bit smoother than that. Judo then collapses to the ground and perishes right in front of Casca. Casca is shaken up that Judo has become unresponsive. A horde of apostles quickly surround her. She pulls out Judo's knife, attacking the apostles with absolute fury. Her sword, however, is chopped to pieces by one of the apostles, leaving her with no defense. The apostles chant sacrifice, 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 as they then come up with a new idea, something that's going to happen before the sacrifice. They close the distance on Casca, strip her of her arm 
armor so that she's completely naked and begin to aggressively and violently fondle her entire body. Guts uses his broken sword to cut off an apostle's horn so that he can use it as a weapon. He uses the horn to stab an apostle in the face. The apostles fight back, but Guts hasn't lost any of his vigor. He kills one by stabbing it in the head. Slan takes his opportunity to marvel at Guts' effort. Yet, the stronger his life force is, and the greater his anguish, the more he becomes precious bread for the new life of darkness. Sweet dreams, blessed child. Until now, you have been a dream called Griffith. And when that dream ends, you will awaken into a dream world from which you will never wake, in a night that will never break. Guts continues struggling against the impossible odds. But no matter how many there are, the swordsman persists on, with rage serving as his fuel. I'm sinking, says Griffith. The hawk's body descends further and further into the darkness, away from the light. Griffith sees his comrades' mutilated bodies. Their deaths provide him with sustenance for his demon form. All their deaths are piercing through me, yet he doesn't feel anything. We then see the crystallization of his last tear. When suffering so profound as to make someone rip himself apart is confronted, a heart is frozen. Griffith peers at the swirling mass that looks like a body of water. From the water comes numerous baylets, as if they're droplets of water. Now the Japanese word for baylet, as referenced in chapter 82, is Ikai Ino Yobumizu, which means prime droplets connecting to the beyond. This is critical information, because there will be numerous times throughout the manga in which the astral world is described in terms relating to water. Water is also a symbol for the unconscious, according to Swiss psychologist Carl Jung. Now having a general understanding of his work, work helps peel back many of the layers of hidden knowledge contained within Berserk. It's also how I've determined many of my own theories for how the story could proceed into the future. As Ikai Ino Yobumizu. I'm probably saying that incorrectly, so apologies for the mispronunciations. Now this literally translates to primed droplets connecting to the beyond. Now in both instances, each word utilizes yobimizu, which means they're both connecting to and or representing water. For the Baylits, this should come as no surprise. When Griffith sinks into the deep layers of the astral realm, we see a visual of light reflecting off of the water surface. And as he sinks deeper and deeper, the light slowly dims and completely disappears. He is then confronted by a swirling pool of water that is expelling Baylits out of the abyss into the physical world. And I quote, They are splashes, droplets of idea that have spilled from the sea to eternity summons to the other world. And the droplets come from the ocean of feelings, that is the idea of evil, the common consciousness that transcends individuality. In fact, the dark side of humankind is a swelling ocean that pours out into the river that is causality. This is confirmed by Slan in chapter 88. Either way, the leaping of one fish would never disturb the flow of the river, i.e. causality. Now, water is immensely important in Berserk and to the astral realm. As Donnan pointed out in chapter 344, dreams are part of the astral realm. Essentially, think of it like this. The astral realm equals water, and water equals dreams. And this is exactly how Swiss psychologist Carl Jung viewed the unconscious regions of the brain. The unconsciousness equaled water, and water equaled dreams. And like any massive body of water, like an ocean or lake, we can easily inspect the surface, but the depth and the detail underneath it is both dark and vast. In fact, recent developments in neuroscience have proved that the unconscious processes of the brain dwarf the conscious mind, meaning that the part of us that we identify as us, the quote-unquote I, is not really in control whatsoever. Kind of sounds like causality in a way, doesn't it? At least it is true. That man has no control, even over his own will. Now to more easily visualize the situation, take a look at this iceberg. The top is how we view ourselves based on everyday interactions. The ice below the surface is comprised of various personal memories of our past life experiences. And the waters are deep-seated emotions, instincts, and archetypes that are innate within all of us, i.e. the human species. 
Now to translate this into berserk terminology, we could modify the image as so. Now remember, the balets are prime droplets connecting to the beyond. Essentially, they are components of the collective unconscious, the emotions of our psyche that have often been represented through archetypal entities. In the case of berserk, the god hand. It's no surprise that Mira drew an image of Femto emerging from a balet itself, emerging from the waters of the abyss to represent the archetypal urge for power. Void representing the archetypal sage and knowledge seeker. Slan, the urge for lust and pain. Ubik, the artful deceiver. And Conrad, the gluttonous toxic one. Griffith is then confronted by a being whom he identifies as God. Alright, so now chapter 83, the God of the Abyss. Welcome, human, says God. Are you God? I am the idea, the desired God the idea of evil. Now from the original Japanese, idea of evil literally means source slash origin of evil. And if you consider that the balets come from the abyss, the prime droplets of water, and the idea of evil is the source, then it's the source of the balets. It's the source of evil. Griffith is shocked that God is a lump of flesh. The idea states that this is only his core, with the entire ocean of feelings constituting his entirety. All humans have a common consciousness that transcends individuality, very similar to Jung's idea of the collective unconscious, which is connected to water. The dark side of this consciousness is the swelling ocean. The idea of evil was born from these swells, as the ego of this world. I am this world. The darkness that dwells in every human heart. The idea of evil. This is God. Griffith deduces that humans created God. They desired this terrifying thing. This place resembles hell, yet it's just the surface of the whole consciousness. But you know, you know that this place is terribly human. This place is filled with all kinds of blurred negative feelings. And it's the will that defines human nature. Yes, it's true. This is in me. I can feel it. Now it was the human desire for reason that birthed this god. Reason for pain, sadness, life, death, suffering, and absurdity. They wanted reason for a destiny that kept transcending their knowledge. God was brought into existence to control destiny. Obeying the will of the essence of humankind, I weave every man's destiny. It was established long ago that Griffith would be here in the distant past. By controlling the lower levels of human consciousness, the idea created the lineage that gave birth to Griffith. In this sense, God manipulated history and created the appropriate context for Griffith. Griffith then wonders what God wants of him. Be as you will, replies God. Griffith is a part of God's consciousness. His desire is God's desire. May they bring pain or salvation to mankind. Do as you will, chosen one. Now this statement right here echoes a precept of Aleister Crowley's occultic religion. And I quote, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And this is something we talked about in the Black Swordsman arc as well. Griffith then says, If so, I want wings. Griffith is then surrounded by the power of inner feelings, as he changes the physical field that is his body into a suitable shape. This gives rise to the new god hand member, Femto. Femto looks to exit the abyss, as we see Void waiting on the other side. Now before we move on to chapter 84 of Berserk, we have to address the elephant in the room. And that is that chapter 83 of Berserk is considered the lost chapter. It's a chapter that doesn't exist in the volume format. Now you may be wondering to yourself, why is this? And in Kentaro Mira's own words, he said, It's because I wanted Berserk's world to be revealed just that far, not any more than that. The appearance of God in the manga conclusively determines its range. I thought that might limit the freedom of the story development. I myself don't know if the idea of evil will show up again in the manga or not. Now it's hard to say whether or not chapter 83 is part of the Berserk canon, or if it's information that's superfluous. In my regard, I consider it canon. The fact that we see the idea of evil at the end of chapter 82 confirms that he does exist. It's just a bit of information that Mira didn't want to share with the reader at that point in time, or ever. But the fact of the matter is, is it does exist, it came from Kentaro Mira, it's his drawing, his writings, and it's consistent with everything we've seen in the story up until this point. I mean, we're already on chapter 371, and nothing he has said has discounted, discredited, or retconned what we saw in that chapter. In fact, there are certain events, especially in the Fantasia arc, that only bolster the claim that it is in fact canon. But again, that's only my interpretation. Do what thou wilt, and believe what you want to believe. But uh, let's get moving forward. 
All right, so chapter 84, Lifeblood. In the opening scene, we see Guts stabbing a two-sided apostle with a horn. And this is by far one of my favorite panels in all of Berserk. It's easily in my top 10, if not my favorite. It's that good, guys. I mean, just the pain and the brutality and the emotion and the fervor. Everything about it is just so emotional and visceral. It just really hits you. Guts continues his brutal onslaught, but finds himself falling down a hillside. After tumbling down, he falls face first into a pool of blood. He discovers that the blood is from his fallen comrades, as he sees the remnants of their bodies floating above the surface. Horrified, Guts lets out a bone-chilling scream. He wonders if anyone survived the horrific event. Gaston calls out for his captain, as Guts is exuberant to see him. Gaston has no idea what happened to the others, since he was too busy running around. Gaston can't believe what's going on. It's like Likely they're in the middle of someone's dream. And that's kind of an interesting moment because he's almost breaking the fourth wall there. In fact, everything has felt off since they met with Nosferatu Zod. He reminisces about the days with the hawk and how everything seemed too grand. Like they were pulled into a story that was too grand. Griffith, after all, was just so different from the rest of them. Looks like I'm just a minor character. Gaston's face starts to bulge before it bursts open. An apostle then pops out. Guts attempts to stab it before it swims away in the blood. Guts then notices Pippin standing on a nearby hill. Though, something seems off about Pippin, since he's not speaking or moving. Guts approaches him as we see that his back has been removed, and his body has been hollowed out. Furthermore, his corpse is being supported by two tentacles. Alright, Chapter 85, Quickening. The Count rips Pippin's body asunder with much glee. He attacks Guts as the swordsman falls on his back. Guts then realizes the gravity of his situation, as a massive horde of apostles surround him on all sides. Amongst the apostles, he sees the dead remnants of all his comrades. No other words can describe what is happening. It's just pure hell at this point. BASTARDS! Screams Guts. He then notices that one of his comrades is still alive. The female commander of the Hawk, Casca. But this is no time for celebration, as her naked body is being hoisted up into the air by the tentacles of the apostles. Blood pours from her vagina as she was likely raped. Guts charges forward in a bout of intense rage. He slashes through the monsters, looking like a monster himself. The apostle holding Casca points a small horn at her vagina, as Guts completely loses it. An apostle known as Borkov bites onto Guts' left arm, stopping him in his tracks. Before the apostles continue their egregious behavior, a loud heartbeat is heard, drawing everyone's attention. Blood from the members of the Band of the Hawk pour into the hand, as the blood travels up in the veins into the newly born God Hand member. We then see Griffith's new form as Femto. He is now finally fully awaken. The Burst, the Fifth Blessed King, the New Demon King, Void Slan Ubik Conrad. Thou art our extension, our new kinsman to wear the mantle of evil. Now pay attention to the order in which they presented the God Hand, because I think it's the order in which they were born in their demon forms. And I actually made a video about this as well. The Wings of Darkness, Femto, spreads himself out, leaving Guts completely speechless. Femto stands up in the pool of blood as we see all five members of the God Hand with the Eclipse in the background. Femto rises up into the air and gracefully flies his way towards Guts' location. Guts wonders if this is truly Griffith, as the two stare each other down. The Apostles remain in utter silence in the presence of their new king. Now, Femto is not based on any of the Cenobites like the other God Hand members, but he does have some aesthetics that do hearken to the Cenobites. However, his appearance is more likened to the main protagonist of the 1974 musical movie, Phantom of the Paradise. Not only does the Phantom of the Paradise wear a similar costume to Griffith slash Femto, but the reason that they wear their costume is to cover their scars. Now in the movie, the Phantom gives up his life's work of producing a rock opera based on the Faust legend. And Faust is a German legend in which a man named Faust makes a pact with the devil, exchanging his soul for unlimited knowledge and earthly pleasures. And this all connects back to Griffith because he bears a resemblance to the Phantom and to Faust. Because for him, he exchanges the Band of the Hawk and his soul for unlimited demon power. Now what's really interesting about this movie as well, is that when the composer dons a bizarre new persona, he has his favorite singer, Phoenix, perform his music. Now why is this significant? Griffith is marked by the Hawk, and when he defeated the Tudor army and was at the award celebration, what did the king call him? The White Phoenix General Griffith. 
So, uh, yeah, you can definitely see how Mira takes, like, his favorite parts of, like, all these movies. Hellraiser, Conan the Barbarian, Phantom of the Paradise, and he just kind of amalgamates all this information together. He also takes stuff from the past as well. He takes stuff from Faust, Nietzsche, Carl Jung, The Divine Comedy, even Artist. I mean, he just takes all these little bits of information and he just, he makes it into something so wonderful. Now, Griffith extends his arm outward as the helpless Casca is placed beside him. Femto proceeds to fondle Casca's breast in front of Guts. He grabs her private region as Guts fiercely tries to make his way towards their position. Unfortunately for him, his arm is still stuck at the moment. Casca is repositioned so that Griffith is above her now. He kisses her on her lips while Guts fiercely attempts to cut off his own arm. The God Hand enjoys the spectacle as Femto thrusts his demon schlong inside Casca. Guts continues hacking until he finally frees himself. Griffith! Yells the bloodied Guts. Alright, so now we're on chapter 87. Afterglow of the Right Eye. Guts makes a mad dash forward, but is quickly pinned down by the apostles in the area. Femto continues his sordid display, while Guts can only watch on in horror. Such a beauty. It touches me. Love, hatred, pain, pleasure, life, death. All there. This is to be human. This is to be evil. Just a ponderous thought on my part. But why is Slan shedding tears right now? Aren't all God Hand members bound by the same rules? And we just found out that Griffith had his last tear crystallized. Therefore, Slan's last tear should have been crystallized when she became a member of the God Hand. Now, is this just an oversight on Mira's part? Or was there some ulterior motive or a different interpretation? I'm not really sure. Femto continues raping Casca in a most painful and embarrassing manner. She begs for Guts not to watch, as Femto sticks his tongue down her mouth. Whilst Guts watches, an apostle slowly pierces his right eye. Blood oozes down his face as the light begins to fade away. When he's done with her, Griffith tosses her down as Guts screams an unholy scream. And the last thing that he sees with his right eye is Casca on the ground, completely defeated, raped, and embarrassed. <laughs> Just then, the apostles in the God Hand notice a cracking in the solar eclipse. It shatters open as the Skull Knight bursts through. Skull Knight makes his way to Void first, and swings his sword at him. Void, however, creates a spatial distortion, transporting the sword back to Skull Knight, which he blocks. Alright, so now we're on chapter 88, Escape. Skull Knight stares down at Void with contempt, as we see that Void has his skin peeled back to mimic the Star of David. Skull Knight rides down the hand of God, slaughtering any apostle that gets in his way. He focuses his attention on Femto, the newly minted God Hand member. The newly minted God Hand member attempts to crush him by compressing matter around him. But the Skull Knight dodges this, and with this opportunity, he saves Guts and Casca. Femto looks to finish them off, yet upon seeing Guts in a helpless state, decides against it. Despite this unforeseen circumstance, Ubik is quite amused by it. It's impossible to anticipate everything. We ourselves are not gods after all, says Slan. Either way, the leaping of one fish would never disturb the flow of the river. Time begins to flow again with the fifth angel being born. An age of darkness descends upon the earth. An age where every darkness shall eclipse the light. I suppose that's what people will call it afterwards. The age of darkness. Zond is then seen reattaching his left arm outside the eclipse. Ricker marvels at Skull Knight's skill in subduing Zod, as the man himself arrives with Guts and Casca. These two are not yet destined to die, says Skull Knight. He tosses the two at Rickert as Zod approaches from the rear. Don't think that what just happened settled anything, says Zod. Zod is then shocked to find out that Guts survived the eclipse. He'll thusly put their battle on hold for now. He urges them to move, for once the gate vanishes, they'll all pour out. Rickard finishes up using medicine on the two, as Skull Knight says that no one is left from the Band of the Hawk. No one. Skull Knight then grabs the three and rides off into the distance. So he survived the eclipse. Interesting. Show me now. How is it you'll struggle as no more than a man through the world of darkness? In the wilderness of the dead that extends before you, branded swordsman. Alright, so chapter 89, Awakening to a Nightmare. The chapter begins with Guts watching the various members of the band The Hawk riding off into a cloudy setting. Guts calls for their attention, but none of them acknowledge him. Don't go! Screams Guts as they slowly fade off. He wakes up in a small cave with a bright light shining through. Bandages cover his face as he notices a shadow along the cave walls. 
It turns out to be Erica. In her excitement, she slips and drops the drinks in her hands. Rigor comes from behind, exuberant that Guts is awake again. Turns out he hasn't moved in four days. This is Godo's ore cave, and they got here thanks to the Skull Knight. Rigor wants answers about what happened in that whirlwind, and what happened to the others. Guts immediately rises up and grabs Rigor by his shirt. Casca, Where's Casca? Erica points towards her as we see that she's standing beneath a small waterfall. Guts approaches her, yet she yells at him and turns away. She then stares at him as if he's some sort of violent monster. He attempts to reason with her, but she continues to resist, to the point that she bites his fingers. She hugs Erica for comfort as Erica scolds Guts for bullying Casca. Though Casca's injuries have healed up, she doesn't remember Guts or Rickert. After Casca shudders away from him again, Guts decides to leave the cave. Rickert attempts to talk him down, given his injuries, but Guts refuses to listen. He proceeds to run away into the wild, with a look of desperation on his face. Alright, so chapter 90, the sprint. Guts yanks the bandages from his face, as he screams in a crazed manner. He recalls all the moments he had with the band of the Hawk. Memories of Judo, Corcus, Pippin flash through his mind. All the victories, all the success, all the happiness and the downtimes and the good times. Every pivotal battle that made them the Band of the Hawk. After all, the Band of the Hawk was his family. He then thinks of Griffith, staring back at him. Guts eventually makes it to an open field, in the dead of night. He lies on his back as rain pours onto him. While he stares up into the night sky, he sees an image of Femto. He then hears a rustling in the grass. His brand bleeds on his neck, as a horde of dark spirits steer him down from the grass. You should take heed. From now on, this is your world, says the Skull Knight. The boundary between the mortal world and that of the dead, the interstice. Alright, so now chapter 91, Vow of Retaliation. Guts recognizes the Skull Knight immediately from his time in the woods. Skull Knight tosses down his sword, as Guts wonders why it looks this way. The spirits attack Guts, as he slashes through them. He notes that it feels like he's slashing through water. They are dead spirits that roam about this place. Being dead, they cling to life. The blood from the brand of sacrifice draws them in. The spirits cling on to Guts' leg as they demand to go inside him. Let us inside this body! Guts yells as they scurry off. Steal yourself. Otherwise, you will be haunted to your death. Guts is a torch that shines brilliantly in the darkness. He must stand in the interval between the two worlds because it is the destiny of those who receive the brand of sacrifice. His body and every last drop of blood have been offered to those of the darkness. Shut the hell up, yells Guts as he swings his sword. How about you save your high and mighty crap for after I've been haunted to death, skull face. Guts has heard enough of cryptic explanations. He's here to participate in a war, where the last one standing is the winner. Guts furiously slashes through his foes, as he declares he'll hunt and kill all the wretched monsters, down to the very last one. This is my declaration of war. Guts then thinks about Griffith's words pertaining to dreams. Skull Knight determines that Guts used his strength to survive the eclipse. The spirits disappear as Skull Knight says they found another torch. Guts wants Skull Knight's horse, but the specter pulls him up and takes his sword back. This is now twice that I've carried you. Do not be thrown. And with that, the horse leaps into the air. Alright, so now we're officially on volume 14. And this features a really nice image of Guts with his sword in front of his eye and Puck on his back. One of my favorites. Really love this image. It's just so dark and gritty. And this is chapter 92, Demon Infant. Skull Knight reveals that he saved Guts and Casca from the eclipse, though it was incidental. I am the foe of the Inhumans. That's all I'll say for now. Skull Knight brought them here to the mountains because it was the safest place from the gate. Elves used to live in these mountains, but they're now long since gone. What saved Guts was the elf dust that Rickert was carrying with him. Elf medicine, after all, is of the highest quality, and seldom do elves reveal themselves to humans. Maybe you have some tie to the elves, says the Skull Knight. Skull Knight then speculates that Casca might have left the cave. They then spot Casca on top of a hill, surrounded by spirits. Guts disembarks, but before he makes it far, Skull Knight observes that the spirits are not attacking her. Guts runs to Casca to check if she's alright. Sweat pours down her face as she experiences abdominal pain, causing her to collapse onto the ground. Guts wonders what's going on as she clenches onto his body and digs her nails into his skin. Blood spurts from her vagina as a small fetus falls onto the grass. Guts looks upon the demon fetus with contempt as it stares back at him. He looks to crush it with his foot, but Casca's motherly instinct kicks in as she uses her body to shield it. 
It's her child, says the Skull Knight. That girl was with child. It turns out that the shapeless fetus was possessed by evil due to her sexual relations with Femto. And so it has taken on the nature of a demon. It's a cursed child. Skull Knight says it would be best to kill it as it will bring woe upon the both of them. However, Casca has already taken a liking to the child as it goes for the brand of sacrifice on her chest. Guts yanks the child from Casca as she screams with horror. Guts then looks upon the child as it says no. Guts knows that this is a demon, yet he seems conflicted. Casca bites onto his arm as the sun rises. All the spirits fade away along with the demon child. Skull Knight determines that this is Guts' child, as it is now slipped into a place nearer the world of the dead. It will appear before them again. All children yearn for their parents. Rickards and Erica approach them as Skull Knight tells Guts to follow the guidance on his brand of sacrifice to fight the Inhumans. But mind this, yours is a black path through the night. When you confront those who lurk in the darkness, you will also envelop yourself in it. Good journey, struggler. Alright, so now chapter 93, Armament. A small dirty man is found by a couple of guys transporting hay. The small man looks up towards the sky and thinks, sacrifice. Back at Godo's, we see him working on a sword. Erica steals a key and shows Rickard a shed with various weapons and armor. After inspecting some of the weapons, Rickard notices the dragon slayer up against the wall. It turns out that Godo forged a sword so that it could butcher a dragon. The king who commissioned the sword was not pleased with the result because it was too heavy and ugly. So Godo was forced to flee the area. Nevertheless, Godo stands by his craftsmanship saying that it could kill a dragon if there were any. That being said, it's too heavy for anyone to wield. We then see Guts in the cave with sword in hand. A fish leaps out of the water as he slices it in half. Guts plans on leaving soon. Rickard is frustrated that Guts won't elaborate on the details of what happened in the whirlwind. Guts then brings Casca some food as she gives him a menacing glare. She spills her scalding soup as Guts tries to help her out. She then pushes him back as her shirt is ripped off in the process, exposing her breast. Guts instinctively is turned on and looks to kiss her. She pushes him off and begins to scream for help. The next morning, Guts dons his new armor with a fresh set of knives. Now, he's wearing all black because he'll be fighting things that live in dark places. He doesn't want to give himself away. Rickard then gives Guts a new mechanical arm. Artificial arm, huh? It's groovy. <laughs> And I'm sure many of you will notice this reference from Evil Dead 2. Now, Guts looks to test the mechanical arm, but Goto walks in just before he shoots. Goto then hands Guts a sword that he just forged. Guts uses it to cut through another sword and an anvil. Just then, the man from earlier licks the ground, as Guts' brand begins to bleed. I followed the scent of evil. My nose is really good. Casca clutches her chest in pain as she screams in agony. And now we finally arrived at the last chapter of the Golden Age arc, guys. Chapter 94, He Who Hunts Dragons. At Godo's, the deformed man transforms into a giant dog-like apostle. Despite its terrifying presence, Guts thinks it's his lucky day, blackening out any fear. Guts roars like a wild beast. He springs into action, slicing the apostle across the mouth. Guts then wonders if the sword will work. It's the first in my hunt. He slices off the left arm as he's confident that he can kill it. Now, Goto didn't make this sword for inhuman creatures, as he watches the battle nervously. Guts slices again, but notices that his new sword is already broken. The apostle uses its intestines to knock Guts back. Food, remarks the disgusting apostle. Rickard urges Guts to use his mechanical arm. The black swordsman pulls out the metal part and blasts the apostle with his cannon. You gotta be kidding me, yow! Guts' shoulder is out of its joint, as he notices the Dragon Slayer up against the wall. He proceeds to slice the monster vertically with the Dragon Slayer. He swings one more time, cutting the monster clean in half. You held out on me, Godo. You got something much better suited to my fight. Goto is flabbergasted that Guts can wield such a weapon. Erica clenches onto Rickert, claiming that Guts looks rather scary right now. Dragons are dragons because humans can't beat them. So what's a man who beats dragons? Guts won't see Casca before he leaves, as Rickert pleads with Guts to stay at Goto's house. Guts says that the Band of the Hawk is not gone, since they're still here, and the war ain't over yet. Take care of Casca. She's our leader. Protect her. I'm captain of the raiders, so I'll raid the enemy camp, right? Revenge, war, maybe any reason was good enough. But one thing's for sure, right now, 
there's some dismissal rage inside me. And that's all there is supporting these two feet. It pushes me to walk onward. And we see Guts walking into a vast field of darkness as he gets ready to begin his mission of hunting down the inhuman monsters, the apostles, and the God Hand members alike. And most importantly, getting revenge on Griffith. And with the end of the Golden Age arc, guys, we're back in the current timeline. And what I mean by that is that we're back in the Black Swordsman timeline. Because with us starting out with the Black Swordsman arc, the Golden Age arc is technically a flashback. A really long flashback, but a flashback nonetheless. So now we're picking up with the story again, after Guts finished off the Count, i.e. the Slug Baron, and left Teresa. But next time I see you guys, we're going to be talking about the Lost Children's Chapters and Guts' battle with Rosine.